Section one of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. The Coin of Dionysius it was eight o'clock at night and raining scarcely a time when a business so limited in its clientele as that of a coin dealer could hope to attract any customer but a light was still showing in the small shop that bore over its window the name of baxter and in the even smaller office at the back the proprietor himself sat reading the latest pall mall his enterprise seemed to be justified for presently the door bell gave its announcement and throwing down his paper mr baxter went forward as a matter of fact the dealer had been expecting someone and his manner as he passed into the shop was unmistakably suggestive of a caller of importance but at the first glance towards his visitor the excess of deference melted out of his bearing leaving the urbane self-possessed shopman in the presence of the casual customer mr baxter i think said the latter he had laid aside his dripping umbrella and was unbuttoning overcoat and coat to reach an inner pocket you hardly remember me i suppose mr carlyle two years ago i took up a case for you to be sure mr carlyle the private detective inquiry agent corrected mr carlyle precisely well smiled mr baxter for that matter i am a coin dealer and not an antiquarian or a numismatist is there anything in that way that i can do for you yes replied his visitor it is my turn to consult you he had taken a small wash leather bag from the inner pocket and now turned something carefully out upon the counter what can you tell me about that the dealer gave the coin a moment's scrutiny there is no question about this he replied it is a sicilian tetradrachm of dionysius yes i know that i have it on the label out of the cabinet i can tell you further that it's supposed to be the one that lord seastoke gave two hundred and fifty pounds for at the bryce sale in ninety four it seems to me that you can tell me more about it than i can tell you remarked mr baxter what is it that you really want to know i want to know replied mr carlyle whether it is genuine or not has any doubt been cast upon it certain circumstances raised a suspicion that is all the dealer took another look at the tetradrachm through his magnifying glass holding it by the edge with the careful touch of an expert then he shook his head slowly in a confession of ignorance of course i could make a guess no don't interrupted mr carlyle hastily an arrest hangs on it and nothing short of certainty is any good to me is that so mr carlyle said mr baxter with increased interest well to be quite candid the thing is out of my line now if it was a rare saxon penny or a doubtful noble i'd stake my reputation on my opinion but i do very little in the classical series mr carlyle did not attempt to conceal his disappointment as he returned the coin to the bag and replaced the bag in the inner pocket i had been relying on you he grumbled reproachfully where on earth am i to go now there is always the british museum ah to be sure thanks but will anyone who can tell me be there now now no fear replied mr baxter go round in the morning but i must know to-night explained the visitor reduced to despair again to-morrow will be too late for the purpose mr baxter did not hold out much encouragement in the circumstances you can scarcely expect to find anyone at business now he remarked i should have been gone these two hours myself only i happened to have an appointment with an american millionaire who fixed his own time something indistinguishable from a wink slid off mr baxter's right eye offmanson he's called and a bright young pedigree hunter has traced his descent from offa king of mercia so he quite naturally wants a set of offas as a sort of collateral proof very interesting murmured mr carlyle fidgeting with his watch i should love to have an hour's chat with you about your millionaire customers uh, some other time just now look here baxter can't you give me a line of introduction to some dealer in this sort of thing who happens to live in town you must know dozens of experts why bless my soul mr carlyle i don't know a man of them away from his business said mr baxter staring they may live in park lane or they may live in petticoat lane for all i know besides there aren't so many experts as you seem to imagine and the two best will very likely quarrel over it 
you've had to do with expert witnesses i suppose i don't want a witness there will be no need to give evidence all i want is an absolutely authoritative pronouncement that i can act on is there no one who can really say whether the thing is genuine or not mr baxter's meaning silence became cynical in its implication as he continued to look at his visitor across the counter then he relaxed stay a bit there is a man an amateur i remember hearing wonderful things about some time ago they say he really does know there you are exclaimed mr carlyle much relieved there always is someone who is he funny name replied baxter something win or win something he craned his neck to catch sight of an important motor-car that was drawing to the curb before his window win carrados you'll excuse me now mr carlyle won't you this looks like mr offmanson win carrados right where does he live haven't the remotest idea replied baxter referring the arrangement of his tie to the judgment of the wall mirror i have never seen the man myself now mr carlyle i'm sorry i can't do any more for you you won't mind will you mr carlyle could not pretend to misunderstand he enjoyed the distinction of holding open the door for the transatlantic representative of the line of offa as he went out and then made his way through the muddy streets back to his office there was only one way of tracing a private individual at such short notice through the pages of the directories and the gentleman did not flatter himself by a very high estimate of his chances fortune favoured him however he soon discovered a win carrados living at richmond and better still further search failed to unearth another there was apparently only one householder at all events of that name in the neighbourhood of london he jotted down the address and set out for richmond the house was some distance from the station mr carlyle learned he took a taxicab and drove dismissing the vehicle at the gate he prided himself on his power of observation and the accuracy of the deductions which resulted from it a detail of his business it's nothing more than using one's eyes and putting two and two together he would modestly declare when he wished to be deprecatory rather than impressive and by the time he had reached the front door of the turrets he had formed some opinion of the position and tastes of the man who lived there a manservant admitted mr carlyle and took in his card his private card with the bare request for an interview that could not detain mr carrados for ten minutes luck still favoured him mr carrados was at home and would see him at once the servant the hall through which they passed and the room into which he was shown all contributed something to the deductions which the quietly observant gentleman was half unconsciously recording mr carlyle announced the servant the room was a library or study the only occupant a man of about carlyle's own age had been using a typewriter up to the moment of his visitor's entrance he now turned and stood up with an expression of formal courtesy it's very good of you to see me at this hour apologized the caller the conventional expression of mr carrados's face changed a little surely my man has got your name wrong he exclaimed isn't it lewis calling the visitor stopped short and his agreeable smile gave place to a sudden flash of anger and annoyance no sir he replied stiffly my name is on the card which you have before you i beg your pardon said mr carrados with perfect good humour i hadn't seen it but i used to know a calling some years ago at st michael's st michael's mr carlyle's features underwent another change no less instant and sweeping than before st michael's win carrados good heavens it isn't max win old winning win a little older and a little fatter yes replied carrados i have changed my name you see extraordinary thing meeting like this said his visitor dropping into a chair and staring hard at mr carrados i have changed more than my name how did you recognize me the voice replied carrados it took me back to that little smoke-dried attic den of yours where we my god exclaimed carlyle bitterly don't remind me of what we were going to do in those days he looked round the well-furnished handsome room and recalled the other signs of wealth that he had noticed at all events you seem fairly comfortable win i am alternately envied and pitied replied carrados with a placid tolerance of circumstance that seemed characteristic of him still as you say i am fairly comfortable envied i can understand but why are you pitied because i am blind was the tranquil reply blind exclaimed mr carlyle using his own eyes superlatively 
do you mean literally blind literally i was riding along a bridle path through a wood about a dozen years ago with a friend he was in front at one point a twig sprang back you know how easily a thing like that happens it just flicked my eye nothing to think twice about and that blinded you yes ultimately it's called amorosis i can scarcely believe it you seem so sure and self-reliant your eyes are full of expression only a little quieter than they used to be i believe you were typing when i came in aren't you having me you missed the dog and the stick smiled carrados no it's a fact what an awful infliction for you max you were always such an impulsive reckless sort of fellow never quiet you must miss such a fearful lot has anyone else recognized you asked carrados quietly ah oh, that was the voice you said replied carlyle yes but other people heard the voice as well only i had no blundering self-confident eyes to be hoodwinked that's a rum way of putting it said carlyle are your ears never hoodwinked may i ask not now nor my fingers nor any of my other senses that have to look out for themselves well well murmured mr carlyle cut short in his sympathetic emotions i'm glad you take it so well of course if you find it an advantage to be blind old man he stopped and reddened i beg your pardon he concluded stiffly not an advantage perhaps replied the other thoughtfully still it has compensations that one might not think of a new world to explore new experiences new powers awakening strange new perceptions life in the fourth dimension but why do you beg my pardon lewis i am an ex-solicitor struck off in connection with the falsifying of a trust account mr carrados replied carlyle rising sit down lewis said carrados suavely his face even his incredibly living eyes beamed placid good nature the chair on which you will sit the roof above you all the comfortable surroundings to which you have so amiably alluded are the direct result of falsifying a trust account but do i call you mr carlyle in consequence certainly not lewis i did not falsify the account cried carlyle hotly he sat down however and added more quietly but why do i tell you all this i have never spoken of it before blindness invites confidence replied carrados we are out of the running human rivalry ceases to exist besides why shouldn't you in my case the account was falsified of course that's all bunkum max commented carlyle still i appreciate your motive practically everything i possess was left to me by an american cousin on the condition that i took the name of carrados he made his fortune by an ingenious conspiracy of doctoring the crop reports and unloading favorably in consequence and i need hardly remind you that the receiver is equally guilty with the thief but twice as safe i know something of that max have you any idea what my business is you should tell me replied carrados i run a private inquiry agency when i lost my profession i had to do something for a living this occurred i dropped my name changed my appearance and opened an office i knew the legal side down to the ground and i got a retired scotland yard man to organize the outside work excellent cried carrados do you unearth many murders no admitted carlyle our business lies mostly on the conventional lines among divorce and defocation that's a pity remarked carrados do you know lewis i always had a secret ambition to be a detective myself i had even thought lately that i might still be able to do something at it if the chance came my way that makes you smile well certainly the idea yes the idea of a blind detective the blind tracking the alert of course as you say certain faculties are no doubt quickened mr carlyle hastened to add considerately but seriously with the exception of an artist i don't suppose there is any man who is more utterly dependent on his eyes whatever opinion carrados might have held privately his genial exterior did not betray a shadow of dissent for a full minute he continued to smoke as though he derived an actual visual enjoyment from the blue sprays that travelled and dispersed across the room he had already placed before his visitor a box containing cigars of a brand which that gentleman keenly appreciated but generally regarded as unattainable and the matter-of-fact ease and certainty with which the blind man had brought the box and put it before him had sent a questioning flicker through carlyle's mind 
you used to be rather fond of art yourself louis he remarked presently give me your opinion of my latest purchase the bronze lion on the cabinet there then as carlyle's gaze went about the room he added quickly no not that cabinet the one on your left carlyle shot a sharp glance at his host as he got up but carrados's expression was merely benignly complacent then he strolled across to the figure very nice he admitted late flemish isn't it no it's a copy of vidal's roaring lion vidal a french artist the voice became indescribably flat he also had the misfortune to be blind by the way you old humbug max shrieked carlyle you've been thinking that out for the last five minutes then the unfortunate man bit his lip and turned his back towards his host do you remember how we used to pile it up on that obtuse ass sanders and then roast him asked carrados ignoring the half-smothered exclamation with which the other man had recalled himself yes replied carlyle quietly this is very good he continued addressing himself to the bronze again however did he do it with his hands naturally but i mean how did he study his model also with his hands he called it seeing near even with a lion handled it in such cases he required the services of a keeper who brought the animal to bay while vidal exercised his own particular gifts you don't feel inclined to put me on the track of a mystery louis unable to regard this request as anything but one of old max's unquenchable pleasantries mr carlyle was on the point of making a suitable reply when a sudden thought caused him to smile knowingly up to that point he had indeed completely forgotten the object of his visit now that he remembered the doubtful dionysius and mr baxter's recommendation he immediately assumed that some mistake had been made either max was not the win carrados he had been seeking or else the dealer had been misinformed for although his host was wonderfully expert in the face of his misfortune it was inconceivable that he could decide the genuineness of a coin without seeing it the opportunity seemed a good one of getting even with carrados by taking him at his word yes he accordingly replied with crisp deliberation as he recrossed the room yes i will max here is the clue to what seems to be a rather remarkable fraud he put the tetradrachm into his host's hand what do you make of it for a few seconds carrados handled the piece with the delicate manipulation of his fingertips while carlyle looked on with a self-appreciative grin then with equal gravity the blind man weighed the coin in the balance of his hand finally he touched it with his tongue well demanded the other of course i have not much to go on and if i was more fully in your confidence i might come to another conclusion yes yes interposed carlyle with amused encouragement then i should advise you to arrest the parlour-maid nina brune communicate with the police authorities of padua for particulars of the career of helene brunesi and suggest to lord seastoke that he should return to london to see what further depredations have been made in his cabinet mr carlyle's groping hand sought and found a chair onto which he dropped blankly his eyes were unable to detach themselves for a single moment from the very ordinary spectacle of mr carrados's mildly benevolent face while the sterilized ghost of his now forgotten amusement still lingered about his features good heavens he managed to articulate how do you know isn't that what you wanted of me asked carrados suavely don't humbug max said carlyle severely this is no joke an undefined mistrust of his own powers suddenly possessed him in the presence of this mystery how do you come to know of nina brune and lord seastoke you are a detective louis replied carrados how does one know these things by using one's eyes and putting two and two together carlyle groaned and flung out an arm petulantly is it all bunkum max do you really see all the time though that doesn't go very far towards explaining it like vidal i see very well at close quarters replied carrados lightly running a forefinger along the inscription on the tetradrachm for longer range i keep another pair of eyes would you like to test them mr carlyle's assent was not very gracious it was in fact faintly sulky he was suffering the annoyance of feeling distinctly unimpressive in his own department but he was also curious the bell is just behind you if you don't mind said his host parkinson will appear you might take note of him while he is in 
the man who had admitted mr carlyle proved to be parkinson this gentleman is mr carlyle parkinson explained carrados the moment the man entered you will remember him for the future parkinson's apologetic eye swept the visitor from head to foot but so lightly and swiftly that it conveyed to that gentleman the comparison of being very deftly dusted i will endeavour to do so sir replied parkinson turning again to his master i shall be at home to mr carlyle whenever he calls that is all very well sir now lewis remarked mr carrados briskly when the door had closed again you have had a good opportunity of studying parkinson what is he like in what way i mean as a matter of description i am a blind man i haven't seen my servant for twelve years what idea can you give me of him i asked you to notice i know you did but your parkinson is the sort of man who has very little about him to describe he is the embodiment of the ordinary his height is about average five feet nine murmured carrados slightly above the mean scarcely noticeably so clean-shaven medium brown hair no particularly marked features dark eyes good teeth false interposed carrados the teeth not the statement possibly admitted mr carlyle i am not a dental expert and i had no opportunity of examining mr parkinson's mouth in detail but what is the drift of all this his clothes oh just the ordinary evening dress of a valet there is not much room for variety in that you noticed in fact nothing special by which parkinson could be identified well he wore an unusually broad gold ring on the little finger of the left hand but that is removable and yet parkinson has an ineradicable mole a small one i admit on his chin and you a human sleuth-hound oh lewis at all events retorted carlyle writhing a little under this good-humoured satire although it was easy enough to see in it carrados's affectionate intention at all events i dare say i can give as good a description of parkinson as he can give of me that is what we are going to test ring the bell again seriously quite i am trying my eyes against yours if i can't give you fifty out of a hundred i'll renounce my private detectorial ambition for ever it isn't quite the same objected carlyle but he rang the bell come in and close the door parkinson said carrados when the man appeared don't look at mr carlyle again in fact you had better stand with your back towards him he won't mind now describe to me his appearance as you observed it parkinson tendered his respectful apologies to mr carlyle for the liberty he was compelled to take by the deferential quality of his voice mr carlyle sir wears patent leather boots of about size seven and very little used there are five buttons but on the left boot one button the third up is missing leaving loose threads and not the more usual metal fastener mr carlyle's trousers sir are of a dark material a dark grey line of about a quarter of an inch width on a darker ground the bottoms are turned permanently up and are just now a little muddy if i may say so very muddy interposed mr carlyle generously it is a wet night parkinson yes sir very unpleasant weather if you will allow me sir i will brush you in the hall the mud is dry now i notice then sir continued parkinson reverting to the business in hand there are dark green cashmere hose a curb pattern keychain passes into the left-hand trouser pocket from the visitor's nether garments the photographic-eyed parkinson proceeded to higher ground and with increasing wonder mr carlyle listened to the faithful catalogue of his possessions his fetter and link albert of gold and platinum was minutely described his spotted blue ascot with its gentlemanly pearl scarf-pin was set forth and the fact that the buttonhole in the left lapel of his morning coat showed signs of use was duly noted what parkinson saw he recorded but he made no deductions a handkerchief carried in the cuff of the right sleeve was simply that to him and not an indication that mr carlyle was indeed left-handed but a more delicate part of parkinson's undertaking remained he approached it with a double cough <coughs> as regards mr carlyle's personal appearance sir no enough cried the gentleman concerned hastily i am more than satisfied you are a keen observer parkinson i have trained myself to suit my master's requirements sir replied the man he looked toward mr carrados received a nod and withdrew mr carlyle was the first to speak 
that man of yours would be worth five pounds a week to me max he remarked thoughtfully but of course i don't think that he would take it replied carrados in a voice of equally detached speculation he suits me very well but you have the chance of using his services indirectly you still mean that seriously i notice in you a chronic disinclination to take me seriously louis it is really to an englishman almost painful is there something inherently comic about me or the atmosphere of the turrets no my friend replied mr carlyle but there is something essentially prosperous that is what points to the improbable now what is it it might be merely a whim but it is more than that replied carrados it is well partly vanity partly ennui partly certainly there was something more nearly tragic in his voice than comic now partly hope mr carlyle was too tactful to pursue the subject those are three tolerable motives he acquiesced i'll do anything you want max on one condition agreed and it is but you tell me how you knew so much of this affair he tapped the silver coin which lay on the table near them i am not easily flabbergasted he added you don't believe that there is nothing to explain that it was purely second sight no replied carlyle tersely i won't you are quite right and yet the thing is very simple they always are when you know soliloquized the other that's what makes them so confoundedly difficult when you don't here is this one then in padua which seems to be regaining its old reputation as the birthplace of spurious antiques by the way there lives an ingenious craftsman named pietro stelli this simple soul who possesses a talent not inferior to that of cavino at his best has for many years turned his hand to the not improfitable occupation of forging rare greek and roman coins as a collector and student of certain greek colonials and a specialist in forgeries i have been familiar with stelli's workmanship for years latterly he seems to have come under the influence of an international crook called at the moment dompierre who soon saw a way of utilizing stelli's genius on a royal scale helene brunessi who in private life is and really is i believe madame dompierre readily lent her services to the enterprise quite so nodded mr carlyle as his host paused you see the whole sequence of course not exactly not in detail confessed mr carlyle dompierre's idea was to gain access to some of the most celebrated cabinets of europe and substitute stelli's fabrications for the genuine coins the princely collection of rarities that he would thus amass might be difficult to dispose of safely but i have no doubt that he had matured his plans helene in the person of nina brune an anglicized french parlour-maid a part which she fills to perfection was to obtain wax impressions of the most valuable pieces and to make the exchange when the counterfeits reached her in this way it was obviously hoped that the fraud would not come to light until long after the real coins had been sold and i gather that she has already done her work successfully in several houses then impressed by her excellent references and capable manner my housekeeper engaged her and for a few weeks she went about her duties here it was fatal to this detail of the scheme however that i have the misfortune to be blind i am told that helene has so innocently angelic a face as to disarm suspicion but i was incapable of being impressed and that good material was thrown away but one morning my material fingers which of course knew nothing of helene's angelic face discovered an unfamiliar touch about the surface of my favourite euclidius and although there was doubtless nothing to be seen my critical sense of smell reported that wax had been recently pressed against it i began to make discreet inquiries and in the meantime my cabinets went to the local bank for safety helene countered by receiving a telegram from angiers calling her to the deathbed of her aged mother the aged mother succumbed duty compelled helene to remain at the side of her stricken patriarchal father and doubtless the turrets was written off the syndicate's operations as a bad debt very interesting admitted mr carlyle but at the risk of seeming obtuse his manner had become delicately chastened i must say that i fail to trace the inevitable connection between nina brune and this particular forgery assuming that it is a forgery set your mind at rest about that louis replied carrados 
it is a forgery and it is a forgery that none but pietro stelli could have achieved that is the essential connection of course there are accessories a private detective coming urgently to see me with a notable tetradrachm in his pocket which he announces to be the clue to a remarkable fraud well really louis one scarcely needs to be blind to see through that and lord seastoke i suppose you happened to discover that nina brune had gone there no i cannot claim to have discovered that or i should certainly have warned him at once when i found out only recently about the gang as a matter of fact the last information i had of lord seastoke was a line in yesterday's morning post to the effect that he was still at cairo but many of these pieces he brushed his finger almost lovingly across the vivid chariot race that embellished the reverse of the coin and broke off to remark you really ought to take up the subject louis you have no idea how useful it might prove to you some day i really think i must replied carlyle grimly two hundred and fifty pounds the original of this cost i believe cheap too it would make five hundred pounds in new york to-day as i was saying many are literally unique this gem by kimon is here is his signature you see peter is particularly good at lettering and as i handled the genuine tetradrachm about two years ago when lord seastoke exhibited it at a meeting of our society in albemarle street there is nothing at all wonderful in my being able to fix the locale of your mystery indeed i feel that i ought to apologize for it all being so simple i think remarked mr carlyle critically examining the loose threads on his left boot that the apology on that head would be more appropriate from me End of section one read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, Shaggybark dot blogspot dot com Section two of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. The Knight's Cross Signal Problem. Lewis! exclaimed Mr. Carrados, with the air of genial gaiety that Carlyle had found so incongruous to his conception of a blind man. You have a mystery somewhere about you. I know it by your step. Nearly a month had passed since the incident of the false Dionysius had led to the two men meeting. It was now December whatever mr carlyle's step might indicate to the inner eye it betokened to the casual observer the manner of a crisp alert self-possessed man of business carlyle in truth betrayed nothing of the pessimism and despondency that had marked him on the earlier occasion you have only yourself to thank that it is a very poor one he retorted if you hadn't held me to a hasty promise to give me an option on the next case that baffled you no matter what it was just so the consequence is that you get a very unsatisfactory affair that has no special interest to an amateur and is only baffling because it is well well baffling exactly max your would-be jest has discovered the proverbial truth i need hardly tell you that it is only the insoluble that is finally baffling and this is very probably insoluble you remember the awful smash on the central and suburban at knight's cross station a few weeks ago yes replied carrados with interest i read the whole ghastly details at the time you read exclaimed his friend suspiciously i still use the familiar phrases explained carrados with a smile as a matter of fact my secretary reads to me i mark what i want to hear and when he comes at ten o'clock we clear off the morning papers in no time and how do you know what to mark demanded mr carlyle cunningly carrados's right hand lying idly on the table moved to a newspaper near he ran his finger along a column heading his eyes still turned toward his visitor the money market continued from page two british railways he announced extraordinary murmured carlyle not very said carrados if someone dipped a stick in treacle and wrote rats across a marble slab you would probably be able to distinguish what was there blindfold probably admitted mr carlyle at all events we will not test the experiment the difference to you of treacle on a marble background is scarcely greater than that of printer's ink on newspaper to me 
but anything smaller than pica i do not read with comfort and below long primer i cannot read at all hence the secretary now the accident lewis the accident well you remember all about that an ordinary central and suburban passenger train non-stop at night's cross ran past the signal and crashed into a crowded electric train that was just beginning to move out it was like sending a garden roller down a row of hand lights two carriages of the electric train were flattened out of existence the next two were broken up for the first time on an english railway there was a good stand-up smash between a heavy steam engine and a train of light cars and it was bad for the coup twenty-seven killed forty-something injured eight died since commented carrados that was bad for the company said carlyle well the main fact was plain enough the heavy train was in the wrong but was the engine driver responsible he claimed and he claimed vehemently from the first and he never varied one iota that he had a clear signal that is to say the green light it being dark the signalman concerned was equally dogged that he never pulled off the signal that it was at danger when the accident happened and that it had been for five minutes before obviously they could not both be right why lewis asked mr carrados smoothly the signal must either have been up or down green or red did you ever notice the signals on the great northern railway lewis not particularly why one winterly day about the year when you and i were concerned in being born the engine driver of a scotch express received the clear from a signal near a little huntington station called abbott's ripton he went on and crashed into a goods train and into the thick of the smash a down express mowed its way thirteen killed and the usual tale of injured he was positive that the signal gave him a clear the signalman was equally confident that he had never pulled it off the danger both were right and yet the signal was in working order as i said it was a winterly day it had been snowing hard and the snow froze and accumulated on the upper edge of the signal arm until its weight bore it down that is a fact that no fiction writer dare have invented but to this day every signal on the great northern pivots from the centre of the arm instead of from the end in memory of that snowstorm that came out at the inquest i presume said mr carlyle we have had the board of trade inquiry and the inquest here and no explanation is forthcoming everything was in perfect order it rests between the word of the signalman and the word of the engine driver not a jot of direct evidence either way which is right that is what you are going to find out lewis suggested carrados it is what i am being paid for finding out admitted mr carlyle frankly but so far we are just where the inquest left it and between ourselves i candidly can't see an inch in front of my face in the matter nor can i said the blind man with a rather wry smile never mind the engine driver is your client of course yes admitted carlyle but how the deuce did you know let us say that your sympathies are enlisted on his behalf the jury were inclined to exonerate the signalman weren't they what has the company done with your man both are suspended hutchins the driver hears that he may probably be given charge of a lavatory at one of the stations he is a decent bluff short-spoken old chap with his heart in his work just now you'll find him at his worst bitter and suspicious the thought of swabbing down a lavatory and taking pennies all day is poisoning him naturally well there we have honest hutchings taciturn a little touchy perhaps grown grey in the service of the company and manifesting quite a bulldog-like devotion to his favourite five thirty eight why well, that actually was the number of his engine how did you know it demanded carlyle sharply it was mentioned two or three times at the inquest lewis replied carrados mildly and you remembered with no reason to you can generally trust a blind man's memory especially if he has taken the trouble to develop it then you will remember that hutchins did not make a very good impression at the time he was surly and irritable under the ordeal i want you to see the case from all sides he called the signalman meade a lying young dog across the room i believe now meade what is he like you have seen him of course yes he does not impress me favourably he is glib ingratiating and distinctly greasy he has a ready answer for everything almost before the question is out of your mouth he has thought of everything 
and now you are going to tell me something lewis said carrados encouragingly mr carlyle laughed a little to cover an involuntary movement of surprise there is a suggestive line that was not touched at the inquiries he admitted hutchins has been a saving man all his life and he has received good wages among his class he is regarded as wealthy i dare say that he has five hundred pounds in the bank he is a widower with one daughter a very nice-mannered girl of about twenty mead is a young man and he and the girl are sweethearts have been informally engaged for some time but old hutchins would not hear of it he seems to have taken a dislike to the signalman from the first and latterly he had forbidden him to come to his house or his daughter to speak to him excellent lewis cried carrados in great delight we shall clear your man in a blaze of red and green lights yet and hang the glib greasy signalman from his own signal post it is a significant fact seriously it is absolutely convincing it may have been a slip a mental lapse on meade's part which he discovered the moment it was too late and then being too cowardly to admit his fault and having so much at stake he took care to make detection impossible it may have been that but my idea is rather that probably it was neither quite pure accident nor pure design i can imagine mead meanly pluming himself over the fact that the life of this man who stands in his way and whom he must cordially dislike lies in his power i can imagine the idea becoming an obsession as he dwells on it a dozen times with his hand on the lever he lets his mind explore the possibilities of a moment's defection then one day he pulls the signal off in sheer bravado and hastily puts it at danger again he may have done it once or he may have done it oftener before he was caught in a fatal moment of irresolution the chances are about even that the engine driver would be killed in any case he would be disgraced for it was easier on the face of it to believe that a man might run past a danger signal in absent-mindedness without noticing it than that a man should pull off a signal and replace it without being conscious of his actions the fireman was killed does your theory involve the certainty of the fireman being killed lewis no said carlyle the fireman is a difficulty but looking at it from meade's point of view whether he has been guilty of an error or a crime it resolves itself into this first the fireman may be killed second he may not notice the signal at all third in any case he will loyally corroborate his driver and the good old jury will discount that carrados smoked thoughtfully his open sightless eyes merely appearing to be set in a tranquil gaze across the room it would not be an improbable explanation he said presently ninety-nine men out of a hundred would say people do not do these things but you and i who have in our different ways studied criminology know that they sometimes do or else there would be no curious crimes what have you done on that line to anyone who could see mr carlyle's expression conveyed an answer you are behind the scenes max what was there for me to do still i must do something for my money well i have had a very close inquiry made confidentially among the men there might be a whisper of one of them knowing more than had come out a man restrained by friendship or enmity or even great jealousy nothing came of that then there was the remote chance that some private person had noticed the signal without attaching any importance to it then one who would be able to identify it still by something associated with the time i went over the line myself opposite the signal the line on one side is shut in by a high blank wall on the other side are houses but coming below the butt end of a scullery the signal does not happen to be visible from any road or from any window my poor lewis said carrados in friendly ridicule you were at the end of your tether i was admitted carlyle and now that you know the sort of job it is i don't suppose that you are keen on wasting your time over it that would hardly be fair would it said carrados reasonably no lewis i will take over your honest old driver and your greasy young signalman and your fatal sign that cannot be seen from anywhere but it is an important point for you to remember max that although the signal cannot be seen from the box if the mechanism had gone wrong or any one tampered with the arm the automatic indicator would at once have told meade that the green light was showing oh i have gone very thoroughly into the technical points i assure you i must do so too commented mr carrados gravely for that matter if there is anything you want to know i dare say that i can tell you suggested his visitor it might save your time 
true acquiesced carrados i should like to know whether any one belonging to the houses that bound the line there came of age or got married on the twenty sixth of november mr carlyle looked across curiously at his host i really do not know max he replied in his crisp precise way what on earth has that got to do with it may i inquire the only explanation of the pont street line swing bridge disaster of seventy five was the reflection of a green bengal light on a cottage window mr carlyle smiled his indulgence privately my dear chap you mustn't let your retentive memory of obscure happenings run away with you he remarked wisely in nine cases out of ten the obvious explanation is the true one the difficulty as here lies in proving it now you would like to see these men i expect so in any case i shall see hutchins first both live in holloway shall i ask hutchins to come here to see you say to-morrow he is doing nothing no replied carrados to-morrow i must call on my brokers and my time may be filled up quite right you mustn't neglect your own affairs for this e experiment assented carlyle besides i should prefer to drop in on hutchins at his own home now lewis enough of the honest old man for one night i have a lovely thing by eumenes that i want to show you to-day is tuesday come to dinner on sunday and pour the vials of your ridicule on my want of success that's an amiable way of putting it replied carlyle all right i will two hours later carrados was again in his study apparently for a wonder sitting idle sometimes he smiled to himself and once or twice he laughed a little but for the most part his pleasant impassive face reflected no emotion and he sat with his useless eyes tranquilly fixed on an unseen distance it was a fantastic caprice of the man to mock his sightlessness by a parade of light and under the soft brilliance of a dozen electric brackets the room was as bright as day at length he stood up and rang the bell i suppose mr greatorex isn't still here by any chance parkinson he asked referring to his secretary i think not sir but i will ascertain replied the man never mind go to his room and bring me the last two files of the times now when he returned turn to the earliest you have there the date november the second that will do find the money market it will be in the supplement now look down the columns until you come to british railways i have it sir central and suburban read the closing price and the change central and suburban ordinary sixty six and one half to sixty seven and one half fall one eight preferred ordinary eighty one to eighty one and one half no change deferred ordinary twenty seven and one half to twenty seven and three quarters fall one quarter that is all sir now take a paper about a week on read the deferred only twenty-seven to twenty-seven and one quarter no change another week twenty-nine and one half to thirty rise five-eighths another thirty-seven and one half to thirty-two and one half rise one very good now on tuesday the twenty-seventh november thirty-one and seven-eighths to thirty-two and three-quarters rise one-half yes the next day twenty-four and one-half to twenty-three and one-half fall nine quite so parkinson there had been an accident you see yes sir very unpleasant accident jane knows a person whose sister's young man has a cousin who had his arm torn off in it torn off at the socket she says sir it seems to bring it home to one sir that is all stay in the paper you have look down the first money column and see if there is any reference to the central and suburban yes sir city and suburbans which offer their late depression on the projected extension of the motor bus service had been steadily creeping up on the abandonment of the scheme and as a result of their own excellent traffic returns suffered a heavy slump through the lamentable accident of thursday night the deferred in particular at one time fell eleven points as it was felt that the possible dividend with which rumour has of late been busy was now out of the question yes that is all now you can take the papers back and let it be a warning to you parkinson not to invest your savings in speculative railway deferreds 
yes sir thank you sir i shall endeavour to remember he lingered for a moment as he shook the file of papers level i may say sir that i have my eye on a small block of cottage property in acton but even cottage property scarcely seems safe from legislative depredation now sir the next day mr carrados called on his brokers in the city it is to be presumed that he got through his private business quicker than he expected for after leaving austin friars he continued his journey to holloway where he found hutchins at home and sitting morosely before his kitchen fire rightly assuming that his luxuriant car would involve him in a certain amount of public attention in klondike street the blind man dismissed it some distance from the house and walked the rest of the way guided by the almost imperceptible touch of parkinson's arm here is a gentleman to see you father explained miss hutchins who had come to the door she divined the relative positions of the two visitors at a glance then why don't you take him into the parlour grumbled the ex-driver his face was a testimonial of hard work and general sobriety but at the moment one might hazard from his voice and manner that he had been drinking earlier in the day i don't think that the gentleman would be impressed by the difference between our parlour and our kitchen replied the girl quaintly and it is warmer here what's the matter with the parlour now demanded her father sourly it was good enough for your mother and me it used to be good enough for you there is nothing the matter with it nor with the kitchen either she turned impassively to the two who had followed her along the narrow passageway will you go in sir i don't want to see no gentleman cried hutchins noisily unless his manner suddenly changed to one of pitiable anxiety unless you're from the company sir to to no i have come on mr carlyle's behalf replied carrados walking to a chair as though he moved by a kind of instinct hutchins laughed at his wry contempt mr carlyle he reiterated mr carlyle fat lot of good he's been why don't he do something for his money he has replied carrados with imperturbable good humour he has sent me now i want to ask you a few questions a few questions roared the irate man why blast it i have done nothing else but answer questions for a month i didn't pay mr carlyle to ask me questions i can get enough of that for nix's why don't you go and ask mr herbert ananias mead your few questions and you might find out something there was a slight movement by the door and carrados knew that the girl had quietly left the room you saw that sir demanded the father diverted to a new line of bitterness you saw that girl my own daughter that i've worked for all her life no replied carrados the girl's just gone out she's my daughter explained hutchins i know but i did not see her i see nothing i am blind blind exclaimed the old fellow sitting up in startled wonderment you mean it sir you walk all right and you look at me as if you saw me you're kidding surely no smiled carrados it's quite right then it's a funny business sir you what are blind expecting to find something that those with their eyes couldn't ruminated hutchins sagely there are things that you can't see with your eyes hutchins perhaps you are right sir well what is it you want to know light a cigar first said the blind man holding out his case and waiting until the various sounds told him that his host was smoking contentedly the train you were driving at the time of the accident was the six twenty seven from notcliffe it stopped everywhere until it reached lambeth bridge the chief london station of your line there it became something of an express and leaving lambeth bridge at seven eleven should not stop again until it fetched swanstead in thames eleven miles out at seven thirty four then it stopped on and off from swanstead to ingerfield the terminus of that branch which it reached at eight five hutchins nodded and then remembering said that's right sir that was your business all day running between notcliffe and ingerfield yes sir three journeys up and three down mostly with the same stops on all the down journeys no the seven eleven is the only one that does a run from the bridge to swanstead you see it is just on the close of the evening rush as they call it a good many late business gentlemen living at swanstead use the seven eleven regular the other journeys we stop at every station to lambeth bridge and then here and there beyond there are of course other trains doing exactly the same journey a service in fact yes sir about six and do any of these say during the rush do any of these run non-stop from lambeth to swanstead 
hutchins reflected a moment all the collar and restlessness had melted out of the man's face he was again the excellent artisan slow but capable and self-reliant that i couldn't definitely say sir very few short distance trains pass the junction but some of these may a guide would show us in a minute but i haven't got one never mind you said at the inquest that it was no uncommon thing for you to be pulled up at the stop signal east of knight's cross station how often would that happen only with the seven eleven mind perhaps three times a week perhaps twice the accident was on a thursday have you noticed that you were pulled up oftener on a thursday than on any other day a smile crossed the driver's face at the question you don't happen to live at swanstead yourself sir he asked in reply no admitted carrados why well sir we were always pulled up on thursday practically always you might say it got to be quite a saying among those who use the train regular they used to look out for it carrados's sightless eyes had the one quality of concealing emotion supremely oh he commented softly always and it was quite a saying was it and why was it always on thursday it had to do with the early closing i'm told the suburban traffic was a bit different by rights we ought to have been set back two minutes for that day but i suppose it wasn't thought worth while to alter us in the timetable so we most always had to wait outside the three deep tunnel for a westbound electric to make good you were prepared for it then yes sir i was said hutchins reddening at some recollection and very down about it was one of the jury over that but mayhap once in three months i did get through even on a thursday and it's not for me to question whether things are right or wrong just because they are not what i may expect the signals are my orders sir stop go on and it's for me to obey as you would a general on a field of battle what would happen otherwise it was nonsense what they said about going cautious and the man who started it was a barber who didn't know the difference between a distance and a stop signal down to the minute they gave their verdict my order sir given me by that signal was go right ahead and keep to your running time carrados nodded a soothing assent that is all i think he remarked all exclaimed hutchins in surprise why sir you can't have got much idea of it yet quite enough and i know it isn't pleasant for you to be taken along the same ground over and over again the man moved awkwardly in his chair and pulled nervously at his grizzled beard you mustn't take any notice of what i said just now sir he apologized you somehow make me feel that like something may come of it but i've been badgered about and accused and cross-examined from one to another of them these weeks till it's fairly made me bitter against everything and now they talk of putting me in a lavatory me that has been with the company for five and forty years and on the footplate thirty-two a man suspected of running past a danger signal you have had a rough time hutchins you will have to exercise your patience a little longer yet said carrados sympathetically you think something may come of it sir you think you will be able to clear me believe me sir if you could give me something to look forward to it might save me from he pulled himself up and shook his head sorrowfully i've been near it he added simply carrados reflected and took his resolution to-day is wednesday i think you may hope to hear something from your general manager towards the middle of next week good god sir you really mean that in the interval show your good sense by behaving reasonably keep civilly to yourself and don't talk above all he nodded towards a quart jug that stood on the table between them an incident that filled the simple-minded engineer with boundless wonder when he recalled it afterwards above all leave that alone hutchins snatched up the vessel and brought it crashing down on the hearthstone his face shining with a set resolution i've done with it sir it was the bitterness and despair that drove me to that now i can do without it the door was hastily opened and miss hutchins looked anxiously from her father to the visitors and back again oh whatever is the matter she exclaimed i heard a great crash this gentleman is going to clear me meg my dear blurted out the old man irrepressibly and i've done with the drink forever hutchins hutchins said carrados warningly my daughter sir you wouldn't have had her not know pleaded hutchins rather crestfallen it won't go any further carrados laughed quietly to himself as he felt margaret hutchins's startled and questioning eyes attempting to read his mind he shook hands with the engine-driver without further comment however 
and walked out into the commonplace little street under parkinson's unobtrusive guidance very nice of miss hutchins to go into half mourning parkinson he remarked as they went along thoughtful and yet not ostentatious yes sir agreed parkinson who had long ceased to wonder at his master's perceptions the romans parkinson had a saying to the effect that gold carries no smell that is a pity sometimes what jewellery did miss hutchins wear very little sir a plain gold brooch representing a merry thought the merry thought of a sparrow i should say sir the only other article was a smooth-backed gun-metal watch suspended from a gun-metal bow nothing showy or expensive eh oh dear no sir quite appropriate for a young person of her position just what i should have expected he slackened his pace we are passing a hoarding are we not yes sir we will stand here a moment read me the letterpress of the poster before us this oxo one sir yes oxo sir carrados was convulsed with silent laughter parkinson had infinitely more dignity and conceded merely a tolerant recognition of the ludicrous that was a bad shot parkinson remarked his master when he could speak we will try another for three minutes with scrupulous conscientiousness on the part of the reader and every appearance of keen interest on the part of the hearer there were set forth the particulars of a sale by auction of superfluous timber and builder's material that will do said carrados when the last detail had been reached we can't be seen from the door of number one o seven still yes sir no indication of anyone coming to us from there no sir carrados walked thoughtfully on again in the holloway road they rejoined the waiting motor-car lambeth bridge station was the order the driver received from the station the car was sent on home and parkinson was instructed to take two first-class singles for richmond which could be reached by changing at stratford road the evening rush had not yet commenced and they had no difficulty in finding an empty carriage when the train came in parkinson was kept busy that journey describing what he saw at various points between lambeth bridge and knight's cross for a quarter of a mile carrados's demands on the eyes and the memory of his remarkable servant were wide and incessant then his questions ceased they had passed the stop signal east of knight's cross station the following afternoon they made the return journey as far as knight's cross this time however the surroundings failed to interest carrados we are going to look at some rooms was the information he offered on the subject and an imperturbable yes sir had been the extent of parkinson's comment on the unusual proceeding after leaving the station they turned sharply along a road that ran parallel with the line a dull thoroughfare of substantial elderly houses that were beginning to sink into decrepitude here and there a corner residence displayed the brass plate of a professional occupant but for the most part they were given up to the various branches of second-rate apartment letting the third house after the one with the flagstaff said carrados parkinson rang the bell which was answered by a young servant who took an early opportunity of assuring them that she was not tidy as it was rather early in the afternoon she informed carrados in reply to his inquiry that miss chubb was at home and showed them into a melancholy little sitting-room to await her appearance i shall be almost blind here parkinson remarked carrados walking about the room it saves explanation very good sir replied parkinson five minutes later an interval suggesting that miss chubb also found it rather early in the afternoon carrados was arranging to take rooms for his attendant and himself for the short time that he would be in london seeing an oculist one bedroom mine must face north he stipulated it has to do with the light miss chubb replied that she quite understood some gentlemen she added had their requirements others their fancies she endeavoured to suit all the bedroom she had in view from the first did face north she would not have known only the last gentleman curiously enough had made the same request a sufferer like myself inquired carrados affably miss chubb did not think so in this case she regarded it merely as a fancy he had said that he could not sleep on any other side she had had to turn out her own room to accommodate him but if one kept an apartment house one had to be adaptable 
and mr Gouche was certainly very liberal in his ideas Gouche, an indian gentleman i presume hazarded carrados it appeared that mr Gouche was an indian miss chubb confided that at first she had been rather perturbed at the idea of taking in a black man as she confessed to regarding him she reiterated however that mr Gouche proved to be quite the gentleman five minutes of affability put carrados in full possession of mr Gouche's manner of life and movements the dates of his arrival and departure his solitariness and his daily habits this would be the best bedroom said miss chubb it was a fair-sized room on the first floor the window looked out on to the roof of an outbuilding beyond the deep cutting of the railway line opposite stood the dead wall that mr carlyle had spoken of carrados looked around the room with the discriminating glance that sometimes proved so embarrassing to those who knew him i have to take a little daily exercise he remarked walking to the window and running his hand up the woodwork you will not mind my fixing a developer here miss chubb a few small screws miss chubb thought not then she was sure not finally she ridiculed the idea of minding with scorn if there is width enough mused carrados spanning the upright critically do you happen to have a wooden foot rule convenient well to be sure exclaimed miss chubb opening a rapid succession of drawers until she produced the required article when we did out this room after mr Gouche, there was this very ruler among the things that he hadn't thought worth taking this is what you require sir yes replied carrados accepting it i think this is exactly what i require it was a common new white wood rule such as one might buy at any small stationer's for a penny he carelessly took off the width of the upright reading the figures with a touch and then continued to run a fingertip delicately up and down the edges of the instrument four and seven eighths was his unspoken conclusion i hope it will do sir admirably replied carrados but i haven't reached the end of my requirements yet miss chubb no sir said the landlady feeling that it would be a pleasure to oblige so agreeable a gentleman what else might there be although i can see very little i like to have a light but not any kind of light gas i cannot do with do you think that you would be able to find me an oil lamp certainly sir i got out a very nice brass lamp that i have specially for mr Gouche. he read a good deal of an evening and he preferred a lamp that is very convenient i suppose it is large enough to burn for a whole evening yes indeed and very particular he was always to have it filled every day a lamp without oil is not very useful smiled carrados following her towards another room and absent-mindedly slipping the foot rule into his pocket whatever parkinson thought of the arrangement of going into second-rate apartments in an obscure street it is to be inferred that his devotion to his master was sufficient to overcome his private emotions as a self-respecting man at all rates as they were approaching the station he asked and without a trace of feeling whether there were any orders for him with reference to the proposed migration none parkinson replied his master we must be satisfied with our present quarters i beg your pardon sir said parkinson with some constraint i understood that you had taken the rooms for a week certain i am afraid that miss chubb will be under the same impression unforeseen circumstances will prevent our going however mr greatorex must write to-morrow enclosing a cheque with my regrets and adding a penny for this ruler which i seem to have brought away with me it at least is something for the money parkinson may be excused for not attempting to understand the course of events here is your train coming in sir he merely said we will let it go and wait for another is there a signal at either end of the platform yes sir at the further end let us walk towards it are there any of the porters or officials about here no sir none take this ruler i want you to go up the steps there are steps up the signal by the way yes sir i want you to measure the glass of the lamp do not go up any higher than is necessary but if you have to stretch be careful not to mark on the measurement with your nail although the impulse is a natural one that has been done already parkinson looked apprehensively around and about fortunately the part was a dark and unfrequented spot and everyone else was moving towards the exit at the other end of the platform fortunately also the signal was not a high one as near as i can judge on the rounded surface the glass is four and seven-eighths the cross reported parkinson thank you replied carrados returning the measure to his pocket 
four and seven-eighths is quite near enough shall we take the next train back sunday evening came and with it mr carlyle to the turrets at the appointed hour he brought to the situation a mind poised for any eventuality and a trenchant eye as the time went on and the impenetrable carrados made no allusion to the case carlyle's manner inclined to a waggish commiseration of his host's position actually he said little but the crisp precision of his voice when the path lay open to a remark of any significance left little to be said it was not until they had finished dinner and returned to the library that carrados gave the slightest hint of anything unusual being in the air his first indication of coming events was to remove the key from the outside to the inside of the door what are you doing max demanded mr carlyle his curiosity overcoming the indirect attitude you have been very entertaining louis replied his friend but parkinson should be back very soon now and it is well to be prepared do you happen to carry a revolver not when i come to dine with you max replied carlyle with all the aplomb he could muster is it usual carrados smiled affectionately at his guest's agile recovery and touched the secret spring of a drawer in an antique bureau by his side the little receptacle shot smoothly out disclosing a pair of dull blued pistols to-night at all events it might be prudent he replied handing one to carlyle and putting the other into his own pocket our man may be here at any minute and we do not know in what temper he will come our man exclaimed carlyle craning forward in excitement max you don't mean to say that you have got me to admit it no one has admitted it said carrados and it is not mead not mead do you mean that hutchins neither mead nor hutchins the man who tampered with the signal for hutchins was right and a green light was exhibited is a young indian from bengal his name is drishna and he lives at swanstead mr carlyle stared at his friend between sheer surprise and blank incredulity you really mean this carrados he said my fatal reputation for humour smiled carrados if i am wrong louis the next hour will expose it but why 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 the colossal villainy the unparalleled audacity mr carlyle lost himself among incredulous superlatives and could only stare chiefly to get himself out of a disastrous speculation replied carrados answering the question if there was another motive or at least an incentive which i suspect doubtless we shall hear of it all the same max i don't think that you have treated me quite fairly protested carlyle getting over his first surprise and passing to a sense of injury here we are and i know nothing absolutely nothing of the whole affair we both have our ideas of pleasantry louis replied carrados genially but i dare say you are right and perhaps there is still time to atone in the fewest possible words he outlined the course of his investigations and now you know all that is to be known until drishna arrives but will he come questioned carlyle doubtfully he may be suspicious yes he will be suspicious then he will not come on the contrary louis he will come because my letter will make him suspicious he is coming otherwise parkinson would have telephoned me at once and we should have had to take other measures what did you say max asked carlyle curiously i wrote that i was anxious to discuss an indo scythian inscription with him and sent my car in the hope that he would be able to oblige me but is he interested in indo scythian inscriptions i haven't the faintest idea admitted carrados and mr carlyle was throwing up his hands in despair when the sound of a motor-car wheels softly kissing the gravel surface of the drive outside brought him to his feet my god you are right max he exclaimed peeping through the curtains there is a man inside mr drishna announced parkinson a minute later the visitor came into the room with leisurely self-possession that might have been real or a desperate assumption he was a slightly built young man of about twenty-five with black hair and eyes a small carefully trained moustache and a dark olive skin his physiognomy was not displeasing but his expression had a harsh and supercilious tinge in attire he erred towards the immaculately spruce mr carrados he said inquiringly carrados who had risen bowed slightly without offering his hand this gentleman he said indicating his friend is mr carlyle the celebrated private detective the indian shot a very sharp glance at the object of this description then he sat down 
you wrote me a letter mr carrados he remarked in english that scarcely betrayed any foreign origin a rather curious letter i may say you asked me about an ancient inscription i know nothing of antiquities but i thought as you had sent that it would be more courteous if i came and explained this to you that was the object of my letter replied carrados you wish to see me said drishna unable to stand the ordeal of the silence that carrados imposed after his remark when you left miss chubb's house you left a ruler behind one lay on the desk by carrados and he took it up as he spoke i don't understand what you're talking about said drishna guardedly you are making some mistake the ruler was marked at four and seven eighths inches the measure of the glass of the signal lamp outside the unfortunate young man was unable to repress a start his face lost its healthy tone then with a sudden impulse he made a step forward and snatched the object from carrados's hand if it is mine i have a right to it he exclaimed snapping the ruler in two and throwing it on to the back of the blazing fire it is nothing pardon me i did not say that the one you have so impetuously disposed of was yours as a matter of fact it was mine yours is elsewhere wherever it is you have no right to it if it is mine panted drishna with rising excitement you are a thief mr carrados i will not stay any longer here he jumped up and turned towards the door carlyle made a step forward but the precaution was unnecessary one moment mr drishna interposed carrados in his smoothest tones it is a pity after you have come so far to leave without hearing of my investigations in the neighbourhood of shaftesbury avenue drishna sat down again as you like he muttered it does not interest me i wanted to obtain a lamp of a certain pattern continued carrados it seemed to me that the simplest explanation would be to say that i wanted it for a motor-car naturally i went to longacre at the first shop i said wasn't it here that a friend of mine an indian gentleman recently had a lamp made with a green glass that was nearly five inches across no it was not there but they could make me one at the next shop the same at the third and fourth and so on finally my persistence was rewarded i found the place where the lamp had been made and at the cost of ordering another i obtained all the details i wanted it was news to them the shopman informed me that in some parts of india green was the danger colour and therefore tail lamps had to show a green light the incident made some impression on him and he would be able to identify the customer who paid in advance and gave no address among a thousand of his countrymen do i succeed in interesting you mr drishna do you replied drishna with a languid yawn do i look interested you must make allowance for my unfortunate blindness apologized carrados with grim irony blindness exclaimed drishna dropping his affectation of unconcern as though electrified by the word do you mean really blind that you do not see me alas no admitted carrados the indian withdrew his right hand from his coat pocket and with a tragic gesture flung a heavy revolver down on the table between them i have had you covered all the time mr carrados and if i had wished to go and you or your friend had raised a hand to stop me it would have been at the peril of your lives he said in a voice of melancholy triumph but what is the use of defying fate and who successfully evades his destiny a month ago i went to see one of our people who reads the future and sought to know the course of certain events you need fear no human eye was the message given to me then she added but when the sightless sees the unseen make your peace with yama and i thought she spoke of the great hereafter this amounts to an admission of your guilt exclaimed mr carlyle practically i bow to the decree of fate replied drishna and it is fitting to the universal irony of existence that a blind man should be the instrument i don't imagine mr carlyle he added maliciously that you with your eyes would ever have brought that result about you are a very cold-blooded young scoundrel sir retorted mr carlyle good heavens do you realize that you are responsible for the death of scores of innocent men and women do you realize mr carlyle that you and your government and your soldiers are responsible for the death of thousands of innocent men and children in my country every day if england was occupied by the germans who quartered an army and an administration with their wives and their families and all their expensive paraphernalia on the unfortunate country until the whole nation was reduced to the verge of famine 
and the appointment of every new official meant the callous death sentence on a thousand men and women to pay his salary then if you went to berlin and wrecked a train you would be hailed a patriot what Bodicia did and samson so have i if they were heroes so am i well upon my word cried the highly scandalized carlyle what next Bodicia was a er semi-legendary person whom we may possibly admire at a distance personally i do not profess to express an opinion but samson i would remind you is a biblical character samson was mocked as an enemy you i do not doubt have been entertained as a friend and haven't i been mocked and despised and sneered at every day of my life here by your supercilious superior empty-headed men flashed back drishna his eyes leaping into malignity and his voice trembling with sudden passion oh how i hated them as i passed them in the street and recognized by a thousand petty insults their lordly english contempt for me as an inferior being a nigger how i longed with caligula that a nation had a single neck that i might destroy it at one blow i loathe you in your complacent hypocrisy mr carlyle despise and utterly abominate you from an eminence of superiority that you can never even understand i think we are getting rather away from the point mr drishna interposed carrados with the impartiality of a judge unless i am misinformed you are not so ungallant as to include everyone you have met here in your execration ah no admitted drishna descending into a quite ingenuous frankness much as i hate your men i love your women how is it possible that a nation should be so divided its men so dull-witted and offensive its women so quick sympathetic and capable of appreciating but a little expensive too at times suggested carrados drishna sighed heavily yes it is incredible it is the generosity of their large nature my allowance though what most of you would call noble has proved quite inadequate i was compelled to borrow money and the interest became overwhelming bankruptcy was impracticable because i should have then been recalled by my people and much as i detest england a certain reason made the thought of leaving it unbearable connected with the arcady theatre you know well do not let us introduce the lady's name in order to restore myself i speculated on the stock exchange my credit was good through my father's position and the standing of the firm to which i am attached i heard on reliable authority and very early that the central and suburban and the deferred especially was safe to fall heavily through a motor bus amalgamation that was then a secret i opened a bear account and sold largely the shares fell but only fractionately and i waited then unfortunately they began to go up adverse forces were at work and rumours were put about i could not stand the settlement and in order to carry over an account i was literally compelled to deal temporarily with some securities that were not technically my property embezzlement sir commented mr carlyle icily but what is embezzlement on top of wholesale murder that is what it is called in my case however it was only to be temporary unfortunately the rise continued then at the height of my despair i chanced to be returning to swanstead rather earlier than usual one evening and the train was stopped at a certain signal to let another pass there was conversation in the carriage and i learned certain details one said that there would be an accident some day and so forth in a flash as by an inspiration i saw how the circumstance might be turned to account a bad accident and the shares would certainly fall and my position would be retrieved i think mr carrados has somehow learned the rest max said mr carlyle with emotion is there any reason why you should not send your man for a police officer and have this monster arrested on his own confession without further delay pray do so mr carrados acquiesced drishna i shall certainly be hanged but the speech i shall prepare will ring from one end of india to the other my memory will be venerated as that of a martyr and the emancipation of my motherland will be hastened by my sacrifice in other words commented carrados there will be disturbances at half a dozen disaffected places a few unfortunate police will be clubbed to death and possibly worse things may happen that does not suit us mr drishna and how do you propose to prevent it asked drishna with cool assurance it is very unpleasant being hanged on a dark winter morning very cold very friendless very inhuman the long trial the solitude and the confinement 
the thoughts of the long sleepless night before the hangman and the pinioning and the noosing of the rope are apt to prey on the imagination only a very stupid man can take hanging easily what do you want me to do instead mr carrados asked drishna shrewdly carrados's hand closed on the weapon that still lay on the table between them without a word he pushed it across i see commented drishna with a short laugh and a gleaming eye ha huh. shoot myself and hush it up to suit your purpose withhold my message to save the exposures of a trial and keep the flame from the torch of insurrectionary freedom also interposed carrados mildly to save your worthy people a good deal of shame and to save the lady who is nameless the unpleasant necessity of relinquishing the house and the income which you have just settled on her she certainly would not then venerate your memory what is that the transaction which you carried through was based on a felony and could not be upheld the firm you dealt with will go to the courts and the money being directly traceable will be held forfeit as no good consideration passed max cried mr carlyle hotly you are not going to let this scoundrel cheat the gallows after all the best use you can make of the gallows is to cheat it lewis replied carrados have you ever reflected what human beings will think of us a hundred years hence oh of course i'm not really in favour of hanging admitted mr carlyle nobody really is but we go on hanging mr drishna is a dangerous animal who for the sake of pacific animals must cease to exist let his barbarous exploit pass into oblivion with him the disadvantages of spreading it broadcast immeasurably outweigh the benefits i have considered announced drishna i will do as you wish very well said carrados here is some plain note paper you had better write a letter to someone saying that the financial difficulties in which you are involved make life unbearable there are no financial difficulties now that does not matter in the least it will be put down to an hallucination and taken as showing the state of your mind well what guarantee have we that he will not escape whispered mr carlyle he cannot escape replied carrados tranquilly his identity is too clear i have no intention of trying to escape put in drishna as he wrote you hardly imagine that i have not considered this eventuality do you all the same murmured the ex-lawyer i should like to have a jury behind me it is one thing to execute a man morally it is another to do it almost literally is that all right asked drishna passing across the letter he had written carrados smiled at this tribute to his perception quite excellent he replied courteously there is a train at nine forty will that suit you drishna nodded and stood up mr carlyle had a very uneasy feeling that he ought to do something but could not suggest to himself what the next moment he heard his friend heartily thanking the visitor for the assistance he had been in the matter of the indo-scythian inscription as they walked across the hall together then a door closed i believe that there is something positively uncanny about max at times murmured the perturbed gentleman to himself End of section two. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Section three of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. THE TRAGEDY AT BROOKBEND COTTAGE Max, said Mr. Carlyle, when Parkinson had closed the door behind him, this is Lieutenant Hollier, whom you consented to see. To hear, corrected Carrados, smiling straight into the healthy and rather embarrassed face of the stranger before him. Mr. Hollier knows of my disability? Mr. Carlyle told me, said the young man but as a matter of fact i had heard of you before mr carrados from one of our men it was in connection with the foundering of the ivan saratov carrados wagged his head in good-humoured resignation and the owners were sworn to inviolable secrecy he exclaimed well it is inevitable i suppose not another scuttling case mr hollyer no mine is quite a private matter replied the lieutenant my sister mrs creek but mr carlyle would tell you better than i can he knows all about it 
no no carlyle is a professional let me have it in the rough mr hollyer my ears are my eyes you know very well sir i can tell you what there is to tell right enough but i feel that when all's said and done it must sound very little to another although it seems important enough to me we have occasionally found trifles of significance ourselves said carrados encouragingly don't let that deter you this was the essence of lieutenant hollyer's narrative i have a sister millicent who is married to a man called creek she is about twenty-eight now and he is at least fifteen years older neither my mother who has since died nor i cared very much about creek we had nothing particular against him except perhaps the moderate disparity of age but none of us appeared to have anything in common he was a dark taciturn man and his moody silence froze up conversation as a result of course we didn't see much of each other this you must understand was four or five years ago max interposed mr carlyle officiously carrados maintained an uncompromising silence mr carlyle blew his nose and contrived to impart a hurt significance into the operation then lieutenant hollyer continued millicent married creek after a very short engagement it was a frightfully subdued wedding more like a funeral to me the man professed to have no relations and apparently he had scarcely any friends or business acquaintances he was an agent for something or other and had an office off holborn i suppose he made a living out of it then although we knew practically nothing of his private affairs but i gather that it has been going down since and i suspect that for the past few years they have been getting along almost entirely on millicent's little income you would like the particulars of that please assented carrados when our father died about seven years ago he left three thousand pounds it was invested in canadian stock and brought in a little over a hundred a year by his will my mother was to have the income of that for life and on her death it was to pass to millicent subject to the payment of a lump sum of five hundred pounds to me but my father privately suggested to me that if i should have no particular use for the money at the time he would propose my letting millicent have the income of it until i did want it as she would not be particularly well off you see mr carrados a great deal more had been spent on my education and advancement than on her i had my pay and of course i could look out for myself better than a girl could quite so agreed carrados therefore i did nothing about that continued the lieutenant three years ago i was over again but i did not see much of them they were living in lodgings that was the only time since the marriage that i have seen them until last week in the meanwhile our mother had died and millicent had been receiving her income she wrote me several letters at the time otherwise we did not correspond much but about a year ago she sent me their new address brookbend cottage mulling common a house that they had taken when i got two months leave i invited myself there as a matter of course fully expecting to stay most of my time with them but i made an excuse to get away after a week the place was dismal and unendurable the whole life and atmosphere indescribably depressing he looked round with an instinct of caution leaned forward earnestly and dropped his voice mr carrados it is my absolute conviction that creek is only waiting for a favourable opportunity to murder millicent go on said carrados quietly a week of the depressing surroundings of brookbend cottage would not alone convince you of that mr hollyer i am not so sure declared hollyer doubtfully there was a feeling of suspicion and before me polite hatred that would have gone a good way towards it all the same there was something more definite millicent told me this the day after i went there there is no doubt that a few months ago creek deliberately planned to poison her with some weed killer she told me the circumstances in a rather distressed moment but afterwards she refused to speak of it again even weakly denied it and as a matter of fact it was with the greatest difficulty that i could get her at any time to talk about her husband or his affairs the gist of it was that she had the strongest suspicion that creek doctored a bottle of stout which he expected she would drink for her supper when she was alone the weed killer properly labelled but also in a beer bottle was kept with other miscellaneous liquids in the same cupboard as the beer but on a high shelf when he found that it had miscarried he poured away the mixture washed out the bottle and put in the dregs from another 
there is no doubt in my mind that if he had come back and found millicent dead or dying he would have contrived it to appear that she had made a mistake in the dark and drunk some of the poison before she found out yes assented carrados the open way the safe way you must understand that they live in a very small style mr carrados and millicent is almost entirely in the man's power the only servant they have is a woman who comes in for a few hours every day the house is lonely and secluded creek is sometimes away for days and nights at a time and millicent either through pride or indifference seems to have dropped off all her old friends and to have made no others he might poison her bury the body in the garden and be a thousand miles away before anyone began to inquire about her what am i to do mr carrados he is less likely to try to poison than some other means now pondered carrados that having failed his wife will always be on her guard he may know or at least suspect that others know no the common-sense precaution would be for your sister to leave the man mr hollyer she will not no admitted hollyer she will not i at once urged that the young man struggled with some hesitation for a moment and then blurted out the fact is mr carrados i don't understand millicent she is not the girl she was she hates creek and treats him with a silent contempt that eats into their lives like acid and yet she is so jealous of him that she will let nothing short of death part them it is a horrible life they lead i stood it for a week and i must say much as i dislike my brother-in-law that he has something to put up with if only he got into a passion like a man and killed her it wouldn't be altogether incomprehensible that does not concern us said carrados in a game of this kind one has to take sides and we have taken ours it remains for us to see that our side wins you mentioned jealousy mr hollyer have you any idea whether mrs creake has real ground for it i should have told you that replied lieutenant hollyer i happened to strike up with a newspaper man whose office is in the same block as creake's when i mentioned the name he grinned creake he said oh he's the man with the romantic typist isn't he well he's my brother-in-law i replied what about the typist then the chap shut up like a knife no no he said i didn't know he was married i don't want to get mixed up in anything of that sort i only said that he had a typist well what of that so have we so has everyone there was nothing more to be got out of him but the remark and the grin meant well about as usual mr carrados carrados turned to his friend i suppose you know all about the typist by now lewis we have had her under efficient observation max replied mr carlyle with severe dignity is she unmarried yes so far as ordinary repute goes she is that is all that is essential for the moment mr hollyer opens up three excellent reasons why this man might wish to dispose of his wife if we accept the suggestion of poisoning though we have only a jealous woman's suspicion for it we add to the wish the determination well we will go forward on that have you got a photograph of mr creek the lieutenant took out his pocket-book mr carlyle asked me for one here is the best i could get carrados rang the bell this parkinson he said when the man appeared is a photograph of a uh, mr what first name by the way austin put in hollyer who was following everything with a boyish mixture of excitement and subdued importance of a mr austin creek i may require you to recognize him parkinson glanced at the print and returned it to his master's hand may i inquire if it is a recent photograph of the gentleman sir he asked about six years ago said the lieutenant taking in this new actor in the drama with frank curiosity but he is very little changed thank you sir i will endeavour to remember mr creake sir lieutenant hollyer stood up as parkinson left the room the interview seemed to be at an end oh there's one other matter he remarked i am afraid that i did rather an unfortunate thing while i was at brookbend it seemed to me that as all millicent's money would probably pass into creake's hands sooner or later i might as well have my five hundred pounds if only to help her with afterwards so i broached the subject and said that i should like to have it now as i had an opportunity for investing and you think it may possibly influence creek to act sooner than he otherwise might have done he may have got possession of the principal even and find it awkward to replace it so much the better if your sister is going to be murdered it may as well be done next week as next year so far as i am concerned 
excuse my brutality mr hollyer but this is simply a case to me and i regard it strategically now mr carlyle's organization can look after mrs creek for a few weeks but it cannot look after her forever by increasing the immediate risk we diminish the permanent risk i see agreed hollyer i'm awfully uneasy but i'm entirely in your hands then we will give mr creek every inducement and every opportunity to get to work where are you staying now just now with some friends at st albans that is too far the inscrutable eyes retained their tranquil depth but a new quality of quickening interest in the voice made mr carlyle forget the weight and burden of his ruffled dignity give me a few minutes please the cigarettes are behind you mr hollyer the blind man walked to the window and seemed to look out over the cypress-shaded lawn the lieutenant lit a cigarette and mr carlyle picked up punch then carrados turned round again you are prepared to put your own arrangements aside he demanded of his visitor certainly very well i want you to go down now straight from here to brookbend cottage tell your sister that your leave is unexpectedly cut short and that you sail to-morrow the martian no no the martian doesn't sail look up the movements on your way there and pick out a boat that does say you are transferred add that you expect to be away only two or three months and that you really want the five hundred pounds by the time of your return don't stay in the house long please i understand sir st albans is too far make your excuse and get away from there to-day put up somewhere in town where you will be in reach of the telephone let mr carlyle and myself know where you are keep out of creek's way i don't want actually to tie you down to the house but we may require your services we will let you know at the first sign of anything doing and if there is nothing to be done we must release you i don't mind that is there nothing more that i can do now nothing in going to mr carlyle you have done the best thing possible you have put your sister into the care of the shrewdest man in london whereat the object of this quite unexpected eulogy found himself becoming covered with modest confusion well max remarked carlyle tentatively when they were alone well lewis of course it wasn't worth while rubbing it in before young hollyer but as a matter of fact every single man carries the life of any other man only one mind you in his hands do what you will provided he doesn't bungle acquiesced carrados quite so and also that he is absolutely reckless of the consequences of course two rather large provisos creek is obviously susceptible to both have you seen him no as i told you i put a man on to report his habits in town then two days ago as the case seemed to promise some interest for he certainly is deeply involved with the typist max and the thing might take a sensational turn any time i went down to mulling common myself although the house is lonely it is on the electric tram route you know the sort of market garden rurality that about a dozen miles out of london offers alternate bricks and cabbages it was easy enough to get to know about creek locally he mixes with no one there goes into town at irregular times but generally every day and is reputed to be devilish hard to get money out of finally i made the acquaintance of an old fellow who used to do a day's gardening at brookbend occasionally he has a cottage and a garden of his own with a greenhouse and the business cost me the price of a pound of tomatoes was it a profitable investment as tomatoes yes as information no the old fellow had the fatal disadvantage from our point of view of labouring under a grievance a few weeks ago creek told him that he would not require him again as he was going to do his own gardening in the future that is something lewis if only creek was going to poison his wife with hyoscyamine and bury her instead of blowing her up with a dynamite cartridge and claiming that it came in among the coal true true still however the chatty old soul had a simple explanation for everything that creek did creek was mad he had even seen him flying a kite in his garden where it was bound to get wrecked among the trees a lad of ten would have known better he declared and certainly the kite did get wrecked for i saw it hanging over the road myself but that a sane man should spend his time playing with a toy was beyond him a good many men have been flying kites of various kinds lately said carrados is he interested in aviation i dare say 
he appears to have some knowledge of scientific subjects now what do you want me to do max will you do it implicitly subject to the usual reservations keep your man on creek in town and let me have his reports after you have seen them lunch with me here to-morrow phone up to your office that you are detained on unpleasant business and then give the deserving parkinson an afternoon off by looking after me while we take a motor run round mulling common if we have time we might go on to brighton feed at the ship and come back in the cool amiable and thrice lucky mortal sighed mr carlyle his glance wandering round the room but as it happened brighton did not figure in that day's itinerary it had been carrados's intention merely to pass brookbend cottage on this occasion relying on his highly developed faculties aided by mr carlyle's description to inform him of the surroundings a hundred yards before they reached the house he had given an order to his chauffeur to drop into the lowest speed and they were leisurely drawing past when a discovery by mr carlyle modified their plans by jupiter that man suddenly exclaimed there's a board up max the place is to be let carrados picked up the tube again a couple of sentences passed and the car stopped by the roadside a score of paces past the limit of the garden mr carlyle took out his notebook and wrote down the address of a firm of house agents you might raise the bonnet and have a look at the engines harris said carrados we want to be occupied here for a few minutes this is sudden hollyer knew nothing of their leaving remarked mr carlyle probably not for three months yet all the same lewis we will go on to the agents and get a card to view whether we use it to-day or not a thick hedge in its summer dress effectively screening the house beyond from public view lay between the garden and the road above the hedge showed an occasional shrub at the corner nearest to the car a chestnut flourished the wooden gate once white which they had passed was grimed and rickety the road itself was still the unpretentious country lane that the advent of the electric car had found it when carrados had taken in these details there seemed little else to notice he was on the point of giving harris the order to go on when his ear caught a trivial sound someone is coming out of the house lewis he warned his friend it may be hollyer but he ought to have gone by this time i don't hear anyone replied the other but as he spoke a door banged noisily and mr carlyle slipped into another seat and ensconced himself behind the copy of the globe creek himself he whispered across the car as a man appeared at the gate hollyer was right he has hardly changed waiting for a car i suppose but a car very soon swung past them from the direction in which mr creek was looking and it did not interest him for a minute or two longer he continued to look expectantly along the road then he walked slowly up the drive back to the house we will give him five or ten minutes decided carrados harris is behaving very naturally before even the shorter period had run out they were repaid a telegraph boy cycled leisurely along the road and leaving his machine at the gate went up to the cottage evidently there was no reply for in less than a minute he was trundling past them back again round the bend an approaching tram clanged its bell noisily and quickened by the warning sound mr creek again appeared this time with a small portmanteau in his hand with a backward glance he hurried on towards the next stopping place and boarding the car as it slackened down he was carried out of their knowledge very convenient of mr creek remarked carrados with quiet satisfaction we will now get the order and go over the house in his absence it might be useful to have a look at the wire as well it might max acquiesced mr carlyle a little dryly but if it is as it probably is in creek's pocket how do you propose to get it by going to the post office lewis quite so have you ever tried to see a copy of a telegram addressed to someone else i don't think i have ever had occasion yet admitted carrados have you in one or two cases i have perhaps been an accessory to the act it is generally a matter either of extreme delicacy or considerable expenditure then for hollyer's sake we will hope for the former here and mr carlyle smiled darkly and hinted that he was content to wait for a friendly revenge a little later having left the car at the beginning of the straggling high street the two men called at the village post-office 
they had already visited the house agent and obtained an order to view brookbend cottage declining with some difficulty the clerk's persistent offer to accompany them the reason was soon forthcoming as a matter of fact explained the young man the present tenant is under our notice to leave unsatisfactory eh said carrados encouragingly he's a corker admitted the clerk responding to the friendly tone fifteen months and not a doit of rent have we had that's why i should have liked we will make every allowance replied carrados the post office occupied one side of a stationer's shop it was not without some inward trepidation that mr carlyle found himself committed to the adventure carrados on the other hand was the personification of bland unconcern you have just sent a telegram to brookbend cottage he said to the young lady behind the brasswork lattice we think it may have come in accurately and should like a repeat he took out his purse what is the fee the request was evidently not a common one oh said the girl uncertainly wait a minute please she turned a pile of telegram duplicates behind the desk and ran a doubtful finger along the upper sheets i think this is all right you want it repeated please just a tinge of questioning surprise gave the point to the courteous tone it will be fourpence if there is an error the amount will be refunded carrados put down a coin and received his change will it take long he inquired carelessly as he pulled on his glove you will most likely get it within a quarter of an hour she replied now you've done it commented mr carlyle as they walked back to the car how do you propose to get that telegram max ask for it was the laconic explanation and stripping the artifice of any elaboration he simply asked for it and got it the car posted at a convenient bend in the road gave him a warning note as the telegraph boy approached then carrados took up a convincing attitude with his hand on the gate while mr carlyle lent himself to the semblance of a departing friend that was the inevitable impression when the boy rode up creek brookbend cottage inquired carrados holding out his hand and without a second thought the boy gave him the envelope and rode away on the assurance that there would be no reply some day my friend remarked mr carlyle looking nervously towards the unseen house your ingenuity will get you into a tight corner then my ingenuity must get me out again was the retort let us have our view now the telegram can wait an untidy workwoman took their order and left them standing at the door presently a lady whom they both knew to be mrs creake appeared you wish to see over the house she said in a voice that was utterly devoid of any interest then without waiting for a reply she turned to the nearest door and threw it open this is the drawing-room she said standing aside they walked into a sparsely furnished damp-smelling room and made a pretense of looking around while mrs creake remained silent and aloof the dining-room she continued crossing the narrow hall and opening another door mr carlyle ventured a genial commonplace in the hope of inducing conversation the result was not encouraging doubtless they would have gone through the house under the same frigid guidance had not carrados been at fault in a way that mr carlyle had never known him fail before in crossing the hall he stumbled over a mat and almost fell pardon my clumsiness he said to the lady i am unfortunately quite blind but he added with a smile to turn off the mishap even a blind man must have a house the man who had eyes was surprised to see a flood of color rush into mrs creake's face blind she exclaimed oh i beg your pardon why did you not tell me you might have fallen i generally manage fairly well he replied but of course in a strange house she put her hand on his arm very lightly you must let me guide you just a little she said the house without being large was full of passages and inconvenient turnings carrados asked an occasional question and found mrs creake quite amiable without effusion mr carlyle followed them from room to room in the hope though scarcely the expectation of learning something that might be useful this is the last one it is the largest bedroom said their guide only two of the upper rooms were fully furnished and mr carlyle at once saw as carrados knew without seeing that this was the one which the creeks occupied a very pleasant outlook declared mr carlyle oh i suppose so admitted the lady vaguely the room in fact looked over the leafy garden and the road beyond 
it had a french window opening on to a small balcony and to this under the strange influence that always attracted him to light carrados walked i expect there is a certain amount of repair needed he said after standing there a moment i'm afraid there would be she confessed i ask because there is a sheet of metal on the floor here he continued now that in an old house spells dry rot to the wary observer my husband said the rain which comes in a little under the window was rotting the boards there she replied he put that down recently i had not noticed anything myself it was the first time she had mentioned her husband mr carlyle pricked up his ears ah that is a less serious matter said carrados may i step out on the balcony oh yes if you like to then as he appeared to be fumbling at the catch let me open it for you but the window was already open and carrados facing the various points of the compass took in the bearings a sunny sheltered corner he remarked an ideal spot for a deck chair and a book she shrugged her shoulders half contemptuously i dare say she replied but i never use it sometimes surely he persisted mildly it would be my favourite retreat but then i was going to say that i had never been out on it but that would not be quite true it has two uses for me both equally romantic i occasionally shake a duster from it and when my husband returns late without his latch-key he wakes me up and i come out here and drop him mine further revelation of mr creake's nocturnal habits was cut off greatly to mr carlyle's annoyance by a cough of unmistakable significance from the foot of the stairs they had heard a trade cart drive up to the gate a knock at the door and the heavy-footed woman tramp along the hall excuse me a minute please said mrs creake lewis said carrados in a sharp whisper the moment they were alone stand against the door with extreme plausibility mr carlyle began to admire a picture so situated that while he was there it was impossible to open the door more than a few inches from that position he observed his confederate go through the curious procedure of kneeling down on the bedroom floor and for a full minute pressing his ear to the sheet of metal that had already engaged his attention then he rose to his feet nodded dusted his trousers and mr carlyle moved to a less equivocal position what a beautiful rose-tree grows up your balcony remarked carrados stepping into the room as mrs creake returned i suppose you are very fond of gardening i detest it she replied but this glory so carefully trained is it she replied i think my husband was nailing it up recently by some strange fatality carrados's most aimless remarks seemed to involve the absent mr creake do you care to see the garden the garden proved to be extensive and neglected behind the house was chiefly orchard in front some semblance of order had been kept up here it was lawn and shrubbery and the drive they had walked along two things interested carrados the soil at the foot of the balcony which he declared on examination to be particularly suitable for roses and the fine chestnut tree in the corner by the road as they walked back to the car mr carlyle lamented that they had learned so little of creake's movements perhaps the telegram will tell us something suggested carrados read it lewis mr carlyle cut open the envelope glanced at the enclosure and in spite of his disappointment could not restrain a chuckle my poor max he explained you have put yourself to an amount of ingenious trouble for nothing creake is evidently taking a few days holiday and prudently availed himself of the meteorological office forecast before going listen immediate prospect for london warm and settled further outlook cooler but fine well well i did get a pound of tomatoes for my fourpence you certainly scored there lewis admitted carrados with humorous appreciation i wonder he added speculatively whether it is creake's particular taste usually to spend his weekend holiday in london eh exclaimed mr carlyle looking at the words again by gad that's rum max they go to weston super mare why on earth should he want to know about london i can make a guess but before we are satisfied i must come here again take another look at that kite lewis are there a few yards of string hanging loose from it yes there are rather thick string unusually thick for the purpose yes but how do you know 
as they drove home again carrados explained and mr carlyle sat aghast saying incredulously good god max is it possible an hour later he was satisfied that it was possible in reply to his inquiry someone in his office telephoned him the information that they had left paddington by the four thirty for weston it was more than a week after his introduction to carrados that lieutenant hollyer had a summons to present himself at the turrets again he found mr carlyle already there and the two friends awaiting his arrival i stayed in all day after hearing from you this morning mr carrados he said shaking hands when i got your second message i was all ready to walk straight out of the house that's how i did it in the time i hope everything is all right excellent replied carrados you'd better have something before we start we probably have a long and perhaps an exciting night before us and certainly a wet one assented the lieutenant it was thundering over mulling way as i came along that is why you are here said his host we are waiting for a certain message before we start and in the meantime you may as well understand what we expect to happen as you saw there is a thunderstorm coming on the meteorological office morning forecast predicted for the whole of london if the conditions remain that was why i kept you in readiness within an hour it is now inevitable that we shall experience a deluge here and there damage will be done to trees and buildings here and there a person will probably be struck and killed yes it is mr creake's intention that his wife should be among the victims i don't exactly follow said hollyer looking from one man to the other i quite admit that creake would be immensely relieved if such a thing did happen but the chance is surely an absurdly remote one yet unless we intervene it is precisely what a coroner's jury will decide has happened do you know whether your brother-in-law has any practical knowledge of electricity mr hollyer i cannot say he was so reserved and we really knew so little of him yet in eighteen ninety six an austin creek contributed an article on alternating currents to the american scientific world that would argue a fairly intimate acquaintanceship but do you mean that he is going to direct a flash of lightning only to the minds of the doctor who conducts the post-mortem and the coroner this storm the opportunity for which he has been waiting for weeks is merely the cloak to his act the weapon which he has planned to use scarcely less powerful than lightning but much more tractable is the high voltage current of electricity that flows along the tram wire at his gate oh exclaimed lieutenant hollyer as the sudden revelation struck him some time between eleven o'clock to-night about the hour when your sister goes to bed and one thirty in the morning the time up to which he can rely on the current creake will throw a stone up at the balcony window most of his preparation has long been made it only remains for him to connect up a short length to the window handle and a longer one at the other end to tap the live wire that done he will wake his wife in the way i have said the moment she moves the catch of the window and he has carefully filed its parts to ensure perfect contact she will be electrocuted as effectually as if she sat in the executioner's chair in sing sing prison but what are we doing here exclaimed hollyer starting to his feet pale and horrified it is past ten now and anything may happen quite natural mr hollyer said carrados reassuringly but you need have no anxiety creak is being watched and your sister is as safe as if she slept to-night in windsor castle be assured that whatever happens he will not be allowed to complete his scheme but it is desirable to let him implicate himself to the fullest limit your brother-in-law mr hollyer is a man with a peculiar capacity for taking pains he is a damned cold-blooded scoundrel exclaimed the young officer fiercely when i think of millicent five years ago well for that matter an enlightened nation has decided that electrocution is the most humane way of removing its superfluous citizens suggested carrados mildly he is certainly an ingenious-minded gentleman it is his misfortune that in mr carlyle he was fated to be opposed by an even subtler brain no no really max protested the embarrassed gentleman mr hollyer will be able to judge for himself when i tell him that it was mr carlyle who first drew attention to the significance of the abandoned kite insisted carrados firmly then of course its object became plain to me as indeed to anyone for ten minutes perhaps a wire must be carried from the overhead line to the chestnut tree 
Creake has everything in his favor, but it is just within possibility that the driver of an inopportune tram might notice the appendage. What of that? Why, for more than a week he has seen a derelict kite with its yards of trailing string hanging in the tree. A very calculating mind, Mr. Hollyer. It would be interesting to know what line of action Mr. Creake has mapped out for himself afterwards. I expect he has half a dozen artistic little touches up his sleeve. Possibly he would merely singe his wife's hair, burn her feet with a red-hot poker, shiver the glass of the French window, and be content with that to let well enough alone. You see, lightning is so varied in its effects that whatever he did or did not do would be right. He is in the impregnable position of the body showing all the symptoms of death by lightning shock, and nothing else but lightning to account for it a dilated eye, heart contracted in systole, bloodless lungs shrunk to a third of their normal weight, and all the rest of it. When he has removed a few outward traces of his work, Creek might quite safely discover his dead wife and rush off for the nearest doctor, or he may have decided to arrange a convincing alibi and creep away, leaving the discovery to another. We shall never know. He will make no confession. I wish it was well over, admitted Hollyer. I'm not particularly jumpy, but this gives me a touch of the creeps. Three more hours at the worst, Lieutenant, said Carrados cheerfully. Aha, something is coming through now. He went to the telephone and received a message from another quarter, then made another connection and talked for a few minutes with someone else. Everything working smoothly, he remarked between times over his shoulder. Your sister has gone to bed, Mr. Hollyer. Then he turned to the house telephone and distributed his orders so we he concluded must get up by the time they were ready a large closed motor-car was waiting the lieutenant thought he recognized parkinson in the well-swathed form beside the driver but there was no temptation to linger for a second on the steps already the stinging rain had lashed the drive into the semblance of a frothy estuary all round the lightning jagged its course through the incessant tremulous glow of more distant lightning while the thunder only ceased its muttering to turn at close quarters and crackle viciously one of the few things i regret missing remarked carrados tranquilly but i hear a good deal of colour in it the car slushed its way down to the gate lurched a little heavily across the dip into the road and steadying as it came upon the straight began to hum contentedly along the deserted highway we are not going direct suddenly inquired hollyer after they had travelled perhaps half a dozen miles the night was bewildering enough but he had the sailor's gift for location no through hunscott green and then by a field path to the orchard at the back replied carrados keep a sharp lookout for the man with the lantern about here harris he called through the tube something flashed just ahead sir came the reply and the car slowed down and stopped Carrados dropped the near window as a man glistening in waterproof stepped from the shelter of a leech gate and approached. Inspector Beadle, sir, said the stranger, looking into the car. Quite right, Inspector. Get in. I have a man with me, sir. We can find room for him as well. We are very wet. So shall we all be soon. The lieutenant changed his seat, and the two burly forms took places side by side. In less than a minute the car stopped again, this time in a grassy country lane. "'Now we have to face it,' announced Carrados. "'The inspector will show us the way.' The car slid round and disappeared into the night, while Beadle led the party to a stile in the hedge. A couple of fields brought them to the Brookbend boundary. There a figure stood out of the black foliage, exchanged a few words with their guide, and piloted them along the shadows of the orchard to the back door of the house.' you will find a broken pane near the catch of the scullery window said the blind man right sir replied the inspector i have it now who goes through mr hollyer will open the door for us i'm afraid you must take off your boots and all wet things lieutenant we cannot risk a single spot inside they waited until the back door opened then each one divested himself in a similar manner and passed into the kitchen where the remains of a fire still burned the man from the orchard gathered together the discarded garments and disappeared again. Carrados turned to the lieutenant. A rather delicate job for you now, Mr. Hollyer. I want you to go up to your sister, wake her, and get her into another room with as little fuss as possible. Tell her as much as you think fit, and let her understand that her very life depends on absolute stillness when she is alone. 
don't be unduly hurried but not a glimmer of light please ten minutes passed by the measure of the battered old alarm on the dresser shelf before the young man returned i've had rather a time of it he reported with a nervous laugh but i think it will be all right now she is in the spare room then we will take our places you and parkinson come with me to the bedroom inspector you have your own arrangements mr carlyle will be with you they dispersed silently about the house hollyer glanced apprehensively at the door of the spare room as they passed it but within was as quiet as the grave their room lay at the other end of the passage you may as well take your place in the bed now hollyer directed carrados when they were inside and the door closed keep well down among the clothes creake has to get up on the balcony you know and he will probably peep through the window but he dare come no farther then when he begins to throw up stones slip on this dressing gown of your sister's i'll tell you what to do after the next sixty minutes drew out to the longest hour that the lieutenant had ever known occasionally he heard a whisper pass between the two men who stood behind the window curtains but he could see nothing then carrados threw a guarded remark in his direction he is in the garden now something scraped slightly against the outer wall but the night was full of wilder sounds and in the house the furniture and the boards creaked and sprung between the yawling of the wind among the chimneys the rattle of the thunder and the pelting of the rain it was a time to quicken the steadiest pulse and when the crucial moment came when a pebble suddenly rang against the pane with a sound that the tense waiting magnified into a shivering crash hollyer leapt from the bed on the instant easy easy warned carrados feelingly we will wait for another knock he passed something across here is a rubber glove i have cut the wire but you had better put it on stand just for a moment at the window move the catch so that it can blow open a little and drop immediately now another stone had rattled against the glass for hollyer to go through his part was the work of merely seconds and with a few touches carrados spread the dressing gown to more effective disguise about the extended form but an unforeseen and in the circumstances rather horrible interval followed for creek in accordance with some detail of his never revealed plan continued to shower missile after missile against the panes until even the unimpressionable parkinson shivered the last act whispered carrados a moment after the throwing had ceased he has gone round to the back keep as you are we take cover now he pressed behind the arras of an extemporized wardrobe and the spirit of emptiness and desolation seemed once more to reign over the lonely house from half a dozen places of concealment ears were straining to catch the first guiding sound he moved very stealthily burdened perhaps by some strange scruple in the presence of the tragedy he had not feared to contrive paused for a moment at the bedroom door then opened it very quietly and in the fickle light read the consummation of his hopes at last they heard the sharp whisper drawn from his relief at last he took another step and two shadows seemed to fall upon him from behind one on either side with primitive instinct a cry of terror and surprise escaped him as he made a desperate movement to wrench himself free and for a short second he almost succeeded in dragging one hand into a pocket then his wrists slowly came together and the handcuffs closed i am inspector beadle said the man on his right side you are charged with the attempted murder of your wife millicent creek you are mad retorted the miserable creature falling into a desperate calmness she has been struck by lightning no you blackguard she hasn't wrathfully exclaimed his brother-in-law jumping up would you like to see her i also warn you continued the inspector impassively that anything you say may be used as evidence against you a startled cry from the farther end of the passage arrested their attention mr carrados called hollyer oh come at once at the open door of the other bedroom stood the lieutenant his eyes still turned towards something in the room beyond a little empty bottle in his hand dead he exclaimed tragically with a sob with this beside her dead just when she would have been free of the brute the blind man passed into the room sniffed the air and laid a gentle hand on the pulseless heart yes he replied that hollyer does not always appeal to the woman strange to say end of section three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com
Section four of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. The Clever Mrs. Straithwaite. Mr. Carlyle had arrived at the turrets in the very best possible spirits. Everything about him, from his immaculate white spats to the choice gardenia in his buttonhole, from the brisk decision with which he took the front door steps to the bustling importance with which he had positively brushed parkinson aside at the door of the library proclaimed consequence and the extremely good terms on which he stood with himself prepare yourself max he exclaimed if i hinted at a case of exceptional delicacy that will certainly interest you by its romantic possibilities i should have the liveliest misgivings ten to one it would be a jewel mystery hazarded carrados as his friend paused with the point of his communication withheld after the manner of a quizzical youngster with a promised bonbon held behind his back if you made any more of it i should reluctantly be forced to the conclusion that the case involved a society scandal connected with a priceless pearl necklace mr carlyle's face fell then it is in the papers after all he said with an air of disappointment what is in the papers lewis some hint of the fraudulent insurance of the honourable mrs straithwaite's pearl necklace replied carlyle possibly admitted carrados but so far i have not come across it mr carlyle stared at his friend and marching up to the table brought his hand down on it with an arresting slap then what in the name of goodness are you talking about may i ask he demanded caustically if you know nothing of the straithwaite affair max what other pearl necklace case are you referring to carrados assumed the air of mild deprecation with which he frequently apologized for a blind man venturing to make a discovery a philosopher once made the remark had it anything to do with mrs straithwaite's the honourable mrs straithwaite's pearl necklace and let me warn you max that i have read a good deal both of mill and spencer at odd times it was neither mill nor spencer he had a german name so i will not mention it he made the observation which of course we recognize as an obvious commonplace when once it has been expressed that in order to have an accurate knowledge of what a man will do on any occasion it is only necessary to study a single characteristic action of his utterly impracticable declared mr carlyle i therefore knew that when you spoke of a case of exceptional interest to me what you really meant lewis was a case of exceptional interest to you mr carlyle's sudden thoughtful silence seemed to admit that possibly there might be something in the point by applying almost unconsciously the same useful rule i became aware that a mystery connected with a valuable pearl necklace and a beautiful young society belle would appeal the most strongly to your romantic imagination romantic i romantic thirty-five and a private inquiry agent you are positively feverish max incurably romantic or you would have got over it by now the worst kind max this may prove a most important and interesting case will you be serious and discuss it jewel cases are rarely either important or interesting pearl necklace mysteries in nine cases out of ten spring from the miasma of social pretense and vapid competition and only concern people who do not matter in the least the only attractive thing about them is the name they are so barren of originality that a criminological linnaeus could classify them with absolute nicety i'll tell you what we'll draw up a set of tables giving the solution to every possible pearl necklace case for the next twenty-one years we will do any mortal thing you like max if you will allow parkinson to administer a bromo seltzer and then enable me to meet the officials of the direct insurance without a blush for three minutes carrados picked his unerring way among the furniture as he paced the room silently but with irresolution in his face twice his hand went to a paper-covered book lying on his desk and twice he left it untouched have you ever been in the lion house at feeding time lewis he demanded abruptly in the very remote past possibly admitted mr carlyle guardedly as the hour approaches it is impossible to interest the creatures with any other suggestion than that of raw meat you came a day too late lewis he picked up the book and skimmed it adroitly into mr carlyle's hands 
i have already scented the gore and tasted in imagination the joy of tearing choice morsels from other similarly obsessed animals catalogue de monnaies grecs et romaines read the gentleman to be sold by auction at the hotel drouet paris salle eight april the twenty fourth twenty fifth etc hmm he turned to the plates of photogravure illustration which gave an air to the volume this is an event i suppose it is the sort of dispersal we get about once in three years replied carrados i seldom attend little sales but i save up and then have a week's orgy and when do you go to-day by the afternoon boat folkestone i have already taken rooms at mascots i'm sorry it has fallen so inopportunely louis mr carlyle rose to the occasion with a display of extremely gentlemanly feeling which had the added merit of being quite genuine my dear chap your regrets only serve to remind me how much i owe to you already bon voyage and the most desirable of a you uh, well perhaps it would be safer to say of kimons for your collection i suppose pondered carrados this insurance business might have led to other profitable connections that is quite true admitted his friend i have been trying for some time but do not think any more of it max what time is it demanded carrados suddenly eleven twenty five good has any officious idiot had anyone arrested no it is only never mind do you know much of the case practically nothing as yet unfortunately i came excellent everything is on our side lewis i won't go this afternoon i will put off till the night boat from dover that will give us nine hours nine hours repeated the mystified carlyle scarcely daring to put into thought the scandalous inference that carrados's words conveyed nine full hours a pearl necklace case that cannot at least be left straight after nine hours work will require a column to itself in our chart now lewis where does this direct insurance live carlyle had allowed his blind friend to persuade him into as they had seemed at the beginning many mad enterprises but none had ever in the light of his own experience seemed so foredoomed to failure as when at eleven thirty carrados ordered his luggage to be on the platform of charing cross station at eight fifty and then turned light-heartedly to the task of elucidating the mystery of mrs straithwaite's pearl necklace in the interval the head office of the direct and intermediate insurance company proved to be in victoria street thanks to carrados's speediest car they entered the building as the clocks of westminster were striking twelve but for the next twenty minutes they were consigned to the general office while mr carlyle fumed and displayed his watch ostentatiously at last the clerk slid off his stool by the speaking-tube and approached them mr carlyle he said the general manager will see you now but as he has another appointment in ten minutes he will be glad if you will make your business as short as possible this way please mr carlyle bit his lip at the pompous formality of the message but he was too experienced to waste any words about it and with a mere nod he followed guiding his friend until they reached the manager's room but though subservient to circumstance he was far from being negligible when he wished to create an impression mr carrados has been good enough to give us a consultation over this small affair he said with just the necessary touches of deference and condescension that it was impossible either to miss or resent unfortunately he can do little more as he has to leave almost at once to direct an important case in paris the general manager conveyed little either in his person or his manner of the brisk precision that his message seemed to promise the name of carrados struck him as being somewhat familiar something a little removed from the routine of his business and a matter therefore that he could unbend over he continued to stand comfortably before his office fire making up by a tolerant benignity of his hard and bulbous eye for the physical deprivation that his attitude entailed on his visitors paris egad he grunted something in your line that france can take from us since the days of uh, what's his name vidocq eh clever fellow that what wasn't it about him and the purloined letter carrados smiled discreetly capital wasn't it he replied but there is something else that paris can learn from london more in your way sir often when i drop in to see the principal of one of their chief houses or the head of a government department we fall into an entertaining discussion of this or that subject that may be on the tapis ah monsieur i say after perhaps half an hour's conversation 
it is very amiable of you and sometimes i regret our insular methods but is it not thus that great businesses are formed at home if i call upon one of our princes of industry a railway director a merchant or the head of one of our leading insurance companies nothing will tempt him for a moment from the stern outline of the business in hand you are too complacent the merest gossip takes advantage of you that is quite true admitted the general manager occupying the revolving chair at his desk and assuming a serious and very determined expression slackers i call them now mr carlyle where are we in this business i have your letter of yesterday we should naturally like all the particulars you can give us the manager threw open a formidable-looking volume with an immense display of energy sharply flattened some typewritten pages that had ventured to raise their heads and lifted an impressive finger we start here the twenty seventh of january on that day carlsfield the princess street jeweller you know who acted as our jewelry assessor forwards a proposal of the honourable mrs straithwaite to insure a pearl necklace against theft says that he has had an opportunity of examining it and passes it at five thousand pounds that business goes through in the ordinary way the premium is paid and the policy taken out a couple of months later carsfield has a little unpleasantness with us and resigns resignation accepted we have nothing against him you understand at the same time there is an impression among the directors that he has been perhaps a little too easy in his ways a little too let us say expansive in some of his valuations and too accommodating to his own clients in recommending to us business of a well speculative basis business that we do not care about and which we now feel is foreign to our traditions as a firm however the general manager threw apart his stubby hands as though he would shatter any fabric of criminal intention that he might be supposed to be insidiously constructing that is the extent of our animadversion against carsfield there are no irregularities and you may take it from me that the man is all right you would propose accepting the fact that a five thousand pound necklace was submitted to him suggested mr carlyle i should acquiesced the manager with a weighty nod still this brings us to april the third this break so to speak occurring in our routine it seemed a good opportunity for us to assure ourselves on one or two points mr bellitzer you know bellitzer of course no of him i should say was appointed vice carsfield and we wrote to certain of our clients asking them as our policies entitled us to do as a matter of form to allow mr bellitzer to confirm the assessment of his predecessor wrapped it up in silver paper of course said it would certify the present value and be a guarantee that would save them some formalities in case of ensuing claim and so on among others wrote to the honourable mrs straithwaite to that effect april fourth here is her reply of three days later sorry to disappoint us but the necklace has just been sent to her bank for custody as she is on the point of leaving town also scarcely sees that it is necessary in her case as the insurance was only taken so recently that is dated april the seventh inquired mr carlyle busy with pencil and pocket-book april seventh repeated the manager noting this conscientiousness with an approving glance and then turning to regard questioningly the indifferent attitude of his other visitor that put us on our guard naturally wrote by return regretting the necessity and suggesting that a line to her bankers authorizing them to show us the necklace would meet the case and save her any personal trouble interval of a week her reply april sixteenth thursday last circumstances have altered her plans and she has returned to london sooner than she expected her jewel case has been returned from the bank and will we send our man round our man mr carlyle on saturday morning not later than twelve please the manager closed the record book with a sweep of his hand cleared his desk for revelations and leaning forward in his chair fixed mr carlyle with a pragmatic eye on saturday mr bellitzer goes to lundberg mansions and the honourable mrs straithwaite shows him the necklace he examines it carefully assesses its insurable value up to five thousand two hundred and fifty pounds and reports us to that effect but he reports something else mr carlyle it is not the necklace that the lady had insured not the necklace echoed mr carlyle no in spite of the number of pearls and general similarity there are certain technical differences well known to experts 
that made the fact indisputable the honourable mrs straithwaite has been guilty of misrepresentation possibly she has no fraudulent intention we are willing to pay to find out that's your business mr carlyle made a final note and put away his book with an air of decision that could not fail to inspire confidence to-morrow he said we shall perhaps be able to report something hope so vouchsafed the manager morning from his position near the window carrados appeared to wake up to the fact that the interview was over but so far he remarked blandly with his eyes towards the great man in the chair you have told us nothing of the theft the manager regarded the speaker dumbly for a moment and then turned to mr carlyle what does he mean he demanded pungently but for once mr carlyle's self-possession had forsaken him he recognized that somehow carrados had been guilty of an appalling lapse by which his reputation for prescience was wrecked in that quarter for ever and at the catastrophe his very ears began to exude embarrassment in the awkward silence carrados himself seemed to recognize that something was amiss we appear to be at cross purposes he observed i inferred that the disappearance of the necklace would be the essence of our investigation have i said a word about it disappearing demanded the manager with a contempt-laden rosity that he made no pretence of softening you don't seem to have grasped the simple facts about the case mr carrados really i hardly think oh come in there had been a knock at the door then another a clerk now entered with an open telegram mr longworth wished you to see this at once sir we may as well go whispered mr carlyle with polite depression to his colleague here wait a minute said the manager who had been biting his thumbnail over the telegram no not you to the lingering clerk you clear much of the embarrassment that had troubled mr carlyle a minute before seemed to have got into the manager's system i don't understand this he confessed awkwardly it's from bellitzer he wires have just heard alleged robbery straithwaite pearls advise strictest investigation mr carlyle suddenly found it necessary to turn to the wall and consult a highly coloured lithographic inducement to ensure mr carrados alone remained to meet the manager's constrained glance still he tells us really nothing about the theft he remarked sociably no admitted the manager experiencing some little difficulty with his breathing he does not well we still hope to be able to report something to-morrow good-bye it was with an effort that mr carlyle straightened himself sufficiently to take leave of the manager several times in the corridor he stopped to wipe his eyes max you unholy fraud he said when they were outside you knew all the time no i told you that i knew nothing of it replied carrados frankly i am absolutely sincere and all i can say is that i see a good many things happen that i don't believe in carrados's reply was to hold out a coin to a passing newsboy and to hand the purchase to his friend who was already in the car there is a slang injunction to keep your eyes skinned that being out of my power i habitually keep my ears skinned you would be surprised to know how very little you hear lewis and how much you miss in the last five minutes up there i have had three different newsboys accounts of this development by jupiter she hasn't waited long exclaimed mr carlyle referring eagerly to the headlines pearl necklace sensation society ladies five thousand pound trinket disappears things are moving where next max it is now a quarter to one replied carrados touching the fingers of his watch we may as well lunch on the strength of this new turn parkinson will have finished packing i can telephone him to come to us at merrick's in case i require him buy all the papers lewis and we will collate the points the undoubted facts that survived a comparison were few and meagre for in each case a conscientious journalist had touched up a few vague or doubtful details according to his own ideas of probability all agreed that on tuesday evening it was now thursday mrs straithwaite had formed one of a party that had occupied a box at the new metropolitan opera house to witness the performance of la Buccella, and that she had been robbed of a set of pearls valued in round figures at five thousand pounds their agreement ended one version represented the theft as taking place at the theatre another asserted that at the last moment the lady had decided not to wear the necklace that evening and that its abstraction had been cleverly effected from the flat during her absence into a third account came an ambiguous reference to markham's the well-known jewellers and a conjecture that their loss would certainly be covered by insurance 
mr carlyle who had been picking out the salient points of the narratives threw down the last paper with an impatient shrug why in heaven's name have we markhams coming into it now he demanded what have they to lose by it max what do you make of the thing there is the second genuine string the one bellitzer saw that belongs to someone by gad that's true only five days ago too but what does our lady stand to make by that being stolen carrados was staring into obscurity between an occasional moment of attention to his cigarette or coffee by this time the lady probably stands to wish she was well out of it he replied thoughtfully once you have set this sort of stone rolling and it has got beyond you he shook his head it has become more intricate than you expected suggested carlyle in order to afford his friend an opportunity of withdrawing carrados pierced the intention and smiled affectionately my dear lewis he said one-fifth of the mystery is already solved one-fifth how do you arrive at that because it is one twenty-five and we started at eleven thirty he nodded to their waiter who was standing three tables away and paid the bill then with perfect gravity he permitted mr carlyle to lead him by the arm into the street where their car was waiting parkinson already there in attendance sure i can be of no further use asked carlyle carrados had previously indicated that after lunch he would go on alone but because he was largely sceptical of the outcome the professional man felt guiltily that he was deserting say the word carrados smiled and shook his head then he leaned across i am going to the opera house now then possibly to talk to markham a little if i have time i must find a man who knows the straithwaites and after that i may look up inspector beadle if he is at the yard that is as far as i can see yet until i call at Loonberg mansions come round on the third anyway dear old chap murmured mr carlyle as the car edged its way ahead among the traffic marvellous shots he makes in the meantime at Loonberg mansions mrs straithwaite had been passing anything but a pleasant day she had awakened with a headache and an overnight feeling that there was some unpleasantness to be gone on with that it did not amount to actual fear was due to the enormous self-importance and the incredible ignorance which ruled the butterfly brain of the young society beauty for in spite of three years experience of married life stephanie straithwaite was as yet on the enviable side of two and twenty anticipating an early visit from a particularly obnoxious sister-in-law she had remained in bed until after lunch in order to be able to deny herself with the more conviction three journalists who would have afforded her the mild excitement of being interviewed had called and been in turn put off with polite regrets by her husband the objectionable sister-in-law postponed her visit until the afternoon and for more than an hour stephanie suffered agonies when the visitor had left and the martyred hostess announced her intention of flying immediately to the consoling society of her own bridge circle straithwaite had advised her with some significance to wait for a lead the unhappy lady cast herself bodily down upon a couch and asked whether she was to become a nun straithwaite merely shrugged his shoulders and remembered a club engagement evidently there was no need for him to become a monk stephanie followed him down the hall arguing and protesting that was how they came jointly to encounter carrados at the door i have come from the direct insurance in the hope of being able to see mrs straithwaite he explained when the door opened rather suddenly before he had knocked my name is carrados max carrados there was a moment of hesitation all round then stephanie read difficulties in the strengthening lines of her husband's face and rose joyfully to the occasion oh yes come in mr carrados she exclaimed graciously we are not quite strangers you know you found out something for aunt pigs i forget what but she was most frantically impressed lady poses enlarged straithwaite who had stepped aside and was watching the development with slow calculating eyes but i say you aren't blind are you carrados smiling admission turned the edge of mrs straithwaite's impulsive teddy but i get along all right he added i left my man down in the car and i found your door first shot you see the references reminded the velvet-eyed little mercenary that the man before her had the reputation of being desirably rich his queer taste merely an eccentric hobby the consideration made her resolve to be quite her nicest possible as she led the way to the drawing-room then teddy too had been horrid beyond words and must be made to suffer in the readiest way that offered teddy is just going out and i was to be left in solitary bereavement 
if you had not appeared she explained airily it wasn't very comfy only to come see me on business by the way mr carrados but if those are your only terms i must agree straithwaite however did not seem to have the least intention of going he had left his hat and stick in the hall and he now threw his yellow gloves down on a table and took up a negligent position on the arm of an easy chair the thing is where do we stand he remarked tentatively that is the attitude of the insurance company i imagine replied carrados i don't see that the company has any standing in the matter we haven't reported any loss to them and we are not making any claims so far that ought to be enough i assume that they act on general inference explained carrados a limited liability company is not subtle mrs straithwaite this one knows that you have insured a five thousand pound pearl necklace with it and when it becomes a matter of common knowledge that you have had one answering to that description stolen it jumps to the conclusion that they are one and the same but they aren't worse luck explained the hostess this was a string that i let markham send me to see if i would keep the one that bellitzer saw last saturday yes admitted mrs straithwaite quite simply straithwaite glanced sharply at carrados and then turned his eyes with lazy indifference to his wife my dear stephanie what are you thinking of he drawled of course those could not have been the markham's pearls not knowing that you are much too clever to do such a foolish thing mr carrados will begin to think that you have had fraudulent designs upon his company whether the tone was designed to exasperate or merely fell upon a fertile soil stephanie threw a hateful little glance in his direction i don't care she exclaimed recklessly i haven't the least little objection in the world to mr carrados knowing exactly how it happened carrados put in an instinctive word of warning even raised an arresting hand but the lady was much too excited too voluble to be denied it doesn't really matter in the least mr carrados because nothing came of it she explained there never were any real pearls to be insured it would have made no difference to the company because i did not regard this as an ordinary insurance from the first it was to be a loan a loan repeated carrados yes i shall come into heaps and heaps of money in a few years time under prin prin's will then i should pay back whatever had been advanced but would it not have been better simpler to have borrowed purely on the anticipation we have explained the lady eagerly we have borrowed from all sorts of people and both teddy and i have signed heaps and heaps of papers until now no one will lend any more the thing was too tragically grotesque to be laughed at carrados turned his face from one to the other and by ear and by even finer perceptions he focused them in his mind the delicate feather-headed beauty with the heart of a cat and the irresponsibility of a kitten eye and mouth already hardening under the stress of her frantic life and across the room her debonair consort whose lank pose and nonchalant attitude towards the situation carrados had not yet categorized straithwaite's dry voice with its habitual drawl broke into his reflection i don't suppose for a moment that you either know or care what this means my dear girl but i will proceed to enlighten you it means the extreme probability that unless you can persuade mr carrados to hold his tongue you and without prejudice i also will get two years hard and yet with unconscious but consummate artistry it seems to me that you have perhaps done the trick for unless i am mistaken mr carrados will find himself unable to take advantage of your guileless confidence whereas he would otherwise have quite easily found out all he wanted this is the most utter nonsense teddy cried stephanie with petulant indignation she turned to carrados with the assurance of meeting understanding we know mr justice enderley very well indeed and if there was any bother i should not have the least difficulty in getting him to take the case privately and in explaining everything to him but why should there be why indeed a brilliant little new idea possessed her do you know any of these insurance people at all intimately mr carrados the general manager and i are on terms that almost justify us in addressing each other as silly ass admitted carrados there you see teddy you needn't have been in a funk mr carrados would put everything right let me tell you exactly how i had arranged it i dare say you know that insurances are only too pleased to pay for losses it gives them an advertisement freddy tantroy told me so and his father is a director of hundreds of companies only of course it must be done quite regularly well for months and months we had both been most frightfully hard up and unfortunately everyone else at least all our friends seemed to be just as stony 
i had been absolutely racking my poor brain for an idea when i remembered papa's wedding present it was a string of pearls that he sent me from vienna only a month before he died not real of course because poor papa was always quite utterly on the verge himself but very good imitation and in perfect taste otherwise i am sure papa would rather have sent a silver pen wiper for although he had to live abroad because of what people said his taste was simply exquisite and he was most romantic in his ideas what do you say teddy nothing dear it was only my throat ticking i wore the pearls often and millions of people had seen them of course our own people knew about them but others took it for granted that they were genuine for me to be wearing them teddy will tell you that i was almost babbling in delirium things were becoming so ghastly when an idea occurred tweedy she's a cousin of teddy's but quite an aged person has a whole coffer of jewels that she never wears and i knew that there was a necklace very like mine among them she was going almost immediately to africa for some shooting so i literally flew into the wilds of surrey and begged her on my knees to lend me her pearls for the leicester house dance when i got back with them i stamped on the clasp and took it at once to carsfield and princess street i told him they were only paste but i thought they were rather good and i wanted them by the next day and of course he looked at them and then looked again and then asked me if i was certain they were imitation and i said well we had never thought twice about it because poor papa was always rather chronic only certainly he did occasionally have fabulous streaks at the tables and finally like a great owl carsfield said i am happy to be able to congratulate you ma'am they are undoubtedly bombay pearls of very fine orient they are certainly worth five thousand pounds from this point mrs straithwaite's narrative ran its slangy obvious course the insurance affected on the strict understanding of the lady with herself that it was merely a novel form of loan and after satisfying her mind on freddie tantroy's authority that the direct and intermediate could stand a temporary loss of five thousand pounds the genuine pearls were returned to the cousin in the wilds of surrey and stephanie continued to wear the counterfeit a decent interval was allowed to intervene and the plot was on the point of maturity when the company's request for a scrutiny fell like a thunderbolt with many touching appeals to mr carrados to picture her frantic distraction with appropriate little gestures of agony and despair stephanie described her absolute prostration her subsequent wild scramble through the jewel stocks of london to find a substitute the danger over it became increasingly necessary to act without delay not only to anticipate possible further curiosity on the part of the insurance but in order to secure the means with which to meet an impending obligation held over them by an inflexibly obdurate hebrew the evening of the previous tuesday was to be the time the opera house during the performance of la Puccella, the place straithwaite who was not interested in that precise form of drama would not be expected to be present but with a false moustache and a few other touches which his experience as an amateur placed within his easy reach he was to occupy a stall an end stall somewhere beneath his wife's box at an agreed signal stephanie would jerk open the catch of the necklace and as she leaned forward the ornament would trickle off her neck and disappear into the arena beneath straithwaite the only one prepared for anything happening would have no difficulty in securing it he would look up quickly as if to identify the box and with the jewels in his hand walk deliberately out into the passage before anyone had quite realized what was happening he would have left the house carrados turned his face from the woman to the man this scheme commended itself to you mr straithwaite well you see stephanie is so awfully clever that i took it for granted that the thing would go all right and three days before bellitzer had already reported misrepresentation and that two necklaces had been used yes admitted straithwaite with an air of reluctant candour i had a suspicion that stephanie's native ingenuity rather fizzled there you know stephanie dear there is a difference it seems between bombay and californian pearls the wretch exclaimed the girl grinding her little teeth vengefully and we gave him champagne but nothing came of it so it doesn't matter prompted straithwaite except that now markham's pearls have gone and they are hinting at all manner of diabolical things she wrathfully reminded him true he confessed that is by way of a sequel mr carrados i will endeavour to explain that part of the incident for even yet stephanie seems unable to do me justice he detached himself from the arm of the chair and lounged across the room to another chair where he took up exactly the same position 
on the fatal evening i duly made my way to the theatre a little late so as to take my seat unobserved after i had got the general hang i glanced up occasionally until i caught stephanie's eye by which i knew that she was there all right and concluded that everything was going along quite jollily according to arrangement i was to cross the theatre immediately the first curtain fell and standing opposite stephanie's box twist my watch chain until it was certain that she had seen me then stephanie was to fan herself three times with her programme both you will see perfectly innocent operations and yet conveying to each other the intimation that all was well stephanie's idea of course after that i would return to my seat and stephanie would do her part at the first opportunity in act two however we never reached that towards the end of the first act something white and noiseless slipped down and fell at my feet for the moment i thought they were the pearls gone wrong then i saw that it was a glove a lady's glove intuition whispered that it was stephanie's before i touched it i picked it up and quietly got out down among the fingers was a scrap of paper the corner torn off a program on it were penciled words to this effect something quite unexpected can do nothing to-night go back at once and wait may return early frightfully worried s you kept the paper of course yes it is in my desk in the next room do you care to see it please straithwaite left the room and stephanie flung herself into a charming attitude of entreaty mr carrados you will get them back for us won't you it would not really matter only i seem to have signed something and now markham's threatened to bring an action against us for culpable negligence in leaving them in an empty flat you see explained straithwaite coming back in time to catch the drift of his wife's words except to a personal friend like yourself it is quite impossible to submit these clues the first one alone would raise embarrassing inquiries the other is beyond explanation consequently i have been obliged to concoct an imaginary burglary in our absence and to drop the necklace case among the rhododendrons in the garden at the back for the police to find deeper and deeper commented carrados why yes stephanie and i are finding that out aren't we dear however here is the note also the glove of course i returned immediately it was stephanie's strategy and i was under her orders in something less than half an hour i heard a motor-car stop outside then the bell here rang i think it might have been that i was alone i went to the door and found a man who might have been anything standing there he merely said mr straithwaite and on my nodding handed me a letter i tore it open in the hall and read it then i went into my room and read it again this is it dear t absolutely ghastly we simply must put off to-night we'll explain that later now what do you think bellitzer is here in the stalls and young k d has asked him to join us at supper at the savoy it appears that the creature is something and i suppose the d's want to borrow off him i can't get out of it and i am literally quaking don't you see he will spot something send me the m string at once and i will change somehow before supper i am scribbling this in the dark i have got the willoughby's man to take it don't don't fail s it is ridiculous preposterous snapped stephanie i never wrote a word of it or the other there was i sitting the whole evening and teddy oh it is maddening i took it into my room and looked at it closely continued the unruffled straithwaite even if i had any reason to doubt the internal evidence was convincing but how could i doubt it it read like a continuation of the previous message the writing was reasonably like stephanie's under the circumstances the envelope had obviously been obtained from the box office of the theatre and the paper itself was a sheet of the programme a corner was torn off i put against it the previous scrap and they exactly fitted the gentleman shrugged his shoulders stretched his legs with deliberation and walked across the room to look out of the window i made them up into a neat little parcel and handed it over he concluded carrados put down the two pieces of paper which he had been minutely examining with his fingertips and still holding the glove addressed his small audience collectively the first and most obvious point is that whoever carried out the scheme had more than a vague knowledge of your affairs not only in general but also relating to this well loan mrs straithwaite just what i have insisted agreed straithwaite you hear that stephanie but who is there pleaded stephanie with weary intonation absolutely no one in the wide world not a soul so one is liable to think offhand let us go further however merely accounting for those who are in a position to have information there are the officials of the insurance company who suspect something 
there is bellitzer who perhaps knows a little more there is the lady in surrey from whom the pearls were borrowed a mr tantroy who seems to have been consulted and finally your own servants all these people have friends or underlings or observers suppose mr bellitzer's confidential clerk happens to be the sweetheart of your maid they would still know very little the arc of a circle may be very little but given that it is possible to construct the entire figure now your servants mrs straithwaite we are accusing no one of course there is the cook mullins she displayed alarming influenza on tuesday morning and although it was most frightfully inconvenient i packed her off home without a moment's delay i have a horror of the influ then fraser the parlour-maid she does my hair i haven't really got a maid you know peter prompted straithwaite oh yes beta she's a daily girl and helps in the kitchen i have no doubt she is capable of any villainy and all were out on tuesday evening yes mullins gone home beta left early as there was no dinner and i told fraser to take the evening after she had dressed me so that teddy could make up and get out without being seen carrados turned to his other witness the papers and the glove have been with you ever since yes in my desk locked yes and this glove mrs straithwaite there is no doubt that it is yours i suppose not she replied i never thought i know that when i came to leave the theatre one had vanished and teddy had it here that was the first time you missed it yes but it might have gone earlier in the evening mislaid or lost or stolen i remember taking them off in the box i sat in the corner farthest from the stage the front row of course and i placed them on the support where any one in the next box could abstract one without much difficulty at a favourable moment that is quite likely but we didn't see any one in the next box i have half an idea that i caught sight of someone hanging back volunteered straithwaite thank you said carrados turning towards him almost gratefully that is most important that you think you saw someone hanging back now the other glove mrs straithwaite what became of that an odd glove is not very much good is it said stephanie certainly i wore it coming back i think i threw it down somewhere in here probably it is still about we are in a frantic muddle and nothing is being done the second glove was found on the floor in a corner carrados received it and laid it with the other you use a very faint and characteristic scent i noticed mrs straithwaite he observed yes it is rather sweet isn't it i don't know the name because it is in russian a friend in the embassy sent me some bottles from petersburg but on tuesday you supplemented it with something stronger he continued raising the gloves delicately one after the other to his face oh eucalyptus rather she admitted i simply drenched my handkerchief with it you have other gloves of the same pattern have i now let me think did you give them to me teddy no replied straithwaite from the other end of the room he had lounged across to the window and his attitude detached him from the discussion didn't whitestable he added shortly of course then there are three pairs mr carrados because i never let bimby lose more than that to me at once poor boy i think you are rather tiring yourself out stephanie warned her husband carrados's attention seemed to leap to the voice then he turned courteously to his hostess i appreciate that you have had a trying time lately mrs straithwaite he said every moment i have been hoping to let you out of the witness box perhaps to-morrow began straithwaite recrossing the room impossible i leave town to-night replied carrados firmly you have three pairs of these gloves mrs straithwaite here is one the other two one pair i have not worn yet the other good gracious i haven't been out since tuesday i suppose it is in my glove box i must see it please straithwaite opened his mouth but as his wife obediently rose to her feet to comply he turned sharply away with the word unspoken these are they she said returning mr carrados and i will finish our investigation in my room interposed straithwaite with quiet assertiveness i should advise you to lie down for half an hour stephanie if you don't want to be a nervous wreck to-morrow you must allow the culprit to endorse that good advice mrs straithwaite added carrados he had been examining the second pair of gloves as they spoke and he now handed them back again they are undoubtedly of the same set he admitted with extinguished interest and so our clue runs out i hope you don't mind apologized straithwaite as he led his guest to his own smoking-room 
stephanie he confided becoming more cordial as two doors separated them from the lady is a creature of nerves and indiscretions she forgets to-night she will not sleep to-morrow she will suffer carrados divined the grin so shall i on the contrary pray accept my regrets said the visitor besides he continued there is nothing more for me to do here i suppose it is a mystery admitted straithwaite with polite agreement will you try a cigarette thanks can you see if my car is below they exchanged cigarettes and stood at the window lighting them there is one point by the way that may have some significance carrados had begun to recross the room and stopped to pick up the two fictitious messages you will have noticed that this is the outside sheet of a program it is not the most suitable for the purpose the first inner sheet is more convenient to write on but there the date appears you see the inference the program was obtained before perhaps well for carrados had broken off abruptly and was listening you hear someone coming up the steps it is the general stairway mr straithwaite i don't know how far this has gone in other quarters we may only have a few seconds before we are interrupted what do you mean i mean that the man who is now on the stairs is a policeman or has worn the uniform if he stops at your door the heavy tread ceased then came the authoritative knock wait muttered carrados laying his hand impressively on straithwaite's tremulous arm i may recognize the voice they heard the servant pass along the hall and the door unlatched then caught the jumble of a gruff inquiry inspector beadle of scotland yard the servant repassed their door on her way to the drawing-room it is no good disguising the fact from you mr straithwaite that you may no longer be at liberty but i am is there anything you wish done there was no time for deliberation straithwaite was indeed between the unenviable alternatives of the familiar proverb but to do him justice his voice had lost scarcely a ripple of its usual sang-froid thanks he replied taking a small stamped and addressed parcel from his pocket you might drop this into some obscure pillar-box if you will the markham necklace exactly i was going out to post it when you came i am sure you were and if you could spare five minutes later if i am here carrados slid his cigarette case under some papers on the desk i will call for that he assented let us say about half past eight i am still at large you see mr carrados though after reflecting on the studied formality of the inspector's business here i imagine that you will scarcely be surprised i have made it a habit admitted carrados never to be surprised however i still want to cut rather a different figure in your eyes you regard me mr carrados either as a detected rogue or a repentant ass another excellent rule is never to form deductions from uncertainties straithwaite made a gesture of mild impatience you only give me ten minutes if i am to put my case before you mr carrados we cannot fence with phrases to-day you have had an exceptional opportunity of penetrating into our mode of life you will i do not doubt have summed up our perpetual indebtedness and the easy credit that our connection procures stephanie's social ambitions and expensive popularity her utterly extravagant incapacity to see any other possible existence and my tacit acquiescence you will i know have correctly gauged her irresponsible neurotic temperament and judged the result of it in conflict with my own what possibly has escaped you for in society one has to disguise these things is that i still love my wife when you dare not trust the soundness of your reins you do not try to pull up a bolting horse for three years i have endeavoured to guide stephanie round awkward corners with as little visible restraint as possible when we differ over any project upon which she has set her heart stephanie has one strong argument that you no longer love her well perhaps but more forcibly expressed she rushes to the top of the building there are six floors mr carrados and we are on the second and climbing on to the banister she announces her intention of throwing herself down into the basement in the meanwhile i have followed her and drag her back again one day i shall stay where i am and let her do as she intends i hope not said carrados gravely oh don't be concerned she will then climb back herself but it will mark an epoch it was by that threat that she obtained my acquiescence to this scheme that and the certainty that she would otherwise go on without me but i had no intention of allowing her to land herself to say nothing of us both behind the bars of a prison if i could help it 
and above all i wish to cure her of her fatuous delusion that she is clever and the hope that she may then give up being foolish to fail her on the occasion was merely to postpone the attempt i conceived the idea of seeming to cooperate and at the same time involving us in what appeared to be a clever counterfraud the thought of the real loss will perhaps have a good effect the publicity will certainly prevent her from daring a second theft a sordid story mr carrados he concluded do not forget your cigarette case in reality the paternal shake of carrados's head over the recital was neutralized by his benevolent smile yes yes he said i think we can classify you mr straithwaite one point the glove that was an afterthought i had arranged the whole story and the first note was to be brought to me by an attendant then on my way in my overcoat pocket i discovered a pair of stephanie's gloves which she had asked me to carry the day before the suggestion flashed how much more convincing if i could arrange for her to seem to drop the writing in that way as she said the next box was empty i merely took possession of it for a few minutes and quietly drew across one of her gloves and that reminds me of course there was nothing in it but your interest in them made me rather nervous carrados laughed outright then he stood up and held out his hand good night mr straithwaite he said with real friendliness let me give you the quaker's advice don't attempt another conspiracy but if you do don't produce a pair of gloves of which one is still suggestive of scent and the other identifiable with eucalyptus oh said straithwaite quite so but at all hazard suppress a second pair that has the same peculiarity think over what it must mean good-bye twelve minutes later mr carlyle was called to the telephone it is eight fifty five and i am at charing cross said a voice he knew if you want local colour contrive an excuse to be with markham when the first post arrives to-morrow a few more words followed in an affectionate valediction one moment my dear max one moment do i understand you to say that you will post me on the report of the case from dover no lewis replied carrados with cryptic discrimination i only said that i will post you on a report of the case from dover end of section four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 5 of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. The Last Exploit of Harry the Actor. The one insignificant fact upon which turned the following incident in the joint experiences of Mr. Carlyle and Max Carrados was merely this that having called upon his friend just at the moment when the private detective was on the point of leaving his office to go to the safe deposit in lucas street piccadilly the blind amateur accompanied him and for ten minutes amused himself by sitting quite quietly among the palms in the centre of the circular hall where mr carlyle was occupied with his deed-box in one of the little compartments provided for the purpose the lucas street depository was then it has since been converted into a picture palace generally accepted as being one of the strongest places in london the front of the building was constructed to represent a gigantic safe door and under the colloquial designation of the safe the place had passed into a synonym for all that was secure and impregnable half of the marketable securities in the west of london were popularly reported to have seen the inside of its coffers at one time or another together with the same generous proportion of family jewels however exaggerated an estimate this might be the substratum of truth was solid and auriferous enough to dazzle the imagination when ordinary safes were being carried bodily away with impunity or ingeniously fused open by the scientifically equipped cracksmen nervous bondholders turned with relief to the attractions of an establishment whose modest claim was summed up in its telegraphic address impregnable to it went also the jewel case between the ladies social engagements and when in due course the family journeyed north or south east or west whenever in short the london house was closed 
its capacious storerooms received the plate chest as an established custom not a few traders also jewellers financiers dealers in pictures antiques and costly bijouterie for instance constantly used its facilities for any stock that they did not require immediately to hand there was only one entrance to the place an exaggerated keyhole to carry out the similitude of the safe door alluded to the ground floor was occupied by the ordinary offices of the company all the strong rooms and safes lay in the steel cased basement this was reached both by a lift and by a flight of steps in either case the visitor found before him a grill of massive proportions behind its bars stood a formidable commissionaire who never left his post his sole duty being to open and close the grill to arriving and departing clients beyond this a short passage led into the round central hall where carrados was waiting from this part other passages radiated off to the vaults and strong rooms each one barred from the hall by a grill scarcely less ponderous than the first one the doors of the various private rooms put at the disposal of the company's clients and that of the manager's office filled the wall space between the radiating passages everything was very quiet everything looked very bright and everything seemed hopelessly impregnable but i wonder ran carrados's dubious reflection as he reached this point sorry to have kept you so long my dear max broke in mr carlyle's crisp voice he had emerged from his compartment and was crossing the hall deed-box in hand another minute and i will be with you carrados smiled and nodded and resumed his former expression which was merely that of an uninterested gentleman waiting patiently for another it is something of an attainment to watch closely without betraying undue curiosity but others of the senses hearing and smelling for instance can be keenly engaged while the observer possibly has the appearance of falling asleep now announced mr carlyle returning briskly to his friend's chair and drawing on his grey suede gloves you are in no particular hurry no admitted the professional man with the slowness of mild surprise not at all what do you propose it is very pleasant here replied carrados tranquilly very cool and restful with this armoured steel between us and the dust and scurry of the hot july afternoon above i propose remaining here for a few minutes longer certainly agreed mr carlyle taking the nearest chair and eyeing carrados as though he had a shrewd suspicion of something more than met the ear i believe some very interesting people rent safes here we may encounter a bishop or a winning jockey or even a musical comedy actress unfortunately it seems to be rather a slack time two men came down while you were in your cubicle remarked carrados casually the first took the lift i imagine that he was a middle-aged rather portly man he carried a stick wore a silk hat and used spectacles for close sight the other came by the stairway i infer that he arrived at the top immediately after the lift had gone he ran down the steps so that the two were admitted at the same time but the second man though the more active of the pair hung back for a moment in the passage and the portly one was the first to go to his safe mr carlyle's knowing look expressed go on my friend you are coming to something but he merely contributed an encouraging yes when you emerged just now our second man quietly opened the door of his pen a fraction doubtless he looked out then he closed it as quietly again you were not his man lewis i am grateful said mr carlyle expressively what next max that is all they are still closeted both were silent for a moment mr carlyle's feeling was one of unconfessed perplexity so far the incident was utterly trivial in his eyes but he knew that the trifles which appeared significant to max had a way of standing out like signposts when the time came to look back over an episode carrados's sightless faculties seemed indeed to keep him just a move ahead as the game progressed is there really anything in it max he asked at length who can say replied carrados at least we may wait to see them go these tin deed boxes now there is one to each safe i think yes so i imagine the practice is to carry the box to your private lair and there unlock it and do your business then you lock it up again and take it back to your safe steady our first man whispered carrados hurriedly here look at this with me he opened a paper 
a prospectus which he pulled from his pocket and they affected to study its contents together you were about right my friend muttered mr carlyle pointing to a paragraph of assumed interest hat stick and spectacles he is a clean-shaven pink-faced old boy i believe yes i know the man by sight he is a bookmaker in a large way i am told here comes the other whispered carrados the bookmaker passed across the hall joined on his way by the manager whose duty it was to counterlock the safe and disappeared along one of the passages the second man sauntered up and down waiting his turn mr carlyle reported his movements in an undertone and described him he was a younger man than the other of medium height and passably well dressed in a quiet lounge suit green alpine hat and brown shoes by the time the detective had reached his wavy chestnut hair large and rather ragged moustache and sandy freckled expression the first man had completed his business and was leaving the place it isn't an exchange lay at all events said mr carlyle his inner case is only half the size of the other and couldn't possibly be substituted come up now said carrados rising there is nothing more to be learned down here they requisitioned the lift and on the steps outside the gigantic keyhole stood for a few moments discussing an investment as a couple of trustees or a lawyer and a client who were parting there might do fifty yards away a very large silk hat with a very curly brim marked the progress of the bookmaker towards piccadilly the lift in the hall behind them swirled up again and the gate clashed the second man walked leisurely out and sauntered away without a backward glance he has gone in the opposite direction exclaimed mr carlyle rather blankly it isn't the lame goat nor the follow me on nor even the homely but efficacious sandbag what color were his eyes asked carrados upon my word i never noticed admitted the other parkinson would have noticed was the severe comment i am not parkinson retorted mr carlyle with asperity and strictly as one dear friend to another max permit me to add that while cherishing an unbounded admiration of your remarkable gifts i have the strongest suspicion that the whole incident is a ridiculous mare's nest bred in the fantastic imagination of an enthusiastic criminologist mr carrados received this outburst with the utmost benignity come and have a coffee lewis he suggested mehmed's is only a street away mehmed proved to be a cosmopolitan gentleman from mocha whose shop resembled a house from the outside and an oriental divan when one was in a turbaned arab placed cigarettes and cups of coffee spiced with saffron before the customers gave salaam and withdrew you know my dear chap continued mr carlyle sipping his black coffee and wondering privately whether it was really very good or very bad speaking quite seriously the one fishy detail our ginger friends watching for the other to leave may be open to a dozen very innocent explanations so innocent that to-morrow i intend taking a safe myself you think that everything is all right on the contrary i am convinced that something is very wrong then why i shall keep nothing there but it will give me the entree i should advise you lewis in the first place to empty your safe with all possible speed and in the second to leave your business card on the manager mr carlyle pushed his cup away convinced now that the coffee was really very bad oh my dear max the place the safe is impregnable when i was in the states three years ago the head porter at one hotel took pains to impress on me that the building was absolutely fireproof i at once had my things taken off to another hotel two weeks later the first place was burnt out it was fireproof i believe but of course the furniture and the fittings were not and the walls gave way very ingenious admitted mr carlyle but why did you really go you know you can't humbug me with your superhuman sixth sense my friend carrados smiled pleasantly thereby encouraging the watchful attendant to draw near and replenish their tiny cups perhaps replied the blind man because so many careless people were satisfied that it was fireproof aha uh -huh. there you are the greater the confidence the greater the risk but only if your self-confidence results in carelessness now do you know how this place is secured max i am told that they lock the door at night replied carrados with bland malice and hide the key under the mat to be ready for the first arrival in the morning crowed mr carlyle in the same playful spirit dear old chap well let me tell you 
that force is out of the question quite so admitted his friend that simplifies the argument let's consider fraud there again the precautions are so rigid that many people pronounce the forms a nuisance i confess that i do not i regard them as a means of protecting my own property and i cheerfully sign my name and give my password which the manager compares with his record book before he releases the first lock of my safe the signature is burned before my eyes in a sort of crucible there the password is of my own choosing and is written only on a book that no one but the manager ever sees and my key is the sole one in existence no duplicate or master key neither if a key is lost it takes a skilful mechanic half a day to cut his way in then you must remember that clients of a safe deposit are not multitudinous all are known more or less by sight to the officials there and a stranger would receive close attention now max by what combination of circumstances is a rogue to know my password to be able to forge my signature to possess himself of my key and to resemble me personally and finally how is he possibly to determine beforehand whether there is anything in my safe to repay so elaborate a plant mr carlyle concluded in triumph and was so carried away by the strength of his position that he drank off the contents of his second cup before he realized what he was doing at the hotel i just spoke of replied carrados there was an attendant whose one duty in case of alarm was to secure three iron doors on the night of the fire he had a bad attack of toothache and slipped away for just a quarter of an hour to have the thing out there was a most up-to-date system of automatic fire alarm it had been tested only the day before and the electrician finding some part not absolutely to his satisfaction had taken it away and not had time to replace it the night watchman it turned out had received leave to present himself a couple of hours later on that particular night and the hotel fireman whose duties he took over had missed being notified lastly there was a big riverside blaze at the same time and all the engines were down at the other end of the city mr carlyle committed himself to a dubious monosyllable carrados leaned forward a little all these circumstances formed a coincidence of pure chance is it not conceivable lewis that an even more remarkable series might be brought about by design our tawny friend possibly only he was not really tawny mr carlyle's easy attitude suddenly stiffened into rigid attention he wore a false moustache he wore a false moustache repeated the amazed gentleman and you cannot see no really max this is beyond the limit if only you would not trust your dear blundering old eyes so implicitly you would get nearer that limit yourself retorted carrados the man carried a five-yard aura of spirit gum emphasized by a warm perspiring skin that inevitably suggested one thing i looked for further evidence of making up and found it these preparations all smell the hair you described was characteristically that of a wig worn long to hide the joining and made wavy to minimize the length all these things are trifles as yet we have not gone beyond the initial stage of suspicion i will tell you another trifle when this man retired to a compartment with his deed box he never even opened it possibly it contains a brick and a newspaper he is only watching watching the bookmaker true but it may go far wider than that everything points to a plot of careful elaboration still if you are satisfied i am quite satisfied replied mr carlyle gallantly i regard the safe almost as a national institution and as such i have an implicit faith in its precautions against every kind of force or fraud so far mr carlyle's attitude had been suggestive of a rock but at this point he took out his watch hummed a little to pass the time consulted his watch again and continued i am afraid that there were one or two papers which i overlooked it would perhaps save me time coming again to-morrow if i went back now and quite so acquiesced carrados with perfect gravity i will wait for you for twenty minutes he sat there drinking an occasional tiny cup of boiled coffee and to all appearance placidly enjoying the quaint atmosphere which mr Mehmed had contrived to transplant from the shore of the persian gulf at the end of that period carlyle returned politely effusive about the time he had kept his friend waiting but otherwise bland and unassailable 
anyone with eyes might have noticed that he carried a parcel of about the same size and dimensions as the deed box that fitted his safe the next day carrados presented himself at the safe deposit as an intending renter the manager showed him over the vaults and strong rooms explaining the various precautions taken to render the guile or force of man impotent the strength of the chilled steel walls the casing of electricity resisting concrete the stupendous isolation of the whole inner fabric on metal pillars so that the watchman while inside the building could walk above below and all round the outer walls of what was really although it bore no actual relationship to the advertising device of the front a monstrous safe and finally the arrangement which would enable the basement to be flooded with steam within three minutes of an alarm these details were public property the safe was a showplace and its directors held that no harm could come of displaying a strong hand accompanied by the observant eyes of parkinson carrados gave an adventurous but not a hopeful attention to these particulars submitting the problem of the tawny man to his own ingenuity he was constantly putting before himself the question how shall i set about robbing this place and he had already dismissed force as impracticable nor when it came to the consideration of fraud did the simple but effective safeguards which mr carlyle had specified seem to offer any loophole as i am blind i may as well sign in the book he suggested when the manager passed him a gummed slip for the purpose the precaution against one acquiring particulars of another client might well be deemed superfluous in this case but the manager did not fall into the trap it is our invariable rule in all cases sir he replied courteously what word will you take parkinson it may be said had been left in the hall suppose i happen to forget it how do we proceed in that case i am afraid that i might have to trouble you to establish your identity the manager explained it rarely happens then we will say conspiracy the word was written down and the book closed here's your key sir if you will allow me your key ring a week went by and carrados was no nearer the absolute solution of the problem he had set himself he had indeed evolved several ways by which the contents of the safes might be reached some simple and desperate hanging on razor edge of chance to fall this way or that others more elaborate safer on the whole but more liable to break down at some point of their ingenious intricacy and setting aside complicity on the part of the manager a condition that carrados had satisfied himself did not exist they all depended on a relaxation of the forms by which security was assured carrados continued to have several occasions to visit the safe during the week and he watched with a quiet persistence that was deadly in its scope but from beginning to end there was no indication of slackness in the business-like methods of the place nor during any of his visits did the tawny man appear in that or any other disguise another week passed mr carlyle was becoming inexpressibly waggish and carrados himself although he did not abate a jot of his conviction was compelled to bend to the realities of the situation the manager with the obstinacy of a conscientious man who had become obsessed with the pervading note of security excused himself from discussing abstract methods of fraud carrados was not in a position to formulate a detailed charge he withdrew from active investigation content to await his time it came to be precise on a certain friday morning seventeen days after his first visit to the safe returning late on the thursday night he was informed that a man giving the name of draycott had called to see him apparently the matter had been of some importance to the visitor for he had returned three hours later on the chance of finding mr carrados in disappointed in this he had left a note carrados cut open the envelope and ran a finger along the following words dear sir i have to-day consulted mr lewis carlyle who thinks that you would like to see me i will call again in the morning say at nine o'clock if this is too soon or otherwise inconvenient i entreat you to leave a message fixing as early an hour as possible yours faithfully herbert draycott p s i should add that i am the renter of a safe at the lucas street depository h d a description of mr draycott made it clear that he was not the west end bookmaker the caller the servant explained was a thin wiry keen-faced man carrados felt agreeably interested in this development which seemed to justify his suspicion of a plot 
at five minutes to nine the next morning mr draycott again presented himself very good of you to see me so soon sir he apologized on carrados at once receiving him i don't know much of english ways i'm an australian and i was afraid it might be too early you could have made it a couple of hours earlier as far as i am concerned replied carrados or you either for that matter i imagine he added for i don't think that you slept much last night i didn't sleep at all last night corrected mr draycott but it's strange that you should have seen that i understand from mr carlyle that you excuse me if i am mistaken sir but i understood that you were blind carrados laughed his admission lightly oh yes he said but never mind that what is the trouble i am afraid it means more than just trouble for me mr carrados the man had steady half-closed eyes with the suggestion of depth which one notices in the eyes of those whose business it is to look out over great expanses of land or water they were turned towards mr carrados's face with quiet resignation in their frankness now i am afraid it spells disaster i am a working engineer from the mount magdalena district of coolgardy i don't want to take up your time with outside details so i will only say that about two years ago i had an opportunity of acquiring a share in a very promising claim gold you understand both reef and alluvial as the work went on i put more and more time into the undertaking you couldn't call it a venture by that time the results were good better than we had dared to expect but from one cause and another the expenses were terrible we saw that it was a bigger thing than we had bargained for and we admitted that we must get outside help so far mr draycott's narrative had proceeded smoothly enough under the influence of the quiet despair that had come over the man but at this point a sudden recollection of his position swept him into a frenzy of bitterness oh what the blazes is the good of going over all this again he broke out what can you or anyone else do anyhow i've been robbed rooked cleared out of everything i possess and tormented by recollections and by the impotence of his rage the unfortunate engineer beat the oak table with the back of his hand until his knuckles bled carrados waited until the fury had passed continue if you please mr draycott he said just what you thought it best to tell me is just what i want to know i'm sorry sir apologized the man colouring under his tanned skin i ought to be able to control myself better but this business has shaken me three times last night i looked down the barrel of my revolver and three times i threw it away well we arranged that i should come to london to interest some financiers in the property we might have done it locally or in perth to be sure but then don't you see they would have wanted to get control six weeks ago i landed here i brought with me specimens of the quartz and good samples of extracted gold dust and nuggets the clearing up of several weeks working about two hundred and forty ounces in all that includes the magdalena lodestar our lucky nugget a lump weighing just under seven pounds of pure gold i had seen an advertisement of this lucas street safe deposit and it seemed just the thing i wanted besides the gold i had all the papers to do with the claims plans reports receipts licenses and so on then when i cashed my letter of credit i had about one hundred and fifty pounds in notes of course i could have left everything at a bank but it was more convenient to have it as it were in my own safe to get at any time and to have a private room that i could take any gentleman to i hadn't a suspicion that anything could be wrong negotiations hung on in several quarters it's a bad time to do business here i find then yesterday i wanted something i went to lucas street as i had done half a dozen times before opened my safe and had the inner case carried to a room mr carrados it was empty quite empty no he laughed bitterly at the bottom was a sheet of wrapper paper i recognized it as a piece i had left there in case i wanted to make up a parcel but for that i should have been convinced that i had somehow opened the wrong safe that was my first idea it cannot be done so i understand sir and then there was the paper with my name written on it in the empty tin i was dazed it seemed impossible i think i stood there without moving for minutes it was more like hours then i closed the tin box again took it back locked up the safe and came out without notifying anything wrong yes mr carrados the steady blue eyes regarded him with pained thoughtfulness you see i reckoned it out in that time that it must be someone about the place who had done it 
you were wrong said carrados so mr carlyle seemed to think i only knew that the key had never been out of my possession and i had told no one of the password well it did come over me rather like cold water down the neck that there was i alone in the strongest dungeon in london and not a living soul knew where i was probably a sort of up-to-date sweeney todd's i'd heard of such things in london admitted draycott anyway i got out it was a mistake i see it now who is to believe me as it is it sounds a sort of unlikely tale and how do they come to pick on me to know what i had i don't drink or open my mouth or hell around it beats me they didn't pick on you you picked on them replied carrados never mind now you'll be believed all right but as for getting anything back the unfinished sentence confirmed mr draycott in his gloomiest anticipations i have the numbers of the notes he suggested with an attempt at hopefulness they can be stopped i take it stopped yes admitted carrados the banks and the police stations will be notified and every little public house between here and land's end will change one for the scribbling of john jones across the back no mr draycott it's awkward i dare say but you must make up your mind to wait until you can get fresh supplies from home where are you staying draycott hesitated i have been at the abbotsford in bloomsbury up to now he said with some embarrassment the fact is mr carrados i think i ought to have told you how i was placed before consulting you because i i see no prospect of being able to pay my way knowing that i had plenty in the safe i had run it rather close i went chiefly yesterday to get some notes i have a week's hotel bill in my pocket and he glanced down at his trousers i've ordered one or two other things unfortunately that will be a matter of time doubtless suggested the other encouragingly instead of replying draycott suddenly dropped his arms onto the table and buried his face between them a minute passed in silence and it's no good mr carrados he said when he was able to speak i can't meet it say what you like i simply can't tell those chaps that i've lost everything we had and ask them to send me more they couldn't do it if i did understand sir the mine is a valuable one we have the greatest faith in it but it has gone beyond our depth the three of us have put everything we own into it while i am here they are doing laborers work for a wage just to keep going waiting oh my god waiting for good news from me carrados walked round the table to his desk and wrote then without a word he held out a paper to his visitor what's this demanded draycott in bewilderment it's it's a cheque for a hundred pounds it will carry you on explained carrados imperturbably a man like you isn't going to throw up the sponge for this setback cable to your partners that you require copies of all the papers at once they'll manage it never fear the gold must go write fully by the next mail tell them everything and add that in spite of all you feel that you are nearer success than ever mr draycott folded the check with thoughtful deliberation and put it carefully away in his pocket-book i don't know whether you've guessed as much sir he said in a queer voice but i think that you've saved a man's life to-day it's not the money it's the encouragement and faith if you could see you'd know better than i can say how i feel about it carrados laughed quietly it always amused him to have people explain how much more he would learn if he had eyes then we'll go on to lucas street and give the manager the shock of his life was all he said come mr draycott i have already rung up the car but as it happened another instrument had been destined to apply that stimulating experience to the manager as they stepped out of the car opposite the safe a taxicab drew up and mr carlyle's alert and cheery voice hailed them a moment max he called turning to settle with his driver a transaction that he invested with an air of dignified urbanity which almost made up for any small pecuniary disappointment that may have accompanied it this is indeed fortunate let us compare notes for a moment i have just received an almost imploring message from the manager to come at once i assumed that it was the affair of our colonial friend here but he went on to mention professor homefast bulge can it really be possible that he also has made a similar discovery what did the manager say asked carrados he was practically incoherent but i really think it must be so what have you done nothing replied carrados he turned his back on the safe and appeared to be regarding the other side of the street there is a tobacconist's shop directly opposite there is 
what do they sell on the first floor possibly they sell rubbo i hazard the suggestion from the legend rub in rubbo for everything which embellishes each window the windows are frosted they are to halfway up mysterious man carrados walked back to his motor-car while we are away parkinson go across and buy a tin bottle box or packet of rubbo what is rubbo max chirped mr carlyle with insatiable curiosity so far we do not know when parkinson gets some lewis you shall be the one to try it they descended into the basement and were passed in by the grill-keeper whose manner betrayed a discreet consciousness of something in the air it was unnecessary to speculate why in the distance muffled by the armoured passages an authoritative voice boomed like a sonorous bell heard under water what however are the facts it was demanding with the causticity of baffled helplessness i am assured that there is no other key in existence yet my safe has been unlocked i am given to understand that without the password it would be impossible for an unauthorized person to tamper with my property my password deliberately chosen is anthropophaginian sir is it one that is familiarly on the lips of the criminal classes but my safe is empty what is the explanation who are the guilty persons what is being done where are the police if you consider that the proper course to adopt is to stand on the doorstep and beckon in the first constable who happens to pass permit me to say sir that i differ from you retorted the distracted manager you may rely on everything possible being done to clear up the mystery as i told you i have already telephoned for a capable private detective and for one of my directors but that is not enough insisted the professor angrily will one mere private detective restore my six thousand pound japanese four and one half per cent bearer bonds is the return of my irreplaceable notes on polyphyletic bridal customs among the mid pleistine cavemen to depend on a solitary director i demand that the police shall be let in as many as are available let scotland yard be set in motion a searching inquiry must be made i have only been a user of your precious establishment for six months and this is the result there you hold the key of the mystery professor bulge interposed carrados quietly who is this sir demanded the exasperated professor at large permit me explained mr carlyle with bland assurance i am lewis carlyle of bampton street this gentleman is mr max carrados the eminent amateur specialist in crime i shall be thankful for any assistance towards elucidating this appalling business condescended the professor sonorously let me put you in possession of the facts perhaps if we went into your room suggested carrados to the manager we should be less liable to interruption quite so quite so boomed the professor accepting the proposal on everyone else's behalf the facts sir are these i am the unfortunate possessor of a safe here in which a few months ago i deposited among less important matter sixty bearer bonds of the japanese imperial loan the bulk of my small fortune and the manuscript of an important projected work on polyphyletic bridal customs among the mid pleistine cavemen to-day i came to detach the coupons which fall due on the fifteenth to pay them into my bank a week in advance in accordance with my custom what do i find i find the safe locked and apparently intact as when i last saw it a month ago but it is far from being intact sir it has been opened ransacked cleared out not a single bond not a scrap of paper remains it was obvious that the manager's temperature had been rising during the latter part of this speech and now he boiled over pardon my flatly contradicting you professor bulge you have again referred to your visit here a month ago as your last you will bear witness of that gentleman when i inform you that the professor had access to his safe as recently as on monday last you will recognize the importance that the statement may assume the professor glared across the room like an infuriated animal a comparison heightened by his notoriously hearsign appearance how dare you contradict me sir he cried slapping the table sharply with his open hand i was not here on monday the manager shrugged his shoulders coldly you forget that the attendants also saw you he remarked cannot we trust our own eyes a common assumption yet not always a strictly reliable one insinuated carrados softly i cannot be mistaken then can you tell me without looking what colour professor bulge's eyes are 
there was a curious and expectant silence for a minute the professor turned his back on the manager and the manager passed from thoughtfulness to embarrassment i really do not know mr carrados he declared loftily at last i do not refer to mere trifles like that then you can be mistaken replied carrados mildly yet with decision but the ample hair the venerable flowing beard the prominent nose and heavy eyebrows those are just the striking points that are most easily counterfeited they take the eye if you would insure yourself against deception learn rather to observe the eye itself and particularly the spots on it the shape of the fingernails the set of the ears these things cannot be simulated you seriously suggest that the man was not professor bulge that he was an impostor the conclusion is inevitable where were you on monday professor i was on a short lecturing tour of the midlands on saturday i was in nottingham on monday in birmingham i did not return to london until yesterday carrados turned to the manager again and indicated draycott who so far had remained in the background and this gentleman did he by any chance come here on monday he did not mr carrados but i gave him access to his safe on tuesday afternoon and again yesterday draycott shook his head sadly yesterday i found it empty he said and all tuesday afternoon i was at brighton trying to see a gentleman on business the manager sat down very suddenly good god another he exclaimed faintly i'm afraid the list is only beginning said carrados we must go through your renter's book the manager roused himself to protest that cannot be done no one but myself or my deputy ever sees the book it would be unprecedented the circumstances are unprecedented replied carrados if any difficulties are placed in the way of these gentlemen's investigations i shall make it my duty to bring the facts before the home secretary announced the professor speaking up to the ceiling with the voice of a brazen trumpet carrados raised a deprecating hand may i make a suggestion he remarked now i am blind if therefore very well acquiesced the manager but i must request the others to withdraw for five minutes carrados followed the list of safe renters as the manager read them to him sometimes he stopped the catalogue to reflect a moment now and then he brushed a fingertip over a written signature and compared it with another occasionally a password interested him but when the list came to an end he continued to look into space without any sign of enlightenment so much is perfectly clear and yet so much is incredible he mused you insist that you alone have been in charge for the last six months i have not been away a day this year meals i have my lunch sent in and this room could not be entered without your knowledge while you were about the place it is impossible the door is fitted with a powerful spring and a feather touch self-acting lock it cannot be left unlocked unless you deliberately prop it open and with your knowledge no one has had an opportunity of having access to this book no was the reply carrados stood up and began to put on his gloves then i must decline to pursue my investigation any further he said icily why stammered the manager because i have positive reason for believing that you are deceiving me pray sit down mr carrados it is quite true that when you put the last question to me a circumstance rushed into my mind which so far as the strict letter was concerned might seem to demand yes instead of no but not in the spirit of your inquiry it would be absurd to attach any importance to the incident i refer to that would be for me to judge you shall do so mr carrados i live at windermere mansions with my sister a few months ago she got to know a married couple who had recently come to the opposite flat the husband was a middle-aged scholarly man who spent most of his time in the british museum his wife's tastes were different she was much younger brighter gayer a mere girl in fact one of the most charming and unaffected i have ever met my sister amelia does not readily stop exclaimed carrados a studious middle-aged man and a charming young wife be as brief as possible if there is any chance it may turn on a matter of minutes at the ports she came here of course accompanied by her husband replied the manager stiffly mrs scott had travelled and she had a hobby of taking photographs wherever she went when my position accidentally came out one evening she was carried away by the novel idea of adding views of a safe deposit to her collection as enthusiastic as a child there was no reason why she should not 
the place has often been taken for advertising purposes she came and brought her camera under your very nose i do not know what you mean by under my very nose she came with her husband one evening just about our closing time she brought her camera of course quite a small affair and contrived to be in here alone i take exception to the word contrived it it happened i sent out for some tea and in the course how long was she alone in here two or three minutes at the most when i returned she was seated at my desk that is what i referred to the little rogue had put on my glasses and had got a hold of a big book we were great chums and she delighted to mock me i confessed that i was startled merely instinctively to see that she had taken up this book but the next moment i saw that she had it upside down clever she couldn't get away in time and the camera with half a dozen of its specially sensitized films already snapped over the last few pages by her side the child yes she is twenty-seven and has kicked hats off tall men's heads in every capital from petersburg to buenos aires get through to scotland yard and ask if inspector beadle can come up the manager breathed heavily through his nose to call in the police and publish everything would ruin this establishment confidence would be gone i cannot do it without further authority then the professor certainly will before you came i rang up the only director who is at present in town and gave him the facts as they stood possibly he has arrived by this if you will accompany me to the board-room we will see they went up to the floor above mr carlyle joining them on the way excuse me a moment said the manager parkinson who had been having an improving conversation with the hall porter on the subject of land values approached i am sorry sir he reported but i was unable to procure any robo the place appears to be shut up that is a pity mr carlyle had set his heart on it will you come this way please said the manager reappearing in the board-room they found a white-haired old gentleman who had obeyed the manager's behest from a sense of duty and then remained in a distant corner of the empty room in the hope that he might be overlooked he was amiably helpless and appeared to be deeply aware of it this is a very sad business gentlemen he said in a whispering confiding voice i am informed that you recommend calling in the scotland yard authorities that would be a disastrous course for an institution that depends on the implicit confidence of the public it is the only course replied carrados the name of mr carrados is well known to us in connection with a delicate case could you not carry this one through it is impossible a wide inquiry must be made every port will have to be watched the police alone can do that he threw a little significance into the next sentence i alone can put the police in the right way of doing it and you will do that mr carrados carrados smiled engagingly he knew exactly what constituted the great attraction of his services my position is this he explained so far my work has been entirely amateur in that capacity i have averted one or two crimes remedied an occasional injustice and now and then been of service to my professional friend lewis carlyle but there is no reason at all why i should serve a commercial firm in an ordinary affair of business for nothing for any information i should require a fee a quite nominal fee of say one hundred pounds the director looked as though his faith in human nature had received a rude blow a hundred pounds would be a very large initial fee for a small firm like this mr carrados he remarked in a pained voice and that of course would be independent of mr carlyle's professional charges added carrados is that sum contingent on any specific performance inquired the manager i do not mind making it conditional on my procuring for you for the police to act on a photograph and a description of the thief the two officials conferred apart for a moment then the manager returned we will agree mr carrados on the understanding that these things are to be in our hands within two days failing that no no cried mr carlyle indignantly but carrados good-humouredly put him aside i will accept the condition in the same sporting spirit that inspires it within forty-eight hours or no pay the cheque of course to be given immediately the goods are delivered you may rely on that carrados took out his pocket-book produced an envelope bearing an american stamp and from it extracted an unmounted print here is the photograph he announced 
the man is called the ulysses k groom but he is better known as harry the actor you will find the description written on the back five minutes later when they were alone mr carlyle expressed his opinion of the transaction you are an unmitigated humbug max he said though an amiable one i admit but purely for your own private amusement you spring these things on people on the contrary replied carrados people spring these things on me now this photograph why have i heard nothing of it before carrados took out his watch and touched the fingers it is now three minutes to eleven i received the photograph at twenty past eight even then an hour ago you assured me that you had done nothing nor had i so far as result went until the keystone of the edifice was wrung from the manager in his room i was as far away from demonstrable certainty as ever so am i as yet hinted mr carlyle i am coming to that lewis i turn over the whole thing to you the man has got two clear days start and the chances are nine to one against catching him we know everything and the case has no further interest for me but it is your business here is your material on that one occasion when the tawny man crossed our path i took from the first a rather more serious view of his scope and intention than you did that same day i sent a cipher cable to pearson of the new york service i asked for news of any man of such and such a description merely negative who was known to have left the states an educated man expert in the use of disguises audacious in his operations and a specialist in dry work among banks and strong rooms why the states max that was a sighting shot on my part i argued that he must be an english-speaking man the smart and inventive turn of the modern yank has made him a specialist in ingenious devices straight or crooked unpickable locks and invincible lock pickers burglar proof safes and safe specializing burglars come equally from the states so i tried a very simple test as we talked that day and the man walked past us i dropped the words new york or rather new york in his hearing i know you did he neither turned nor stopped he was that much on his guard but into his step there came though your poor old eyes could not see it lewis the psychological pause an absolute arrest of perhaps a fifth of a second just as it would have done with you if the word london had fallen on your ear in a distant land however the whys and the wherefores don't matter here is the essential story eighteen months ago harry the actor successfully looted the office safe of mckinney j f higgs and company of cleveland ohio he had just married a smart but very facile third-rate vaudeville actress english by origin and wanted money for the honeymoon he got about five hundred pounds and with that they came to europe and stayed in london for some months that period is marked by the congreve square post office burglary you may remember while studying such of the british institutions as most appealed to him the actor's attention became fixed on this safe deposit possibly the implied challenge contained in its telegraphic address grew on him until it became a point of professional honour with him to despoil it at all events he was presumably attracted by an undertaking that promised not only glory but very solid profit the first part of the plot was to the most skilful criminal impersonator in the states mere skittles spreading over those months he appeared at the safe in twelve different characters and rented twelve safes of different sizes at the same time he made a thorough study of the methods of the place as soon as possible he got the keys back again into legitimate use having made duplicates for his own private ends of course five he seems to have returned during his first stay one was received later with profuse apologies by registered post one was returned through a leading berlin bank six months ago he made a flying visit here purely to work off two more one he kept from first to last and the remaining couple he got in at the beginning of his second long residence here three or four months ago this brings us to the serious part of the cool enterprise he had funds from the atlantic and south central mail car coup when he arrived here last april he appears to have set up three establishments a home in the guise of an elderly scholar with a young wife which of course was next door to our friend the manager an observation point over which he plastered the inscription rub in rubbo for everything as a reason for being 
and somewhere else a dressing-room with essential conditions of two doors into different streets about six weeks ago he entered the last stage mrs harry with quite ridiculous ease got photographs of the necessary page or two of the record book i don't doubt that for weeks before then every one who entered the place had been observed but the photographs linked them up with the actual men into whose hands the actor's old keys had passed gave their names and addresses the numbers of their safes their passwords and signatures the rest was easy yes by jupiter mere play for a man like that agreed mr carlyle with professional admiration he could contrive a dozen different occasions for studying the voice and manner and appearance of his victims how much has he cleared we can only speculate as yet i have put my hand on seven doubtful callers on monday and tuesday last two others he had ignored for some reason the remaining two safes had not been allotted there is one point that raises an interesting speculation what is that max the actor has one associate a man known as billy the fondant but beyond that with the exception of his wife of course he does not usually trust anyone it is plain however that at least seven men must laterally have been kept under close observation it has occurred to me yes max i have wondered whether harry has enlisted the innocent services of one or the other of our clever private inquiry offices scarcely smiled the professional it would hardly pass muster oh i don't know mrs harry in the character of a jealous wife or a suspicious sweetheart might reasonably mr carlyle's smile suddenly faded by jupiter he exclaimed i remember yes lewis prompted carrados with laughter in his voice i remember that i must telephone to a client before beetle comes concluded mr carlyle rising in some haste at the door he almost ran into the subdued director who was wringing his hands in helpless protest at a new stroke of calamity mr carrados wailed the poor old gentleman in a tremulous bleat mr carrados there is another now sir benjamin gump he insists on seeing me you will not you will not desert us i should have to stay a week replied carrados briskly and i'm just off now there will be a procession mr carlyle will support you i am sure he nodded good morning straight into the eyes of each and found his way out with the astonishing certainty of movement that made so many forget his infirmity possibly he was not desirous of encountering draycott's embarrassed gratitude again for in less than a minute they heard the swirl of his departing car never mind my dear sir mr carlyle assured his client with impenetrable complacency never mind i will remain instead perhaps i had better make myself known to sir benjamin at once the director turned on him the pleading trustful look of a cornered dormouse he is in the basement he whispered i shall be in the boardroom if necessary mr carlyle had no difficulty in discovering the centre of interest in the basement sir benjamin was expansive and reserved bewildered and decisive long-winded and short-tempered each in turn and more or less all at once he had already demanded the attention of the manager professor bulge draycott and two underlings to this case and they were now involved in a babble of inutile reiteration the inquiry agent was at once drawn into a circle of interrogation that he did his best to satisfy impressively while himself learning the new facts the latest development was sufficiently astonishing less than an hour before sir benjamin had received a parcel by district messenger it contained a jewel case which ought at that moment to have been securely reposing in one of the deposit safes hastily snatching it open the recipient's incredible forebodings were realized it was empty empty of jewels that is to say for as if to add a sting to the blow a neatly inscribed card had been placed inside and on it the agitated baronet read the appropriate but at the moment rather gratuitous maxim lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth the card was passed round and all eyes demanded the expert's pronouncement where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal hm read mr carlyle with weight this is a most important clue sir benjamin hey what what's that exclaimed a voice from the other side of the hall why damn if i don't believe you've got another look at that gentlemen look at that what's on i say here now come give me my safe i want to know where i am it was the bookmaker who strode tempestuously in among them flourishing before their faces a replica of the card that was in mr carlyle's hand 
well upon my soul this is most extraordinary exclaimed that gentleman comparing the two you have just received this mr mr berg isn't it that's right berg iceberg on the course thank the lord harry i can take my losses coolly enough but this this is a facer put into my hand half an hour ago inside an envelope that ought to be here and as safe as in the bank of england what's the game i say here johnny hurry and let me into my safe discipline and method had for the moment gone by the board there was no suggestion of the boasted safeguards of the establishment the manager added his voice to that of the client and when the attendant did not at once appear he called again john come and give mr berg access to his safe at once all right sir pleaded the harassed key attendant hurrying up with the burden of his own distraction there's a silly fathead got in what thinks this is a left luggage office as far as i can make out a foreigner never mind that now replied the manager severely mr berg's safe number o one seven two four the attendant and mr berg went off together down one of the brilliant colonnaded vistas one or two of the others who had caught the words glanced across and became aware of a strange figure that was drifting indecisively towards them he was obviously an elderly german tourist of pronounced type long-haired spectacled outrageously garbed and involved in the mental abstraction of his philosophical race one hand was occupied with the manipulation of a pipe as markedly teutonic as its owner the other grasped the carpet-bag that would have ensured an opening laugh to any low comedian quite impervious to the preoccupation of the group the german made his way up to them and picked out the manager this was a safety deposit nicht wahr quite so acquiesced the manager loftily but just now your fellow has dense of comprehension the eyes behind the clumsy glasses wrinkled to a ponderous humour he forgot his own business now this gut bag brought into fuller prominence the carpet bag revealed further details of its overburdened proportions at one end a flannel shirt cuff protruded in limp dejection at the other an ancient collar with the grotesque attachment known as a dicky asserted its presence no wonder the manager frowned his annoyance the safe was in low enough repute among its patrons at the moment without any burlesque interlude to its tragic hour yes yes he whispered attempting to lead the would-be depositor away but you are under a mistake this is not this was a safety deposit good mine bag i would deposit him in safety till the time of mine train ya yeah? nine nine almost hissed the agonized official go away sir go away it isn't a cloak-room john let this gentleman out the attendant and mr berg were returning from their quest the inner box had been opened and there was no need to ask the result the bookmaker was shaking his head like a baffled bull gone no effects he shouted across the hall lifted from the safe by crumb to those who knew nothing of the method and operation of the fraud it seemed as if the financial security of the capital was tottering an amazed silence fell and in it they heard the great grill door of the basement clang on the inopportune foreigner's departure but as if it was impossible to stand still on that morning of dire happenings he was immediately succeeded by a dapper keen-faced man in severe clerical attire who had been let in as the intruder passed out canon petersham exclaimed the professor going forward to greet him my dear professor bulge reciprocated the canon you here a most disquieting thing has happened to me i must have my safe at once he divided his attention between the manager and the professor as he monopolized them both a most disquieting and outrageous circumstance my safe please yes yes reverend henry noakes petersham i have just received by hand a box a small box of no value but one that i thought yes i am convinced that it was the one a box that was used to contain certain valuables of family interest and should at this moment be in my safe here number seven four three six very likely very likely yes here is my key but not content with the disconcerting effect of that professor the box contained and i protest that it's a most unseemly thing to quote any text from the bible in this way to a clergyman of my position well here it is lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth why i have a dozen sermons of my own on my desk now on that very verse i am particularly partial to the very needful lesson that it teaches and to apply it to me it's monstrous number seven four three six john ordered the manager with weary resignation 
the attendant again led the way towards another armor-plated aisle smartly turning a corner he stumbled over something bit a profane exclamation in two and looked back is that bloomin foreigner's old bag again he explained across the place in aggrieved apology he left it here after all take it upstairs and throw it out when you're finished said the manager shortly here wait a minute pondered john in absent-minded familiarity wait a minute this is a funny go there's a label on there that wasn't here before why not look inside why not look inside repeated someone that's what it says there was another puzzled silence all were arrested by some intangible suggestion of a deeper mystery than they had yet touched one by one they began to cross the hall with the conscious air of men who were not curious but thought that they might as well see why well, curse my crumpet suddenly exploded mr burge if that ain't the same writing as these texts by gad but i believe you are right assented mr carlyle well why not look inside the attendant from his stooping posture took the verdict of the ring of faces and in a trice tugged open the two buckles the central fastening was not locked and yielded to a touch the flannel shirt the weird collar and a few other garments in the nature of a top dressing were flung out and john's hand plunged deeper harry the actor had lived up to his dramatic instinct nothing was wrapped up nay the rich booty had been deliberately opened out and displayed as it were so that the overturning of the bag when john the key-bearer in an access of riotous extravagance lifted it up and strewed its contents broadcast on the floor was like the looting of a smuggler's den or the realization of a speculator's dream or the bursting of an aladdin's cave or something incredibly lavish and bizarre bank-notes fluttered down and lay about in all directions relays of sovereigns rolled away like so much dross bonds and scrip for thousands and tens of thousands clogged the downpouring stream of jewellery and unset gems a yellow stone the size of a four-pound weight and twice as heavy dropped plump upon the cannon's toes and sent him hopping and grimacing to the wall a ruby-hilted kris cut across the manager's wrist as he strove to arrest the splendid rout still the miraculous cornucopia deluged the ground with its pattering ringing bumping crinkling rolling fluttering produce until like the final tableau of some spectacular ballet it ended with a golden rain that masked the details of the heap beneath a glittering veil of yellow sand my dust gasped draycott my fibres by golly ejaculated the bookmaker initiating a plunge among the spoil my japanese bonds coupons and all and yes even the manuscript of my work on polyphyletic bridal customs among the mid pleistine cavemen ha something approaching a cachination of delight crossed the professor's contribution to the pandemonium and eye-witnesses afterwards declared that for a moment the dignified scientist stood on one foot in the opening movement of a can-can my wife's diamonds thank heaven cried sir benjamin with the air of a schoolboy who was very well out of a swishing but what does it mean demanded the bewildered canon here are my family heirlooms a few decent pearls my grandfather's collection of camay and other trifles but who perhaps this offers some explanation suggested mr carlyle unpinning an envelope that had been secured to the lining of the bag it is addressed to seven rich sinners shall i read it for you for some reason the response was not unanimous but it was sufficient mr carlyle cut open the envelope my dear friends aren't you glad aren't you happy at this moment ah oh, yes but not with me the true joy of regeneration that alone can bring lightness to the afflicted soul pause while there is yet time cast off the burden of your sinful lusts for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul mark chapter eight verse thirty six oh my friends you have had an all-fired narrow squeak up till the friday last week i held your wealth in the hollow of my ungodly hand and rejoiced in my nefarious cunning but on that day as i with my guilty female accomplice stood listening with worldly amusement to the testimony of a converted brother at a meeting of the salvation army on clapham common the gospel light suddenly shone into our rebellious souls and then and there we found salvation hallelujah what we have done to complete the unrighteous scheme upon which we had laboured for months has only been for your own good dear friends that you are though as yet divided from us by your carnal lusts let this be a lesson to you sell all you have and give it to the poor through the organization of the salvation army by preference 
and thereby lay up for yourselves treasures where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal matthew chapter six verse twenty yours in good works private henry the salvationist p s in haste i may as well inform you that no crib is really uncrackable though the cyrus j coy company's safe deposit on west twenty-fourth street new york comes nearest the colonel and even that i could work to the bare rock if i took hold of the job with both hands that is to say i could have done in my sinful days as for you i should recommend you to change your t a to peanut u k g there sounds a streak of the old adam in that postscript mr carlyle whispered inspector beadle who had just arrived in time to hear the letter read End of section five read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Section six of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins The Tilling Shaw Mystery I will see Miss George now, assented Carrados. Parkinson retired, and Greatorex looked around from his chair. The morning clearing up was still in progress. Shall I go? he inquired. Not unless the lady desires it. I don't know her at all. The secretary was not unobservant, and he had profited from his association with Mr. Carrados. Without more ado, he began to get his papers quietly together. The door opened, and a girl of about twenty came eagerly, yet half timorously, into the room. Her eyes for a moment swept Carrados with an anxious scrutiny. Then, with a slight shade of disappointment, she noticed that they were not alone. "'I have come direct from Oakshire to see you, Mr. Carrados.' she announced in a quick nervous voice that was evidently the outcome of a desperate resolution to be brave and explicit the matter is a dreadfully important one to me and i should very much prefer to tell it to you alone there was no need for carrados to turn towards his secretary that discriminating young gentleman was already on his way miss george flashed him a shy look of thanks and filled in the moment with a timid survey of the room is it something that you think i can help you with i had hoped so i had heard in a roundabout way of your wonderful power ought i to tell you how does it matter not in the least if it has nothing to do with the case replied carrados when this dreadful thing happened i instinctively thought of you i felt sure that i ought to come and get you to help me at once but i i have very little money mr carrados only a few pounds and i am not so childish as not to know that very clever men require large fees then when i got here my heart sank for i saw at once from your house and position that what seemed little even to me would be ridiculous to you that if you did help me it would be purely out of kindness of heart and generosity suppose you tell me what the circumstances are suggested carrados cautiously then to afford an opening he added you have recently gone into mourning i see see exclaimed the girl almost sharply then you are not blind oh yes he replied only i use the familiar expression partly from custom partly because it sounds unnecessarily pedantic to say i deduce from certain observations i beg your pardon i suppose i was startled not so much by the expression as by your knowledge i ought to have been prepared but i am already wasting your time and i came so determined to be business-like i got a copy of the local paper on the way because i thought that the account in it would be clearer to you than i could tell it shall i read it please if that was your intention it is the stinbridge herald explained the girl taking a closely folded newspaper from the handbag which she carried stinbridge is our nearest town about six miles from tilling shaw where we live this is the account mysterious tragedy at tilling well-known agriculturalist attempts murder and commits suicide the districts of great tilling tilling shaw and the immediate neighbourhood were thrown into a state of unusual excitement on thursday last by the report of a tragedy in their midst such as has rarely marked the annals of our law-abiding countryside 
a herald representative was early on the scene and his inquiries elucidated the fact that it was only too true that in this case rumour had not exaggerated the circumstances rather the reverse indeed on the afternoon of the day in question mr frank whitmarsh of high barn presented himself at barony the residence of his uncle mr william whitmarsh with the intention of seeing him in reference to a dispute that was pending between them this is understood to be connected with an alleged trespass in pursuit of game each relative claiming exclusive sporting rights over a piece of water known as hunston mere on this occasion the elder gentleman was not at home and mr frank whitmarsh after waiting for some time departed leaving a message to the effect that he would return and according to one report have it out with uncle william later in the evening this resolution he unfortunately kept returning about eight forty five p m he found his uncle in and for some time the two men remained together in the living-room what actually passed between them has not yet transpired but it is said that for half an hour there had been nothing to indicate to the other occupants of the house that anything unusual was in progress when suddenly two shots rang out in rapid succession mrs lawrence the housekeeper at barony and a servant were the soonest on the spot and conquering the natural terror that for a moment held them outside the now silent room they summoned up courage to throw open the door and to enter the first thing that met their eyes was the body of mr frank whitmarsh lying on the floor almost at their feet in their distressed state it was immediately assumed by the horrified women that he was dead or at least seriously wounded but a closer examination revealed the fact that the gentleman had experienced an almost miraculous escape at the time of the tragedy he was wearing a large old-fashioned silver watch and in this the bullet intended for his heart was found literally embedded deep in the works the second shot had however effected its purpose for at the other side of the room still seated at the table was mr william whitmarsh already quite dead with a large terrible wound in his head and the weapon a large bore revolver of obsolete pattern lying at his feet mr frank whitmarsh subsequently explained that the shock of the attack and the dreadful appearance presented by his uncle when immediately afterwards he turned his hand against himself must have caused him to faint readers of the herald will join in our expression of sympathy for all members of the whitmarsh family and in our congratulations to mr frank whitmarsh on his providential escape the inquest is fixed for monday and it is anticipated that the funeral will take place on the following day that is all concluded miss george all that is in the paper amended carrados it is the same everywhere attempted murder and suicide that is what everyone accepts as a matter of course went on the girl quickly how do they know that my father tried to kill frank or that he killed himself how can they know mr carrados your father miss george yes my name is madeline whitmarsh at home everyone looks at me as if i was an object of mingled pity and reproach i thought that they might know the name here so i gave the first that came to my head i think it is a street i was directed along besides i don't want it to be known that i came to see you in any case why much of the girl's conscious nervousness had stiffened into an attitude of unconscious hardness grief takes many forms and whatever she had been before the tragic episode had left miss whitmarsh a little hurt and cynical you are a man living in a town and can do as you like i am a girl living in the country and have therefore to do largely as my neighbours like for me to set up my opinion against popular feeling would constitute no small offence to question its justice would be held to be adding outrageous insult to enormous injury so far i am unable to go beyond the newspaper account on the face of it your father with what provocation of course i do not know did attempt this mr frank whitmarsh's life and then take his own you imply another version what reason have you that is the terrible part of it exclaimed the girl with rising distress it was that which made me so afraid of coming to you although i felt that i must for i dreaded that when you asked me for proofs i could give you none and you would refuse to help me we were not even in time to hear him speak and yet i know no with absolute conviction that my father could not have done this there are things that you cannot explain mr carrados and well there is an end of it her voice sank to an absent-minded whisper every one will condemn him now that he cannot defend himself and yet he could not even have had the revolver that was found at his feet 
what is that demanded carrados sharply do you mean that mean what she asked with the blankness of one who has lost the thread of her own thoughts what you said about the revolver that your father could not have had it the revolver she repeated half wearily oh yes it was a heavy old-fashioned affair it had been lying in a drawer of his desk for more than ten years because once a dog came into the orchard in broad daylight and worried half a dozen lambs before anyone could do anything yes but why could he not have had it on thursday i noticed that it was gone after frank had left in the afternoon i went into the room where he had been waiting to finish dusting the paper says the dining-room but it was really papa's business room and no one else used it then when i was dusting the desk i saw that the revolver was no longer there you had occasion to open the drawer it is really a very old bureau and none of the drawers fit closely dust lies on the ledges and you always have to open them a little to dust properly they were never kept locked possibly your father had taken the revolver with him no i had seen it there after he had gone he rode to stinbridge immediately after lunch and did not return until nearly eight after he left i went to dust his room it was then that i saw it i was doing the desk when frank knocked and interrupted me that is how i came to be there twice but you said that you had no proof miss whitmarsh carrados reminded her with deep seriousness do you not recognize the importance the deadly importance that this one shred of evidence may assume does it she replied simply i am afraid that i am rather dull just now all yesterday i was absolutely dazed i could not do the most ordinary things i found myself looking at the clock for minutes together yet absolutely incapable of grasping what time it was in the same way i know that it struck me as being funny about the revolver but i always had to give it up it was as though everything was there but things would not fit in you are sure absolutely sure that you saw the revolver there after your father had left and missed it before he returned oh yes said the girl quickly i remember realizing how curious it was at the time besides there is something else i so often had things to ask papa about when he was out of the house that i got into the way of making little notes to remind me later this morning i found on my dressing-table one that i had written on thursday afternoon about this weapon yes to ask him what could have become of it carrados made a further inquiry and this was madeline whitmarsh's account of affairs existing between the two branches of the family until the time of william whitmarsh father of the william whitmarsh just deceased the properties of barony and high barn had formed one estate descending from a william senior to a william junior down a moderately long line of yeoman whitmarshes through the influence of his second wife this william senior divided the property leaving barony with its four hundred acres of good land to william junior and high barn with which went three hundred acres of poor land to his other son father of the frank implicated in the recent tragedy but though divided the two farms still had one common link beneath their growing corn and varied pasturage lay it was generally admitted a seam of coal at a depth and of a thickness that would render its working a paying venture even in william the divider's time when the idea was new money in plenty would have been forthcoming but he would have none of it and when he died his will contained a provision restraining either son from mining or exploiting his land for mineral without the consent and cooperation of the other this restriction became a legacy of hate the brothers were only half-brothers and william having suffered unforgettably at the hands of his stepmother had old scores to pay off quite comfortably prosperous on his own rich farm and quite satisfied with the excellent shooting and the congenial life he had not the slightest desire to increase his wealth he had the old dour peasant-like instinct to cling to the house and the land of his forefathers from this position no argument moved him in the meanwhile on the other side of the new boundary fence frank senior was growing poorer year by year to his periodical entreaties that william would agree to shafts being sunk on high barn he received an emphatic never in my time the poor man argued besought threatened and swore the prosperous one shook his head and grinned carrados did not need to hear the local saying half-brothers whole haters like the whitmarshes to read the situation of course i do not really understand the business part of it said madeline and many people blamed poor papa especially when uncle frank drank himself to death 
but i know that it was not mere obstinacy he loved the undisturbed peaceful land just as it was and his father had wished it to remain the same collieries would bring swarms of strange men into the neighbourhood poachers and trespassers he said the smoke and dust would ruin the land for miles round and drive away the game and in the end if the work did not turn out profitable we should all be much worse off than before does the restriction lapse now will mr frank jr be able to mine it will now lie with frank and my brother william just as it did before with their fathers i would expect willie to be quite favourable he is more modern you have not spoken of your brother i have too bob the younger is in mexico she explained and willie in canada with an engineering firm they did not get on very well with papa and they went away it did not require preternatural observation to deduce that the late william whitmarsh had been a little difficult when uncle frank died less than six months ago frank came back to high barn from south africa he had been away about two years possibly he did not get on well with his father madeline smiled sadly i am afraid that no two whitmarsh men ever did get on well together she admitted your father and young frank for instance their lands adjoin there were always quarrels and disputes she replied then frank had his father's grievance over again he wished to mine yes he told me that he had had experience of coal in natal there was no absolute ostracism between you then you were to some extent friends scarcely she appeared to reflect acquaintances we met occasionally of course at people's houses you did not visit high barn oh no but there was no particular reason why you should not why do you ask me that she demanded quickly and in a tone that was quite incompatible with the simple inquiry then recognizing the fact she added with shamefaced penitence i beg your pardon mr carrados i am afraid that my nerves have gone to pieces since thursday the most ordinary things affect me inexplicably that is a common experience in such circumstances said carrados reassuringly where were you at the time of the tragedy i was in my bedroom which is rather high up changing i had driven down to the village to give an order and had just returned mrs lawrence told me that she had been afraid there might be quarrelling but no one would ever have dreamed of this and then came a loud shot and then after a few seconds another not so loud and we rushed to the door she and mary first and everything was absolutely still a loud shot and then another not so loud yes i noticed that even at the time i happened to speak to mrs lawrence of it afterwards and then she also remembered that it had been like that afterwards carrados even recalled with grim pleasantry that the two absolutely vital points in the fabric of circumstantial evidence that was to exonerate her father and fasten the guilt upon another had dropped from the girl's lips utterly by chance but at the moment the facts themselves monopolized his attention you are not disappointed that i can tell you so little she asked timidly scarcely he replied a suicide who could not have had the weapon he dies by a victim who is miraculously preserved by an opportune watch and two shots from the same pistol that differ materially in volume all taken together do not admit of disappointment i am very stupid she said i do not seem able to follow things but you will come and clear my father's name i will come he replied beyond that who shall prophesy it had been arranged between them that the girl should return at once while carrados would travel down to great tilling late that same afternoon and put up at the local fishing inn in the evening he would call at barony where madeline would accept him as a distant connection of the family the arrangement was only for the benefit of the domestics and any casual visitor who might present for there was no possibility of a near relation being in attendance nor was there any appreciable danger of either his name or person being recognized in those parts a consideration that seemed to have some weight with the girl for more than once she entreated him not to disclose to anyone his real business there until he had arrived at a definite conclusion it was nine o'clock but still just light enough to distinguish the prominent features of the landscape when carrados accompanied by parkinson reached barony the house as described by the manservant was a substantial grey stone building very plain very square 
very exposed to the four winds it had not even a porch to break the flat surface and here and there in the line of its three solid stories a window had been built up by some frugal tax evading whitmarsh of a hundred years ago sombre enough commented carrados but the connection between environment and crime is not yet capable of analysis we get murders in brand-new suburban villas and the virtues light-heartedness and good fellowship in moated granges what would you say about it eh parkinson i should say it was damp sir observed parkinson with his wisest air madeline whitmarsh herself opened the door she took them down the long flagged hall to the dining-room a cheerful enough apartment whatever its exterior might forebode i am glad you have come now mr carrados she said hurriedly when the door was closed sergeant brewster is here from stinbridge police station to make some arrangements for the inquest it is to be held at the schools here on monday he said that he must take the revolver with him to produce do you want to see it before he goes i should like to replied carrados will you come into papa's room then he is there the sergeant was at the table making notes in his pocket-book when they entered an old-fashioned revolver lay before him this gentleman has come a long way on hearing about poor papa said the girl he would like to see the revolver before you take it mr brewster good evening sir said brewster it's a bad business that brings us here carrados looked around the room and returned the policeman's greeting madeline hesitated for a moment and then picking up the weapon put it into the blind man's hand a bit out of date sir remarked brewster with a nod but in good order yet i find an early french make i should say one of le fouchers probably said carrados you have removed the cartridges why yes admitted the sergeant producing a match-box from his pocket they're pin-fire you see and i'm not too fond of carrying a thing like that loaded in my pocket as i'm riding a young horse quite so agreed carrados fingering the cartridges i wonder if you happened to mark the order of these in the chambers that was scarcely necessary sir two together had been fired the other four had not i once knew a case possibly i read of it where a pack of cards lay on the floor it was a murder case and the guilt or innocence of an accused man depended on the relative positions of the fifty-first and fifty-second cards i think you must have read of that sir replied brewster endeavouring to implicate first miss whitmarsh and then parkinson in his meaning smile however this is straightforward enough then of course you have not thought it worth while to look for anything else i have noted all the facts which have any bearing on the case were you referring to any particular point sir i was only wondering suggested carrados with apologetic mildness whether you or anyone had happened to find a wad lying about anywhere the sergeant stroked his well-kept moustache to hide the smile that insisted however on escaping through his eyes scarcely sir he replied with fine irony bulleted revolver cartridges contain no wad you are thinking of a shotgun sir oh said carrados bending over the spent cartridge he was examining that settles it of course i think so sir assented the sergeant courteously but with a quiet enjoyment of the situation well miss i'll be getting back now i think i have everything i want you'll excuse me a few minutes said miss whitmarsh and the two callers were left alone parkinson said carrados softly as the door closed look round on the floor there is no wad lying within sight no sir then take the lamp and look behind things but if you find one don't disturb it for a minute strange and gigantic shadows chased one another across the ceiling as parkinson moved the table lamp to and fro behind the furniture the man to whom blazing sunlight and the deepest shade were as one sat with his eyes fixed tranquilly on the unseen wall before him there is a little pellet of paper here behind the couch sir announced parkinson then put the lamp back together they drew the cumbrous old piece of furniture from the wall and carrados went behind on hands and knees with his face almost to the floor he appeared to be studying even the dust that lay there then with a light unerring touch he carefully picked up the thing that parkinson had found very gently he unrolled it using his long delicate fingers so skilfully that even at the end the particles of dust still clung here and there to the surface of the paper what do you make of it parkinson parkinson submitted it to the judgment of a single sense 
a cigarette paper to all appearance sir i can't say it's a kind that i've had experience of it doesn't seem to have any distinct watermark but there is a half inch of glossy paper along one edge amber tipped yes another edge is a little uneven it appears to have been cut this edge opposite the mouthpiece yes yes patches are blackened and little holes like pinpricks burned through in places it is scorched brown anything else i hope there is nothing i have failed to observe sir said parkinson after a pause carrados's reply was a strangely irrelevant question what is the ceiling made of he demanded oak board sir with a heavy cross beam are there any plaster figures about the room no sir or anything at all that is whitewashed nothing sir carrados raised the scrap of tissue paper to his nose again and for the second time he touched it with his tongue very interesting parkinson he remarked and parkinson's responsive yes sir was a model of discreet acquiescence i'm sorry that i had to leave you said miss whitmarsh returning but mrs lawrence is out and my father made a practice of offering everyone refreshment don't mention it said carrados we have not been idle i came from london to pick up a scrap of paper lying on the floor of this room well here it is he rolled the tissue into a pellet again and held it before her eyes the wad she exclaimed eagerly oh that proves that i was right scarcely proves miss whitmarsh but it shows that one of the shots was a blank cartridge as you suggested this morning might have been the case hardly even that what then she demanded with her large dark eyes fixed in a curious fascination on his inscrutable face that behind the couch we have found this scrap of powder singed paper there was a moment's silence the girl turned away her head i am afraid that i am a little disappointed she murmured perhaps better now than later i wish to warn you that we must prove every inch of ground does your cousin frank smoke cigarettes i cannot say mr carrados you see i knew so little of him quite so there was just the chance and your father he never did he despised them that is all i need to ask you now what time to-morrow shall i find you in miss whitmarsh it is sunday you remember at any time the curiosity i inspire doesn't tempt me to encounter my friends i can assure you she replied her face hardening at the recollection but mr carrados yes the inquest is on monday afternoon i had a sort of desperate faith that you would be able to vindicate papa by the time of the inquest you mean yes otherwise the verdict of a coroner's jury means nothing miss whitmarsh it is the merest formality it means a very great deal to me it haunts and oppresses me if they say if it goes out that papa is guilty of the attempt of murder and of suicide i shall never raise my head again carrados had no desire to prolong a futile discussion good night he said holding out his hand good night mr carrados she detained him a moment her voice vibrant with quiet feeling i already owe you more than i can ever hope to express your wonderful kindness a strange case moralized carrados as they walked out of the quadrangular yard into the silent lane instructive but i more than half wish i'd never heard of it the young lady seems grateful sir parkinson ventured to suggest the young lady is the case parkinson replied his master rather grimly a few score yards farther on a swing gate gave access to a field path cutting off the corner that the high road made with the narrow lane this was their way but instead of following the brown line of trodden earth carrados turned to the left and indicated the line of buildings that formed the back of one side of the quadrangle they had passed through we will investigate here he said can you see a way in most of the buildings opened on to the yard but at one end of the range parkinson discovered a door secured only by a wooden latch the place beyond was impenetrably dark but the sweet dusty smell of hay and from beyond the occasional click of a horse's shoe on stone and the rattle of a headstall chain through the manger ring told them that they were in the chaff pen at the back of the stable carrados stretched out his hand and touched the wall with a single finger we need go no farther he remarked and as they resumed their way across the field he took out a handkerchief to wipe the taste of whitewash off his tongue 
madeline had spoken of the gradual decay of high barn but carrados was hardly prepared for the poverty-stricken desolation which parkinson described as they approached the homestead on the following afternoon he had purposely selected a way that took them across many of young whitmarsh's ill-stocked fields fields in which the sedge and charlock wrote an indictment of neglected drains and of half-hearted tillage on the land the gates and hedges had been broken and unkempt the buildings as they passed through the barnyard were empty and showed here and there a skeletonry of bare rafters to the sky starved commented the blind man as he read the signs the thirsty owner and the hungry land they couldn't both be fed although it was afternoon the bolts and locks of the front door had to be unfastened in answer to their knock when at last the door was opened a shrivelled little old woman rather wicked-looking in a comic way and rather begrimed stood there mr frank whitmarsh she replied to carrados's polite inquiry oh yes he lives here frank she called down the passage you're wanted what is it mother responded a man's full strong voice rather lazily come and see and the old creature ogled carrados with her beady eyes as though the situation constituted an excellent joke between them there was the sound of a chair being moved and at the end of the passage a tall man appeared in his shirt-sleeves i am a stranger to you explained carrados but i am staying at the bridge inn and i heard of your wonderful escape on thursday i was so interested that i have taken the liberty of coming across to congratulate you on it oh come in come in said whitmarsh yes it was a sort of miracle wasn't it he led the way back into the room he had come from half kitchen half parlour it at least had the virtue of an air of rude comfort and some of the pewter and china that ornamented its mantelpiece and dresser would have rejoiced the collector's heart you'll find us a bit rough apologized the young man with something of contempt towards his surroundings we weren't expecting visitors and i was hesitating to come because i thought that you would be surrounded by your friends this very ordinary remark seemed to afford mrs whitmarsh unbounded entertainment and for quite a number of seconds she was convulsed with silent amusement at the idea shut up mother said her dutiful son don't take any notice of her he remarked to his visitors she often goes on like that the fact is he added we whitmarshes aren't popular in these parts of course that doesn't trouble me i've seen too much of things and taken as a boiling the whitmarshes deserve it ah wait till you touch the coal my boy then you'll see put in the old lady with malicious triumph i reckon we'll show them then eh mother he responded bumptiously perhaps you've heard of that mr carrados win carrados that is my man parkinson i have to be attended because my sight has failed me yes i had heard something about coal providence seems to be on your side just now mr whitmarsh may i offer you a cigarette thanks i don't mind for once in a way they're turkish quite innocuous i believe oh it isn't that i can smoke cutty with any man i reckon but the paper affects my lips i make my own and use a sort of paper with an end that doesn't stick the paper is certainly a drawback sometimes agreed carrados i've found that might i try one of yours they exchanged cigarettes and whitmarsh returned to the subject of the tragedy this has made a bit of a stir i can tell you he remarked with complacency i am sure it would well it was the chief topic of conversation when i was in london is that a fact avowedly indifferent to the opinion of his neighbours even whitmarsh was not proof against the pronouncement of the metropolis what do they say about it up there i should be inclined to think that the interest centres around the explanation that you will give at the inquest of the cause of the quarrel there what did i tell you exclaimed mrs whitmarsh be quiet mother that's easily answered mr carrados there was a bit of duck shooting that lay between our two places or perhaps you saw that in the papers yes admitted carrados i saw that frankly the reason seemed inadequate to so deadly a climax what did i say demanded the irrepressible dame they won't believe it the young man cast a wrathful look in his mother's direction and turned again to the visitor that's because you don't know uncle william any reason was good enough for him to quarrel over here let me give you an instance when i went in on thursday he was smoking a pipe well after a bit i took out a cigarette and lit it i'm damned if he didn't turn round and start on me for that how does that strike you for one of your own family mr carrados 
unreasonable i am bound to admit i am afraid that i should have been inclined to argue the point what did you do mr whitmarsh i hadn't gone there to quarrel replied the young man half sulky at the recollection it was his house i threw it into the fireplace very obliging said carrados but if i may say so it isn't so much a matter of speculation why he should shoot you as why he should shoot himself that gentleman seems friendly better ask his advice frank put in the old woman in a penetrating whisper stow it mother said whitmarsh sharply are you crazy her idea of a coroner's inquest he explained to carrados with easy contempt is that i am being tried for murder as a matter of fact uncle william was a very passionate man and like many of that kind he frequently went beyond himself i don't doubt that he was sure he'd killed me for he was a good shot and the force of the blow sent me backwards he was a very proud man too in a way wouldn't stand correction or any kind of authority and when he realized what he'd done and saw in a flash that he would be tried and hanged for it suicide seemed the easiest way out of his difficulties i suppose yes that sounds reasonable enough admitted carrados then you don't think there will be any trouble sir insinuated mrs whitmarsh anxiously frank had already professed his indifference to local opinion but carrados was conscious that both of them hung rather breathlessly on to his reply why no he declared weightily i should see no reason for anticipating any unless he added thoughtfully some clever lawyer was instructed to insist that there must be more in the dispute than appears on the surface oh them liars them liars moaned the old lady in a panic they can make you say anything i can't make me say anything a cunning look came into his complacent face and besides who's going to engage a lawyer the family of the deceased gentleman might wish to do so both of the sons are abroad and could not be back in time but is there not a daughter here i understood so whitmarsh gave a short unpleasant laugh and turned to look at his mother madeline won't you may bet your bottom ticky it's the last thing she would want the little old creature gazed admiringly at her big showy son and responded with an appreciative grimace that made her look more humorously rat-like than ever he he missy won't she tittered that would never do he he wink succeeded nod and meaning smile until she relapsed into a state of quietness and parkinson who had been fascinated by her contortions was unable to decide whether she was still laughing or had gone to sleep carrados stayed a few more minutes and before they left he asked to see the watch a unique memento mr whitmarsh he remarked examining it i should think this would become a family heirloom it's no good for anything else said whitmarsh practically a famous timekeeper it was too the fingers are both gone yes the glass was broken of course and they must have caught in the cloth of my pocket and ripped off they naturally would it was ten minutes past nine when the shot was fired the young man thought and then nodded about that he agreed nearer and about if your watch was correct very interesting mr whitmarsh i am glad to have seen the watch that saved your life instead of returning to the inn carrados directed parkinson to take the road to barony madeline was at home and from the sound of voices it appeared that she had other visitors but she came out to carrados at once and at his request took him into the empty dining-room while parkinson stayed in the hall yes she said eagerly i have come to tell you that i must throw up my brief he said there is nothing more to be done and i return to town to-night oh she stammered helplessly i i thought i thought your cousin did not abstract the revolver when he was here on thursday miss whitmarsh he did not at his leisure fire a bullet into his own watch to make it appear later in the day as if he had been attacked he did not reload the cartridge with a blank charge he did not deliberately shoot your father and then fire off the blank cartridge he was attacked and the newspaper version is substantially correct the whole fabric so delicately suggested by inference and innuendo falls to pieces then you desert me mr carrados she said in a low bitter voice i have seen the watch the watch that saved whitmarsh's life he continued unmoved it would save again if necessary it indicates ten minutes past nine the time to a minute at which it is agreed the shot was fired by what prescience was he to know at what exact minute his opportunity would occur 
when i saw the watch on thursday night the fingers were not there they are not but the shaft remains it is of an old-fashioned pattern and it will only take the fingers in one position that position indicates ten minutes past nine surely it would have been an easy matter to have altered that afterwards in this case fate has been curiously systematic miss whitmarsh the bullet that shattered the works has so locked the action that it will not move a fraction this way or that there is something more than this something that i do not understand she persisted i think i have a right to know since you insist there is there is the wad of the blank cartridge that you fired in the outbuilding oh she exclaimed in the moment of startled undefence how do you how can you you must leave the conjurer his few tricks for effect of course you naturally would fire it where the precious pellet could not get lost the paper you steamed off the cigarette that whitmarsh threw into the empty fire grate and of course the place must be some distance from the house or even that slight report might occasion remark yes she confessed in a sudden abandonment to weary indifference it has been useless i was a fool to set my cleverness against yours now i suppose mr carrados you will have to hand me over to justice well why don't you say something she demanded impatiently as he offered no comment people frequently put me in this embarrassing position he explained diffidently and throw the responsibility on me now a number of years ago a large and stately building was set up in london and it was beautifully called the royal palace of justice that was its official name and that was what it was to be but very soon people got into the way of calling it the law courts and to-day if you ask the londoner to direct you to the palace of justice he would undoubtedly set you down as a religious maniac you see my difficulty it is very strange she said intent upon her own reflections but i do not feel a bit ashamed to you of what i have done i do not even feel afraid to tell you all about it although of some of that i must certainly be ashamed why is it because i am blind oh no she replied very positively carrados smiled at her decision but he did not seek to explain that when he could no longer see the faces of men the power was gradually given to him of looking into their hearts to which some in their turn strong free spirits instinctively responded there is such a thing as friendship at first sight he suggested why yes like quite old friends she agreed it is a pity that i had no very trusty friend since my mother died when i was quite little even my father has been it is queer to think of it now well almost a stranger to me really she looked at carrados's serene and kindly face and smiled it is a great relief to be able to talk like this without the necessity for lying she remarked did you know that i was engaged no you had not told me that oh no but you might have heard of it he is a clergyman whom i met last summer but of course that is all over now you have broken it off circumstances have broken it off the daughter of a man who had the misfortune to be murdered might just possibly be tolerated as a vicar's wife but the daughter of a murderer and a suicide it is unthinkable you see the requirements for the office are largely social mr carrados possibly your vicar may have other views oh he isn't a vicar yet but he is rather well connected so it is quite assured and he would be dreadfully torn if the choice lay with him as it is he will perhaps rather soon get over my absence but you see if we married he could never get over my presence it would always stand in the way of his preferment i worked very hard to make it possible but it could not be you were even prepared to send an innocent man to the gallows i think so at one time she admitted frankly but i scarcely thought it would come to that there are so many well-meaning people who always get up petitions no as i stand here looking at myself over there i feel that i couldn't quite have hanged frank no matter how much he deserved it you are very shocked mr carrados well admitted carrados with pleasant impartiality i have seen the young man but the penalty even with a reprieve still seems to me a little severe yet how do you know even now that he is as you say an innocent man i don't was the prompt admission i only know in this astonishing case that so far as my investigation goes he did not murder your father by the act of his hand not according to your law courts she suggested but in the great palace of justice well you shall judge she left his side crossed the room and stood by the square ugly window looking out but as blind as carrados to the details of the somnolent landscape 
i met frank for the first time after i was all grown up about three years ago when i returned from boarding school i had not seen him since i was a child and i thought him very tall and manly it seemed a frightfully romantic thing in the circumstances to meet him secretly of course my thoughts flew to romeo and juliet we put impassioned letters for one another in a hollow tree that stood on the boundary hedge but presently i found out gradually and credulously at first and then one night with a sudden terrible certainty that my ideas of romance were not his i had what is called i believe a narrow escape i was glad when he went abroad for it was only my self-conceit that had suffered i was never in love with him only in love with the idea of being in love with him a few months ago frank came back to high barn i tried never to meet him anywhere but one day he overtook me in the lanes he said that he had thought a lot about me while he was away and would i marry him i told him that it was impossible in any case and besides i was engaged he coolly replied that he knew i was dumbfounded and asked him what he meant then he took out a packet of my letters that he had kept somewhere all the time he insisted on reading parts of them up and telling me what this and that meant and what every one would say it proved i was horrified at the construction that seemed capable of being put on my foolish but innocent gush i called him a coward and a blackguard and a mean cur and a sneaking cad and everything i could think of in one long breath until i found myself faint and sick with excitement and the nameless growing terror of it he only laughed and told me to think it over and then walked on throwing the letters up into the air and catching them it isn't worth while going into all the times he met and threatened me i was to marry him or he would expose me he would never allow me to marry anyone else and then finally he turned round and said that he didn't really want to marry me at all he only wanted to force father's consent to start mining and this had seemed the easiest way that is what is called blackmail miss whitmarsh a word you don't seem to have applied to him the punishment ranges up to penal servitude for life in extreme cases yes that is what it really was he came on thursday with the letters in his pocket that was his last threat when he could not move me i can guess what happened he read the letters and proposed a bargain and my father who was a very passionate man and very proud in certain ways shot him as he thought and then in shame and in the madness of despair took his own life now mr carrados you were to be my judge i think said the blind man with a great pity in his voice that it would be sufficient for you to come up for judgment when called upon three weeks later a registered letter bearing the liverpool postmark was delivered at the turrets after he had read it carrados put it away in a special drawer of his desk and once or twice in after years when his work seemed rather barren he took it out and read it this is what it contained dear mr carrados some time after you had left me that sunday afternoon a man came in the dark to the door and asked for me i did not see his face for he kept in the shade but his figure was not very unlike that of your servant parkinson a package was put into my hands and he was gone without a word from this i imagine that perhaps you did not leave quite as soon as you had intended thank you very much indeed for the letters i was glad to have the miserable things to drop them into the fire and to see them pass utterly out of my own and everyone else's life i wonder who else in the world would have done so much for a forlorn creature who just flashed across a few days of his busy life and then i wonder who else could but there is something else for which i thank you now far far more and that is for saving me from the blindness of my own passionate folly when i look back on the abyss of meanness treachery and guilt into which i could have wilfully cast myself and been condemned to live all my life i can scarcely trust myself to write i will not say that i do not suffer now i think i shall for many years to come but all the bitterness and i think all the hardness have been drawn out you will see that i am riding from liverpool i have taken a second-class passage to canada and we sail to-night willie who returned to barony last week has lent me all the money i shall need until i find work do not be apprehensive it is not with the vague uncertainty of an indifferent typist or a downtrodden governess that i go but as an efficient domestic servant a capable cook housemaid or general as need be it sounds rather incredible at first does it not but such things happen and i shall get on very well good-bye mr carrados i shall remember you very often and very gratefully madeline whitmarsh p s yes there is friendship at first sight 
End of section six. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Section 7 of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. The Comedy at Fountain Cottage. Carrados had rung up Mr. Carlyle soon after the inquiry agent had reached his office in Bampton Street on a certain morning in April. Mr. Carlyle's face at once assumed its most amiable expression as he recognized his friend's voice yes max he replied in answer to the call i am here and at the top of form thanks glad to know that you are back from tresco is there anything i have a couple of men coming in this evening whom you might like to meet explained carrados manuel the zambesia explorer is one and the other an east end slum doctor who has seen a few things do you care to come round to dinner delighted warbled mr carlyle without a moment's consideration charmed your usual hour max then the smiling complacence of his face suddenly changed and the wire conveyed an exclamation of annoyance i am really very sorry max but i have just remembered that i have an engagement i fear that i must deny myself after all is it important no admitted mr carlyle strictly speaking it is not in the least important this is why i feel compelled to keep it it is only to dine with my niece they have just got into an absurd doll's house of a villa at groats heath and i had promised to go there this evening are they particular to a day there was a moment's hesitation before mr carlyle replied i am afraid so now it is fixed he said to you max it will be ridiculous or incomprehensible that a third to dinner and he only a middle-aged uncle should make a straw of difference but i know that in their bijou way it will be a little domestic event to elsie an added anxiety in giving the butcher an order an extra course for dinner perhaps a careful drilling of the one diminutive maid-servant and she is such a charming little woman eh who max no no i did not say the maid-servant if i did it is the fault of this telephone elsie is such a delightful little creature that upon my soul it would be too bad to fail her now of course it would you old humbug agreed carrados with sympathetic laughter in his voice well come to-morrow instead i shall be alone oh besides there is a special reason for going which for the moment i forgot explained mr carlyle after accepting the invitation elsie wishes for my advice with regard to her next-door neighbour he is an elderly man of retiring disposition and he makes a practice of throwing kidneys over into her garden kittens throwing kittens no no max kidneys stewed k-i-d-n-e-y-s it is a little difficult to explain plausibly over a badly vibrating telephone i admit but that is what elsie's letter assured me and she adds that she is in despair at all events it makes the lady quite independent of the butcher lewis i have no further particulars max it may be a solitary diurnal offering or the sky may at times appear to rain kidneys if it is a mania the symptoms may even have become more pronounced and the man is possibly showering beefsteaks across by this time i will make full inquiry and let you know do assented carrados in the same light-hearted spirit mrs nickleby's neighbourly admirer expressed his feelings by throwing cucumbers you remember but this man puts him completely in the shade it had not got beyond the proportions of a jest to either of them when they rang off one of those whimsical occurrences in real life that sound so fantastic in outline carrados did not give the matter another thought until the next evening when his friend's arrival revived the subject and the gentleman next door he inquired among his greetings did the customary offering arrive while you were there no admitted mr carlyle beaming pleasantly upon all the familiar appointments of the room it did not max in fact so diffident has the mysterious philanthropist become that no one at fountain cottage has been able to catch sight of him lately although i am told that scamp elsie's terrier betrays a very self-conscious guilt and suspiciously muddy paws every morning fountain cottage that is the name of the toy villa 
yes but fountain something groats heath fountain court wasn't that where metrobe yes yes to be sure max metrobe the traveller the writer and scientist scientist well he took up spiritualism or something didn't he at any rate he lived at fountain court an old red brick house in a large neglected garden there until his death a couple of years ago then as groats heath had suddenly become a popular suburb with a tube railway a land company acquired the estate the house was razed to the ground and in a twinkling a colony of noah's ark villas took its place there is metrobe road here and court crescent there and mansion drive and what not and elsie's little place perpetuates another landmark i have metrobe's last book here said carrados nodding towards a point on his shelves in fact he sent me a copy the flame beyond the dome it is called the queerest farrago of balderdash and metaphysics imaginable but what about the neighbour lewis did you settle what we might almost term his hash oh he is mad of course i advised her to make as little fuss about it as possible seeing that the man lives next door and might become objectionable but i framed a note for her to send which will probably have a good effect is he mad lewis well i don't say that he is strictly a lunatic but there is obviously a screw loose somewhere he may carry indiscriminate benevolence towards yorkshire terriers to irrational lengths or he may be a food specialist with a grievance in effect he is mad on at least that one point how else are we to account for the circumstances i was wondering replied carrados thoughtfully you suggest that he really may have a sane object i suggest it for the sake of argument if he has a sane object what is it that i leave to you max retorted mr carlyle conclusively if he has a sane object pray what is it for the sake of the argument i will tell you that in half a dozen words lewis replied carrados with good-humoured tolerance if he is not mad in the sense which you have defined the answer stares us in the face his object is precisely that which he is achieving mr carlyle looked inquiringly into the placid unemotional face of his blind friend as if to read there whether incredible as it might seem max should be taking the thing seriously after all and what is that he asked cautiously in the first place he has produced the impression that he is eccentric or irresponsible that is sometimes useful in itself then what else has he done what else max replied mr carlyle with some indignation well whatever he wishes to achieve by it i can tell you one thing else that he has done he has so demoralized scamp with his confounded kidneys that elsie's neatly arranged flower beds and she took fountain cottage principally on account of an unusually large garden are hopelessly devastated if she keeps the dog up the garden is invaded night and day by an army of peregrinating feline marauders that scent the booty from afar he has gained the everlasting annoyance of an otherwise charming neighbour max can you tell me what he has achieved by that the everlasting esteem of scamp probably is he a good watchdog lewis good heavens max exclaimed mr carlyle coming to his feet as though he had the intention of setting out for groats heath then and there is it possible that he is planning a burglary do they keep much of value about the house no admitted mr carlyle sitting down again with considerable relief no they don't bellmark is not particularly well endowed with worldly goods in fact between ourselves max elsie could have done very much better from a strictly social point of view but he is a thoroughly good fellow and idolizes her they have no silver worth speaking of and for the rest well just the ordinary petty cash of a frugal young couple then he probably is not planning a burglary i confess the idea did not appeal to me if it is only that why should he go to the trouble of preparing this particular succulent dish to throw over his neighbour's ground when cold liver would do quite as well if it is not only that why should he go to the trouble max because by the bait he produces the greatest disturbance of your niece's garden and if sane why should he wish to do that because in those conditions he can the more easily obliterate his own traces if he trespasses there at nights well upon my word that's drawing a bow at a venture max if it isn't burglary what motive could the man have for any such nocturnal perambulation an expression of suave mischief came into carrados's usually imperturbable face 
many imaginable motives surely louis you are a man of the world why not to meet a charming little woman no by gad exclaimed the vandalized uncle warmly i decline to consider the remotest possibility of that explanation elsie certainly not interposed carrados smothering his quiet laughter the maid-servant of course mr carlyle reined in his indignation and recovered himself with his usual adroitness but you know that is an atrocious libel max he added i never said such a thing however is it probable no admitted carrados i don't think that in the circumstances it is at all probable then where are we max a little further than we were at the beginning very little are you willing to give me a roving commission to investigate of course max of course assented mr carlyle heartily i well as far as i was concerned regarded the matter as settled carrados turned to his desk and the ghost of a smile might possibly have lurked about his face he produced some stationery and indicated it to his visitor you don't mind giving me a line of introduction to your niece pleasure murmured carlyle taking up a pen what shall i say carrados took the inquiry in its most literal sense and for reply he dictated the following letter my dear elsie if that is the way you usually address her he parenthesized quite so acquiesced mr carlyle writing the bearer of this is mr carrados of whom i have spoken to you you have spoken of me to her i trust louis he put in i believe that i have casually referred to you admitted the writer i felt sure that you would have done it makes the rest easier he is not in the least mad although he frequently does things which to the uninitiated appear more or less eccentric at the moment i think that you would be quite safe in complying with any suggestion he may make your affectionate uncle louis carlyle he accepted the envelope and put it away in a pocket-book that always seemed extraordinarily thin for the amount of papers it contained i may call there to-morrow he added neither again referred to the subject during the evening but when parkinson came to the library a couple of hours after midnight to know whether he would be required again he found his master rather deeply immersed in a book and a gap on the shelf where the flame beyond the dome had formerly stood it is not impossible that mr carlyle supplemented his brief note of introduction with a more detailed communication that reached his niece by the ordinary postal service at an earlier hour than the other at all events when mr carrados presented himself at the toy villa on the following afternoon he found elsie bellmark suspiciously disposed to accept him and his rather gratuitous intervention among her suburban troubles as a matter of course when the car drew up at the bright green wooden gate of fountain cottage another visitor apparently a good class working man was standing on the path of the trim front garden lingering over a reluctant departure carrados took sufficient time in alighting to allow the man to pass through the gate before he himself entered the last exchange of sentences reached his ear i'm sure marm you won't find anyone to do the work at less i can quite believe that replied a very fair young lady who stood nearer the house but you see we do all the gardening ourselves thank you carrados made himself known and was taken into the daintily pretty drawing-room that opened on to the lawn behind the house i do not need to ask if you are mrs bellmark he had declared i have uncle louis's voice she divined readily the niece of his voice so to speak he admitted voices mean a great deal to me mrs bellmark in recognizing and identifying people she suggested oh very much more than that in recognizing and identifying their moods their thoughts even there are subtle lines of trouble and the deep rings of anxious care quite as patent to the ear as to the sharpest eye sometimes elsie bellmark shot a glance of curiously interested speculation to the face that in spite of its frank open bearing revealed so marvellously little of itself if i had any dreadful secret i think that i should be a little afraid to talk to you mr carrados she said with a half nervous laugh then please do not have any dreadful secret he replied with quite youthful gallantry i more than suspect that louis has given you a very transpontine idea of my tastes i do not spend all my time tracking murderers to their lairs mrs bellmark and i have never yet engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter with a band of cutthroats he told us she declared the recital lifting her voice into a tone that carrados vowed to himself was wonderfully thrilling about this 
he said that you were once in a sort of lonely underground cellar near the river with two desperate men whom you could send to penal servitude the police who were to have been there at a certain time had not arrived and you were alone the men had heard that you were blind but they could hardly believe it they were discussing in whispers which could not be overheard what would be the best thing to do and they had just agreed that if you really were blind they would risk the attempt to murder you then lewis said at that very moment you took a pair of scissors from your pocket and coolly asked them why they did not have a lamp down there you actually snuffed the candle that stood on the table before you is that true carrados's mind leapt vividly back to the most desperate moment of his existence but his smile was gently deprecating as he replied i seem to recognize the touch of truth in the inclination to do anything other than fight he confessed but although he never suspects it lewis really sees life through rose-coloured opera glasses take the case of your quite commonplace neighbour that is really what you came about she interposed shrewdly frankly it is he replied i am more attracted by a turn of the odd and grotesque than by the most elaborate tragedy the fantastic conceit of throwing stewed kidneys over into a neighbour's garden irresistibly appealed to me lewis as i was saying regards the man in the romantic light of a humanitarian monomaniac or a demented food reformer i take a more subdued view and i think that his action when rightly understood will prove to be something quite obviously natural of course it is very ridiculous but all the same it has been desperately annoying she confessed still it scarcely matters now i am only sorry that it should have been the cause of wasting your valuable time mr carrados my valuable time he replied only seems valuable to me when i am as you would say wasting it but is the incident closed lewis told me that he had drafted you a letter of remonstrance may i ask if it has been effective instead of replying at once she got up and walked to the long french window and looked out over the garden where the fruit trees that had been spared from the older cultivation were rejoicing the eye with the promise of their pink and white profusion i did not send it she said slowly turning to her visitor again there is something that i did not tell uncle lewis because it would only have distressed him without doing any good we may be leaving here very soon just when you had begun to get it well in hand he said in some surprise it is a pity is it not but one cannot foresee these things there is no reason why you should not know the cause since you have interested yourself so far mr carrados in fact she added smiling away the seriousness of the matter into which she had fallen i am not at all sure that you do not know already he shook his head and disclaimed any such prescience at all events you recognize that i was not exactly light-hearted she insisted oh you did not say that i had dark rings under my eyes i know but the cap fitted excellently it has to do with my husband's business he is with a firm of architects it was a little venturesome taking this house we had been in apartments for two years but roy was doing so well with his people and i was so enthusiastic for a garden that we did scarcely two months ago everything seemed quite assured then came this thunderbolt the partners it is only a small firm mr carrados required a little more capital in the business someone whom they know is willing to put in two thousand pounds but he stipulates for a post with them as well he like my husband is a draughtsman there is no need for the services of both and so is it settled in effect it is they are as nice as can be about it but that does not alter the facts they declare that they would rather have roy than the new man and they have definitely offered to retain him if he can bring even one thousand pounds i suppose they have some sort of compunction about turning him adrift for they have asked him to think it over and let them know on monday of course that is the end of it it may be i don't know i don't like to think how long before roy gets another position equally good we must endeavour to get this house off our hands and creep back to our three rooms it is luck carrados had been listening to her wonderfully musical voice as another man might have been drawn irresistibly to watch the piquant charm of her delicate face yes he assented almost to himself it is that strange inexplicable grouping of men and things that under one name or another we all confess just luck of course you will not mention this to uncle lewis yet mr carrados if you do not wish it certainly not i am sure that it would distress him he is so soft-hearted so kind in everything do you know i found out that he had had an invitation to dine somewhere and meet some quite important people on tuesday 
yet he came here instead although most other men would have cried off just because he knew that we small people would have been disappointed well you can't expect me to see any self-denial in that exclaimed carrados why i was one of them myself elsie bellmark laughed outright at the expressive disgust of his tone i had no idea of that she said then there is another reason uncle is not very well off yet if he knew how roy was situated he would make an effort to arrange matters he would i am sure even borrow himself in order to lend us the money that is a thing roy and i are quite agreed on we will go back we will go under if it is to be but we will not borrow money not even from uncle lewis once subsequently carrados suddenly asked mr carlyle whether he had ever heard a woman's voice roll like a celestial kettle drum the professional gentleman was vastly amused by the comparison but he admitted that he had not so that you see concluded mrs bellmark there is really nothing to be done oh quite so i am sure that you are right assented her visitor readily but in the meantime i do not see why the annoyance of your next-door neighbour should be permitted to go on of course i have not told you that and i could not explain it to uncle she said i am anxious not to do anything to put him out because i have a hope rather a faint one certainly that the man may be willing to take over this house it would be incorrect to say that carrados pricked up his ears if that curious phenomenon has any physical manifestation for the sympathetic expression of his face did not vary a fraction but into his mind there came a gleam such as might inspire a patient digger who sees the first speck of gold that justifies his faith in an unlikely claim oh he said quite conversationally is there a chance of that he undoubtedly did want it it is very curious in a way a few weeks ago before we were really settled he came one afternoon saying he had heard that this house was to be let of course i told him that he was too late that we had already taken it for three years you were the first tenants yes the house was scarcely ready when we signed the agreement then this mr johns or jones i am not sure which he said went on in a rather extraordinary way to persuade me to sublet it to him he said that the house was dear and i could get plenty more convenient at less rent and it was unhealthy and the drains were bad and that we should be pestered by tramps and it was just the sort of house that burglars picked on only he had taken a sort of fancy to it and he would give me a fifty pound premium for the term did he explain the motive for his rather eccentric partiality i don't imagine that he did he repeated several times that he was a queer old fellow with his whims and fancies and that they often cost him dear i think we all know that sort of old fellow said carrados it must have been rather entertaining for you mrs bellmark yes i suppose it was she admitted the next thing we knew of him was that he had taken the other house as soon as it was finished then he would scarcely require this i am afraid not it was obvious that the situation was not disposed of but he seems to have so little furniture there and to live so solitarily she explained that we have even wondered whether he might not be there merely as a sort of caretaker and you have never heard where he came from or who he is only what the milkman told my servant our chief source of local information mr carrados he declares that the man used to be the butler at a large house that stood here formerly fountain court and that his name is neither johns nor jones but very likely it is all a mistake if not he is certainly attached to the soil was her visitor's rejoinder and apropos of that will you show me over your garden before i go mrs bellmark with pleasure she assented rising also i will ring now and then i can offer you tea when we have been round that is if you thank you i do he replied and would you allow my man to go through into the garden in case i require him oh certainly you must tell me just what you want without thinking it necessary to ask permission mr carrados she said with a pretty air of protection shall amy take a message he acquiesced and turned to the servant who had appeared in response to the bell will you go to the car and tell my man parkinson that i require him here say that he can bring his book he will understand yes sir they stepped out through the french window and sauntered across the lawn before they had reached the other side parkinson reported himself you had better stay here said his master indicating the sward generally mrs bellmark will allow you to bring out a chair from the drawing-room thank you sir there is a rustic seat already provided replied parkinson 
he sat down with his back to the houses and opened the book that he had brought let in among its pages was an ingeniously contrived mirror when their promenade again brought them near the rustic seat carrados dropped a few steps behind he is watching you from one of the upper rooms sir fell from parkinson's lips as he sat there without raising his eyes from the page before him the blind man caught up to his hostess again you intended this lawn for croquet he asked no not specially it is too small isn't it not necessarily i think it is in about the proportion of four by five all right given that size does not really matter for an unsophisticated game to settle the point he began to pace the plot of ground across and then lengthwise next apparently dissatisfied with his rough measurement he applied himself to marking it off more exactly by means of his walking stick elsie bellmark was by no means dull but the action sprang so naturally from the conversation that it did not occur to her to look for any deeper motive he has got a pair of field glasses and is now at the window communicated parkinson i am going out of sight was the equally quiet response if he becomes more anxious tell me afterwards it is quite all right he reported returning to mrs bellmark with the satisfaction of bringing agreeable news it should make a splendid little ground but you may have to level up a few dips after the earth has set a chance reference to the kitchen garden by the visitor took them to a more distant corner of the enclosure where the rear of fountain cottage cut off the view from the next house windows we decided on this part for vegetables because it does not really belong to the garden proper she explained when they build farther on this side we shall have to give it up very soon and it would be a pity if it was all in flowers with the admirable spirit of the ordinary englishwoman she spoke of the future as if there was no cloud to obscure its prosperous course she had frankly declared their position to her uncle's best friend because in the circumstances it had seemed to be the simplest and most straightforward thing to do beyond that there was no need to whine about it it is a large garden remarked carrados and you really do all the work of it yourselves yes i think that is half the fun of a garden roy is out here early and late and he does all the hard work but how did you know did uncle tell you no you told me yourself i really indirectly you were scorning the proffered services of a horticultural mercenary at the moment of my arrival oh i remember she laughed it was irons of course he is a great nuisance he is so stupidly persistent for some weeks now he has been coming time after time trying to persuade me to engage him once when we were all out he had actually got into the garden and was on the point of beginning work when i returned he said that he saw the milkman and the grocers leaving samples at the door so he thought that he would too a practical jester evidently is mr irons a local character he said that he knew the ground and the conditions round about here better than anyone else in groats heath she replied modesty is not among mr irons's handicaps he said that he how curious what is mrs bellmark i never connected the two men before but he said that he had been gardener at fountain court for seven years another family retainer who is evidently attached to the soil at all events they have not prospered equally for while mr john seems able to take a nice house poor irons is willing to work for half a crown a day and i am told that all the other men charge four shillings they had paced the boundaries of the kitchen garden and as there was nothing more to be shown elsie bellmark led the way back to the drawing-room parkinson was still engrossed in his book the only change being that his back was now turned towards the high paling of clinker-built oak that separated the two gardens i will speak to my man said carrados turning aside he hurried down and is looking through the fence sir reported the watcher that will do then you can return to the car i wonder if you would allow me to send you a small hawthorn tree inquired carrados among his felicitations over the teacups five minutes later i think it ought to be in every garden thank you but is it worth while replied mrs bellmark with a touch of restraint as far as mere words went she had been willing to ignore the menace of the future but in the circumstances the offer seemed singularly inept and she began to suspect that outside his peculiar gifts the wonderful mr carrados might be a little bit obtuse after all yes i think it is he replied with quiet assurance in spite of 
i am not forgetting that unless your husband is prepared on monday next to invest one thousand pounds you contemplate leaving here then i do not understand it mr carrados and i am unable to explain as yet but i brought you a note from lewis carlyle mrs bellmark you only glanced at it will you do me the favour of reading me the last paragraph she picked up the letter from the table where it lay and complied with cheerful good humour there is some suggestion that you want me to accede to she guessed cunningly when she had read the last few words there are some three suggestions which i hope you will accede to he replied in the first place i want you to write to mr johns next door let him get the letter to-night inquiring whether he is still disposed to take this house i had thought of doing that shortly then that is all right besides he will ultimately decline oh she exclaimed it would be very difficult to say whether with relief or disappointment do you think so then why to keep him quiet in the meantime next i should like you to send a little note to mr irons your maid could deliver it also to-night i dare say irons irons the gardener yes apologetically only a line or two you know just saying that after all if he cares to come on monday you can find him a few days work but in any circumstances i don't want him no i can quite believe that you could do better still it doesn't matter as he won't come mrs bellmark not for half a crown a day believe me but the thought will tend to make mr irons less restive also lastly will you persuade your husband not to decline his firm's offer until monday very well mr carrados she said after a moment's consideration you are uncle lewis's friend and therefore our friend i will do what you ask thank you said carrados i shall endeavour not to disappoint you i shall not be disappointed because i have not dared to hope and i have nothing to expect because i am still completely in the dark i have been there for nearly twenty years mrs bellmark oh i am sorry she cried impulsively so am i occasionally he replied good-bye mrs bellmark you will hear from me shortly i hope about the hawthorn you know it was indeed in something less than forty-eight hours that she heard from him again when bellmark returned to his toy villa early on saturday afternoon elsie met him almost at the gate with a telegram in her hand i really think roy that every one we have to do with here goes mad she exclaimed in tragi-humorous despair first it was mr johns or jones if he is johns or jones and then irons who wanted to work here for half of what he could get at heaps of places about and now just look at this wire that came from mr carrados half an hour ago this was the message that he read please procure sardine tin opener mariner's compass and bottle of champagne shall arrive six forty five bringing cretaceous cochinia carrados could anything be more absurd she demanded sounds as though it was in code speculated her husband who's the foreign gentleman he's bringing oh that's a kind of special hawthorn i looked it up but a bottle of champagne and a compass and a sardine tin opener what possible connection is there between them a very resourceful man might uncork a bottle of champagne with a sardine tin opener he suggested and find his way home afterwards by means of a mariner's compass she retorted no ray dear you are not a sleuth hound we had better have our lunch they lunched but if the subject of carrados had been tabooed the meal would have been a silent one i have a compass on an old watch chain somewhere volunteered bellmark and i have a tin opener in the form of a bull's head contributed elsie but we have no champagne i suppose how could we have roy we never have had any shall you mind going down to the shops for a bottle you really think that we ought of course we must roy we don't know what mightn't happen if we didn't uncle lewis said that they once failed to stop a jewelry robbery because the jeweller neglected to wipe his shoes on the shop doormat as mr carrados had told him to do suppose johns is a desperate anarchist and he succeeded in blowing up buckingham palace because we all right a small bottle eh no a large one quite a large one don't you see how exciting it is becoming if you are excited already you don't need much champagne argued her husband nevertheless he strolled down to the leading wine shop after lunch and returned with his purchase modestly draped in the light summer overcoat that he carried on his arm elsie bellmark who had quite abandoned her previous unconcern in the conviction that something was going to happen spent the longest afternoon that she could remember 
and even bellmark in spite of his continual adjurations to her to look at the matter logically smoked five cigarettes in place of his usual saturday afternoon pipe and neglected to do any gardening at exactly six forty five a motor car was heard approaching elsie made a desperate rally to become the self-possessed hostess again bellmark was favourably impressed by such marked punctuality then a regent street delivery van bowled past their window and elsie almost wept the suspense was not long however less than five minutes later another vehicle raised the dust of the quiet suburban road and this time a private car stopped at their gate can you see any policemen inside whispered elsie parkinson got down and opening the door took out a small tree which he carried up to the porch and there deposited carrados followed at all events there isn't much wrong said bellmark he's smiling all the time no it isn't really a smile explained elsie it's his normal expression she went out into the hall just as the front door was opened it is the scarlet fruited thorn of north america bellmark heard the visitor remarking both the flowers and the berries are wonderfully good do you think that you would permit me to choose the spot for it mrs bellmark bellmark joined them in the hall and was introduced we mustn't waste any time he suggested there is very little light left true agreed carrados and cosenia requires deep digging they walked through the house and turning to the right passed into the region of the vegetable garden carrados and elsie led the way the blind man carrying the tree while bellmark went to his outhouse for the required tools we will direct our operations from here said carrados when they were halfway along the walk you told me of a thin iron pipe that you had traced to somewhere in the middle of the garden we must locate the end of it exactly my rosary sighed elsie with premonition of disaster when she had determined the spot as exactly as she could oh mr carrados i am sorry but it might be worse said carrados inflexibly we only require to find the elbow joint mr bellmark will investigate with as little disturbance as possible for five minutes bellmark made trials with a pointed iron then he cleared away the soil of a small circle and at about a foot deep exposed a broken inch pipe the fountain announced carrados when he had examined it you have the compass mr bellmark rather a small one admitted bellmark never mind you are a mathematician i want you to strike a line due east the reel and cord came into play and an adjustment was finally made from the broken pipe to a position across the vegetable garden now a point nine yards nine feet and nine inches along it my onion bed cried elsie tragically yes it is really serious this time agreed carrados i want a hole a yard across digging here may we proceed elsie remembered the words of her uncle's letter or what she imagined to be his letter and possibly the preamble of selecting the spot had impressed her yes i suppose so unless she added hopefully the turnip bed will do instead they are not sown yet i am afraid that nowhere else in the garden will do replied carrados bellmark delineated the space and began to dig after clearing to about a foot deep he paused about deep enough mr carrados he inquired oh dear no replied the blind man i am two feet down presently reported the digger deeper was the uncompromising response another six inches were added and bellmark stopped to rest a little more and it won't matter which way up we plant cassania he remarked that is the depth we are aiming for replied carrados elsie and her husband exchanged glances then bellmark drove his spade through another layer of earth three feet he announced when he had cleared it carrados advanced to the very edge of the opening i think that if you would loosen another six inches with the fork we might consider the ground prepared he decided bellmark changed his tools and began to break up the soil presently the steel prongs grated on some obstruction gently directed the blind watcher i think you will find a half-pound cocoa tin at the end of your fork well how on earth you spotted that was wrung from bellmark admiringly as he cleared away the encrusting earth but i believe you are about right he threw up the object to his wife who was risking a catastrophe in her eagerness to miss no detail anything in it besides soil elsie she cannot open it yet remarked carrados it is soldered down 
oh i say protested bellmark it is perfectly correct roy the lid is soldered on they looked at each other in varying degrees of wonder and speculation only carrados seemed quite untouched now we may as well replace the earth he remarked fill it all up again asked bellmark yes we have provided a thoroughly disintegrated subsoil that is a great thing a depth of six inches is sufficient merely for the roots there was only one remark passed during the operation i think i should plant the tree just over where the tin was carrados suggested you might like to mark the exact spot and there the hawthorn was placed bellmark usually the most careful and methodical of men left the tools where they were in spite of a threatening shower strangely silent elsie led the way back to the house and taking the men into the drawing-room switched on the light i think you have a tin opener mrs bellmark elsie who had been waiting for him to speak almost jumped at the simple inquiry then she went into the next room and returned with the bull-headed utensil here it is she said in a voice that would have amused her at any other time mr bellmark will perhaps disclose our find bellmark put the soily tin down on elsie's best table cover without eliciting a word of reproach grasped it firmly with his left hand and worked the opener around the top only paper he exclaimed and without touching the contents he passed the tin into carrados's hands the blind man dexterously twirled out a little roll that crinkled pleasantly to the ear and began counting the leaves with a steady finger they're banknotes whispered elsie in an awestruck voice she caught sight of a further detail banknotes for a hundred pounds each and there are dozens of them fifty there should be dropped carrados between his figures twenty-five twenty-six good god murmured bellmark that's five thousand pounds fifty concluded carrados straightening the edges of the sheaf it is always satisfactory to find that one's calculations are exact he detached the upper ten notes and held them out mrs bellmark will you accept one thousand pounds as a full legal discharge of any claim that you may have on this property me i she stammered but i have no right to any in any circumstances it has nothing to do with us you have an unassailable moral right to a fair proportion because without you the real owners would never have seen a penny of it as regards your legal right he took out the thin pocket-book and extracting a business-looking paper spread it open on the table before them here is a document that concedes it in consideration of the valuable services rendered by elsie bellmark etc etc in causing to be discovered and voluntarily surrendering the sum of five thousand pounds deposited and not relinquished by alexis metrobe late of etc etc deceased messrs binstead and polgate solicitors of seventy seven a bedford row acting on behalf of the administrator and next of kin of the said etc etc do hereby well that's what they do signed witnessed and stamped at somerset house i suppose i shall wake presently said elsie dreamily it was for this moment that i ventured to suggest the third requirement necessary to bring our enterprise to a successful end said carrados oh how thoughtful of you cried elsie roy the champagne five minutes later carrados was explaining to a small but enthralled audience the late alexis metrobe was a man of peculiar character after seeing a good deal of the world and being many things he finally embraced spiritualism and in common with some of its most pronounced adherents he thenceforward abandoned what we should call the common-sense view a few years ago by the collation of the book of revelations a set of zadkiel's almanacs and the complete works of mrs mary baker eddy metrobe discovered that the end of the world would take place on the tenth of october nineteen ten it therefore became a matter of urgent importance in his mind to ensure pecuniary provision for himself for the time after the catastrophe had taken place i don't understand interrupted elsie did he expect to survive it you cannot understand mrs bellmark because it is fundamentally incomprehensible we can only accept the fact by the light of cases which occasionally obtain prominence metrobe did not expect to survive but he was firmly convinced that the currency of this world would be equally as useful in this spirit land into which he expected to pass this view was encouraged by a lady medium at whose feet he sat she kindly offered to transmit to his banking account in the hereafter without making any charge whatever 
any sum he cared to put into her hands for the purpose metrobe accepted the idea but not the offer his plan was to deposit a considerable amount in a spot of which he alone had knowledge so that he could come and help himself to it as required but if the world had come to an end only the material world you must understand mrs bellmark the spirit world its exact impalpable counterpart would continue as before and metrobe's hoard would be spiritually intact and available that is the prologue about a month ago there appeared a certain advertisement in a good many papers i noticed it at the time and three days ago i had only to refer to my files to put my hand on it at once it reads alexis metrobe any servant or personal attendant of the late alexis metrobe of fountain court groats heath possessing special knowledge of his habits and movements may hear of something advantageous on applying to binstead and polegate seventy seven a bedford row w c the solicitors had in fact discovered that five thousand pounds worth of securities had been realized early in nineteen ten they readily ascertained that metrobe had drawn that amount in gold out of his bank immediately after and there the trace ended he died six months later there was no hoard of gold and not a shred of paper to show where it had gone yet metrobe had lived very simply within his income the house had meanwhile been demolished but there was no hint or whisper of any lucky find two inquirers presented themselves at seventy seven a bedford row they were informed of the circumstances and offered a reward varying according to the results for information that would lead to the recovery of the money they were both described as thoughtful slow-spoken men each heard the story shook his head and departed the first caller proved to be john foster the ex-butler on the following day mr irons formerly gardener at the court was the applicant i must now divert your attention into a side-track in the summer of nineteen ten metrobe published a curious work entitled the flame beyond the dome in the main it is an eschatological treatise but at the end he tacked on an epilogue which he called the fable of the chameleon it is even more curious than the rest and with reason for under the guise of a speculative essay he gives a cryptic account of the circumstances of the five thousand pounds and what is more important details the exact particulars of its disposal his reason for so doing is characteristic of the man he was conscious by experience that he possessed an utterly treacherous memory and having had occasion to move the treasure from one spot to another he feared that when the time came his bemuddled shade would be unable to locate it for future reference therefore he embodied the details in his book and to make sure that plenty of copies should be in existence he circulated it by the only means in his power in other words he gave a volume to everyone he knew and to a good many people whom he didn't so far i have dealt with actualities the final details are partly speculative but they are essentially correct metrobe conveyed his gold to fountain court obtained a stout oak coffer for it and selected a spot west of the fountain he chose a favourable occasion for burying it but by some mischance irons came on the scene metrobe explained the incident by declaring that he was burying a favourite parrot irons thought nothing particular about it then although he related the fact to the butler and to others in evidence of the general belief that the old cock was quite barmy but metrobe himself was much disturbed by the accident a few days later he dug up the box in pursuance of his new plan he carried his gold to the bank of england and changed it into these notes then transforming the venue to one due east of the fountain he buried them in his tin satisfied that the small space it occupied would baffle the search of any one not in possession of the exact location but i say exclaimed mr bellmark gold might remain gold but what imaginable use could be made of banknotes after the end of the world that is a point of view no doubt but metrobe in spite of his foreign name was a thorough englishman the world might come to an end but he was satisfied that somehow the bank of england would ride through it all right i only suggest that there is much that we can only guess that is all there is to know mr carrados yes everything comes to an end mrs bellmark i sent my car away to call for me at eight eight has struck that is harris announcing his arrival he stood up but embarrassment and indecision marked the looks and movements of the other two 
how can we possibly take all this money though murmured elsie in painful uncertainty it is certainly your undertaking mr carrados it is the merest fiction bringing me into it at all perhaps in the circumstances suggested bellmark nervously you remember the circumstances elsie mr carrados would be willing to regard it as a loan no no cried elsie impulsively there must be no half measures we know that a thousand pounds would be nothing to mr carrados and he knows that a thousand pounds are everything to us her voice reminded the blind man of the candle snuffing recital we will take this great gift mr carrados quite freely and we will not spoil the generous satisfaction that you must have in doing a wonderful and a splendid service by trying to hedge our obligation but what can we ever do to thank mr carrados faltered bellmark mundanely nothing said elsie simply that is it but i think that mrs bellmark has quite solved that interposed carrados end of section seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 8 of Max Carrados by Ernest Brahma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. The Game Played in the Dark. It's a funny thing, sir, said Inspector Beetle, regarding Mr. Carrados with the pensive respect that he always extended towards the blind amateur. It's a funny thing but nothing seems to go on abroad now but what you'll find some trace of it here in london if you take the trouble to look in the right quarter contributed carrados why yes agreed the inspector but nothing comes of it nine times out of ten because it's no one's particular business to look here or the thing's been taken up and finished from the other end i don't mean ordinary murders or single-handed burglaries of course but a modest ring of professional pride betrayed the quiet enthusiast real first-class crimes the state antonio five per cent bond coupons suggested carrados ah you are right mr carrados beetle shook his head sadly as though perhaps on that occasion someone ought to have looked a man has a fit in the inquiry office of the agent-general for british equatoria and two hundred and fifty thousand pounds worth of faked securities is the result in mexico then look at that jade file fought charm pawned for one and three down at the basin and the use that could have been made of it in the kharkov ritual murder trial the west hampstead lost memory puzzle and the barapur bomb conspiracy that might have been smothered if one had known quite true sir and the three children of that chicago millionaire cyrus v bunting wasn't it kidnapped in broad daylight outside the new york lyric and here three weeks later the dumb girl who chalked the wall at charing cross i remember reading once in a financial article that every piece of foreign gold had a string from it leading to threadneedle street a figure of speech sir of course but apt enough i don't doubt well it seems to me that every big crime done abroad leaves a fingerprint here in london if only as you say we look in the right quarter and at the right moment added carrados the time is often the present the place the spot beneath our very noses we take a step and the chance has gone forever the inspector nodded and contributed a weighty monosyllable of sympathetic agreement the most prosaic of men in the pursuit of his ordinary duties it nevertheless subtly appealed to some half dormant streak of vanity to have his profession taken romantically when there was no serious work on hand no perhaps not for ever in one case in a thousand after all amended the blind man thoughtfully this perpetual duel between the law and the criminal has sometimes appeared to me in the terms of a game of cricket inspector law is in the field the criminal at the wicket if law makes a mistake sends down a loose ball or drops a catch the criminal scores a little or has another lease of life but if he makes a mistake if he lets a straight ball pass or spoons toward a steady man he is done for his mistakes are fatal those of the law are only temporary and retrievable very good sir said beetle rising the conversation had taken place in the study at the turrets where beetle had found occasion to present himself very apt indeed 
i must remember that well sir i only hope that this guido the razor lot will send a catch in our direction the this delicately marked inspector beadle's instinctive contempt for guido as a craftsman he was compelled on his reputation to respect him and he had accordingly availed himself of carrados's friendship for a confabulation as a man he was a foreigner worse an italian and if left to his own resources the inspector would have opposed to his sinuous flexibility those rigid essentially britannia metal methods of the force that strike the impartial observer as so ponderous so amateurish and conventional and it must be admitted often so curiously and inexplicably successful the offence that had circuitously brought il rosajo and his lot within the cognizance of scotland yard outlines the kind of story that is discreetly hinted at by the society paragraphist of the day politely disbelieved by the astute reader and then at last laid indiscreetly bare in all its details by the inevitable princessly recollections of a generation later it centred round an impending royal marriage in vienna a certain jealous countess x here you have the discretion of the paragrapher and a document or two that might be relied upon the aristocratic biographer will impartially sum up the contingencies to play the deuce with the approaching nuptials to procure the evidence of these papers the countess enlisted the services of guido as reliable a scoundrel as she could probably have selected for the commission to a certain point to the abstraction of the papers in fact he succeeded but it was with pursuit close upon his heels there was that disadvantage in employing a rogue to do work that implicated roguery for whatever moral right the countess had to the property her accomplice had no legal right whatever to his liberty on half a dozen charges at least he could be arrested on sight in as many capitals of europe he slipped out of vienna by the norbon with his destination unknown resourcefully stopped the express outside saslau and got away across the crudim by this time the game and the moves were pretty well understood in more than one keenly interested quarter diplomacy supplemented justice and the immediate history of guido became that of a fox hunted from covert to covert with all the familiar earths stopped against him from the pardubitz he passed on to glatz reached breslau and went down the odor to stettin out of the liberality of his employer's advances he had ample funds to keep going and he dropped and rejoined his accomplices as the occasion ruled a week's harrying found him in copenhagen still with no time to spare and he missed his purpose there he crossed to malmo by ferry took the connecting night train to stockholm and the same morning sailed down the saltsjohn ostensibly bound for obo intending to cross the revel and so get back to central europe by the less frequented routes but in this move again luck was against him and receiving warning just in time and by the mysterious agency that had so far protected him he contrived to be dropped from the steamer by boat among the islands of the crowded archipelago made his way to helsingfors and within forty-eight hours was back again on the frihavenen with pursuit for the moment blinked and a breathing time to the good to appreciate the exact significance of these wanderings it is necessary to recall the conditions guido was not zigzagging a course about europe in an aimless search for the picturesque still less inspired by any love of the melodramatic to him every step was vital each tangent or rebound the necessary outcome of his much badgered plans in his pocket reposed the papers for which he had run grave risks the price agreed upon for the service was sufficiently lavish to make the risks worth taking time after time but in order to consummate the transaction it was necessary that the booty should be put into his employer's hand halfway across europe that employer was waiting with such patience as she could maintain herself watched and shadowed at every step the countess x was sufficiently exalted to be personally immune from the right-handed methods of her country's secret service but every approach to her was tapped the problem was for guido to earn a long enough respite to enable him to communicate his position to the countess and for her to go or to reach him by a trusty hand then the whole fabric of intrigue could fall to pieces but so far guido had been kept successfully on the run and in the meanwhile time was pressing 
they lost him after the hutola beetle reported in explaining the circumstances to max carrados three days later they found that he'd been back again in copenhagen but by that time he'd flown now they're without a trace except the inference of these orange peach blossom agonies in the times but the countess has gone hurriedly to paris and lafayard thinks it all points to london i suppose the foreign office is anxious to oblige just now i expect so sir agreed beetle but of course my instructions don't come from that quarter what appeals to us is that it would be a feather in our caps they're still a little sore up at the yard about hans the piper naturally assented carrados well i'll see what i can do if there is real occasion let me know anything and if you see your chance yourself come round for a talk if you like on today's wednesday i shall be in at any rate on friday evening without being a precisian the blind man was usually exact in such matters there are those who hold that an engagement must be kept at all hazard men who would miss a deathbed message in order to keep literal faith with a beggar carrados took lower if more substantial ground my word he sometimes had occasion to remark is subject to contingencies like everything else about me if i make a promise it is conditional on nothing which seems more important arising to counteract it that among men of sense is understood and as it happened something did occur on this occasion he was summoned to the telephone just before dinner on friday evening to receive a message personally greatorex his secretary had taken the call but came in to say that the caller would give him nothing beyond his name brebner the name was unknown to carrados but such incidents were not uncommon and he proceeded to comply yes he responded i am max carrados speaking what is it oh it is you sir is it mr brickwill told me to get to you direct well you are all right brickwill are you the british museum yes i am brebner in the chaldean art department they are in a great stew here we have just found out that someone has managed to get access to the second inner greek room and looted some of the cabinets there it is all a mystery as yet what is missing asked carrados so far we can only definitely speak of about six trays of greek coins a hundred to a hundred and twenty roughly important the line conveyed a caustic bark of tragic amusement why yes i should say so the beggar seems to have known his business all fine specimens of the best period syracuse messana croton amphipolis eumenes evanitos chemons the chief quite wept carrados groaned there was not a piece among them that he had not handled the lovingly what are you doing he demanded mr brickwell has been to scotland yard and on advice we are not making it public as yet we don't want a hint of it to be dropped anywhere if you don't mind sir that will be all right it was for that reason that i was to speak with you personally we are notifying the chief dealers and likely collectors to whom the coins or some of them may be offered at once if it is thought that we haven't found it out yet judging from the expertness displayed in the selection we don't think that there is any danger of the lot being sold to a pawnbroker or a metal dealer so that we are running very little real risk in not advertising the loss yes probably it is as well replied carrados is there anything that mr brickwill wishes me to do only this sir if you are offered a suspicious lot of greek coins or hear of them would you have a look i mean ascertain whether they are likely to be ours and if you think they are communicate with us and scotland yard at once certainly replied the blind man tell mr brickwill that he can rely on me if any indication comes my way convey my regrets to him and tell him that i feel the loss quite as a personal one i don't think that you and i have met as yet mr brebner no sir said the voice diffidently but i have looked forward to the pleasure perhaps this unfortunate business will bring me an introduction you are very kind was carrados's acknowledgment of the compliment any time i was going to say that perhaps you don't know my weakness but i have spent many pleasant hours over your wonderful collection that ensures the personal element good-bye 
carrados was really disturbed by the loss although his concern was tempered by the reflection that the coins would inevitably in the end find their way back to the museum that their restitution might have ransom to the extent of several thousand pounds was the least poignant detail of the situation the one harrowing thought was that the booty might through stress or ignorance find its way into the melting pot that dreadful contingency remote but insistent was enough to affect the appetite of the blind enthusiast he was expecting inspector beetle who would be full of his own case but he could not altogether dismiss the aspects of possibility that brebner's communication opened before his mind he was still concerned with the chances of destruction and a very indifferent companion for greatorex who alone sat with him when parkinson presented himself dinner was over but carrados had remained rather longer than his custom smoking his mild turkish cigarette in silence a lady wishes to see you sir she said you would not know her name but that her business would interest you the form of message was sufficiently unusual to take the attention of both men you don't know her of course parkinson inquired his master for just a second the immaculate parkinson seemed tongue-tied then he delivered himself in his most ceremonial strain i regret to say that i cannot claim the advantage sir he replied better let me tackle her sir suggested greatorex with easy confidence it's probably a sub the sportive offer was declined by a smile and a shake of the head carrados turned to his attendant i shall be in the study parkinson show her there in three minutes you stay and have another cigarette greatorex by that time she will either have gone or have interested me in three minutes time parkinson threw open the study door the lady sir he announced could he have seen carrados would have received the impression of a plainly almost dowdily dressed young woman of buxom figure she wore a light veil but it was ineffective in concealing the unattraction of the face beneath the features were swart and the upper lip darkened with the more than incipient moustache of the southern brunette worse remained for a disfiguring rash had assailed patches of her skin as she entered she swept the room and its occupant with a quiet but comprehensive survey please take a chair madam you wish to see me the ghost of a demure smile flickered about her mouth as she complied and in that moment her face seemed less uncomely her eye lingered for a moment on the cabinet above the desk and one might have noticed that her eye was very bright then she replied you are signor carrados in in the person carrados made his smiling admission and changed his position a fraction possibly to catch her curiously pitched voice the better the great collector of the antiquities i do collect a little he admitted guardedly you will forgive me signor if my language is not altogether good when i live at naples with my mother we let boardings chiefly to english and americans i pick up the words but since i marry and go to live in calabria my english has gone all red no no you say rusty yes that is it quite rusty it is excellent said carrados i am sure that we shall understand one another perfectly the lady shot a penetrating glance but the blind man's expression was merely suave and courteous then she continued my husband is of name faraja michel faraja we have a little garden and a little property near foranzana she paused to examine the tips of her gloves for quite an appreciable moment signor she burst out with some vehemence the laws of my country are not good at all from what i hear on all sides said carrados i am afraid that your country is not alone there is at foranzana a poor laborer john verdi of name continued the visitor dashing volubly into her narrative he is one day digging in the vineyard the vineyard of my husband when his spade strikes itself upon an obstruction aha says john what have we here and he goes down upon his knees to see it is an oil jar of red earth signor such as was anciently used and in it is filled with silver money john is poor but he is wise does he call upon the authorities no no he understands that they are all corrupt he carries what he has found to my husband for he knows him to be a man of great honour my husband also is a brief decision his mind is made up john he says keep your mouth shut this will be to your ultimate profit john understands for he can trust my husband he makes a sign of mutual implication then he goes back to the spade digging 
my husband understands a little of these things but not enough we go to the collections of messina and naples and even rome and there we see other pieces of silver money similar and learn that they are of great value they are of different sizes but most could cover a lira and of the thickness of two on the one side imagine the great head of a pagan deity on the other oh so many things i cannot remember what a gesture of circumferential despair indicated the hopeless variety of design a biga or quadriga of mules suggested carrados an eagle carrying off a hare a figure flying with a wreath a trophy of arms some of these perhaps si si bene cried madame faraja you understand i perceive signor we are very cautious for on every side is extortion and an unjust law see it is even forbidden to take these things out of the country yet if we try to dispose of them at home they will be seized and we punished for they are tesoro trovato what you call treasure troven and belonging to the state these coins which the industry of john discovered and which had lain for so long in the ground of my husband's vineyard so you brought them to england si signor it is spoken of as a land of justice and rich nobility who buy these things at the highest prices also my speaking a little of the language would serve us here i suppose you have the coins for disposal then you can show them to me my husband retains them i will take you but you must first give parola d'honor of an english signor not to betray us or to speak of the circumstance to another carrados had already foreseen this eventuality and decided to accept it whether a promise extracted on the plea of treasure trove would bind him to respect the despoilers of the british museum was a point for subsequent consideration prudence demanded that he should investigate the offer at once and to cable over madame faraja's condition would be fatal to that object if the coins were as there seemed little reason to doubt the proceeds of the robbery a modest ransom might be the safest way of preserving irreplaceable treasures and in that case carrados could offer his services as the necessary intermediary i give you the promise you require madam he accordingly declared it is sufficient assented madame i will now take you to the spot it is necessary that you alone should accompany me for my husband is so distraught in this country where he understands not a word of what is spoken that his poor spirit would cry we are surrounded if he saw two strangers approach the house oh he has become most dreadful in his anxiety my husband imagine only he keeps on the fire a cauldron of molten lead and he would not hesitate to plunge into it this treasure and obliterate its existence if he imagined himself endangered so speculated carrados inwardly a likely precaution for a simple vine-grower of calabria very well he assented aloud i will go with you alone where is the place madame faraja searched in the ancient purse she discovered in her rusty handbag and produced a scrap of paper people do not understand sometimes my way of saying it she explained set a herringbone may i said carrados stretching his hand he took the paper and touched the writing with his fingertips oh yes seven heronsborn place that is on the edge of heronsborn park is it not he transferred the paper casually to his desk as he spoke and stood up how did you come madame faraja madame faraja followed the careless action with a discreet smile that did not touch her voice by motor bus first one then another inquiring at every turn oh but it was interminable sighed the lady my driver is off for the evening i did not expect to be going out but i will phone up a taxi and it will be at the gate as soon as we are he dispatched the message and then turning to the house telephone switched on to greater x i'm just going round to heronsborn park he explained don't stay greater x but if anyone calls expecting to see me they can say that i don't anticipate being away more than an hour parkinson was hovering about the hall with quite novel officiousness he pressed upon his master a succession of articles that were not required over this usually complacent attendant the unattractive features of madame faraja appeared to exercise a stealthy fascination for a dozen times the lady detected his eyes questioning her face and a dozen times he looked guiltily away again but his incongruities could not delay for more than a few minutes the opening of the door i do not accompany you sir he inquired with the suggestion plainly tendered in his voice that it would be much better if he did 
not this time parkinson very well sir is there any particular address to which we can telephone in case you are required sir mr greatrex has instructions parkinson stood aside his resources exhausted madame faraja laughed a little mockingly as they walked down the drive your manservant thinks i may eat you signor carrados she declared vivaciously carrados who held the key of his usually exact attendant's perturbation for he himself had recognized in madame faraja the angelic nina brune of the sicilian tetradrachm incident from the moment she opened her mouth admitted to himself the humour of her audacity but it was not until half an hour later that enlightenment rewarded parkinson inspector beetle had just arrived and was speaking with greatorex when the conscientious valet broke in upon them more distressed than either had ever seen him in his life before and with the breathless introduction it was the ears sir i have her ears at last poured out his tale of suspicion recognition and his present fears in the meanwhile the two objects of his concern had reached the gate as the summoned taxicab drew up seven herons born place called carrados to the driver no no interposed the lady with decision let him stop at the beginning of the street it is not far to walk my husband would be on the verge of distraction if he thought in the dark that it was the arrival of the police who knows brackedge road opposite the end of heronsbourne place amended carrados heronsbourne place had the reputation among those who were curious in such matters of being the most reclusive residential spot inside the four-mile circle to earn that distinction it was needless to say a cul-de-sac it bounded one side of heronsbourne park but did not at any point in its length give access to that pleasance it was entirely devoted to unostentatious little houses something between the villa and the cottage some detached and some in pairs but all possessing the endowment of larger more umbrageous gardens that can generally be secured within the radius the local house agent described them as delightfully old world or completely modernized according to the requirement of the applicant the cab was dismissed at the corner and madame faraja guided her companion along the silent and deserted way she had begun to talk with renewed animation but her ceaseless chatter only served to emphasize to carrados the one fact that it was contrived to disguise i am not causing you to miss the house with looking after me number seven madame faraja he interposed no certainly she replied readily it is a little farther the numbers are from the other end but we are there echo she stopped at a gate and opened it still guiding him they passed into a garden moist and sweet scented with the distillate odours of dewy evening as she turned to relatch the gate the blind man endeavoured politely to anticipate her between them his hat fell to the ground my clumsiness he apologized recovering it from the step my old impulses and my present helplessness alas madame faraja one learns prudence by experience said madame sagely she was scarcely to know poor lady that even as she uttered this trite aphorism under cover of darkness and his hat mr carrados had just ruined his signet ring by blazoning a golden seven upon her garden step to establish its identity if need be a cul-de-sac that numbered from the closed end seemed to demand some investigation seldom he replied to her remark one goes on taking risks so we are there madame faraja had opened the front door with a latch-key she dropped the latch and led carrados forward along the narrow hall the room they entered was at the back of the house and from the position of the road it therefore overlooked the park again the door was locked behind them the celebrated mr carrados announced madame faraja with a sparkle of triumph in her voice she waved her hand towards a lean dark man who had stood beside the door as they entered my husband beneath our poor roof in the most fraternal manner commented the dark man in the same derisive spirit but it is wonderful the even more celebrated monsieur dompierre unless i am mistaken retorted carrados blandly i bow on our first real meeting you know exclaimed the dompierre of the earlier incident incredulously stoker you are right and i owe you a hundred lira who recognized you nina how should i know demanded the real madame dompierre crossly this blind man himself by chance you pay a poor compliment to your charming wife's personality to imagine that one could forget her so soon put in carrados and you a frenchman dompierre 
you know monsieur carrados reiterated dompierre and yet you ventured here you are either a fool or a hero an enthusiast it is the same thing as both interposed the lady what did i tell you what did it matter if he recognized you see surely you exaggerate monsieur dompierre contributed carrados i may yet pay tribute to your industry perhaps i regret the circumstance and the necessity but i am here to make the best of it let me see the things madame has spoken of and then we can consider the detail of their price either for myself or on behalf of others there was no immediate reply from dompierre came a saturnine chuckle and from madame dompierre a titter that accompanied a grimace for one of the rare occasions in his life carrados found himself wholly out of touch with the atmosphere of the situation instinctively he turned his face towards the other occupant of the room the man addressed as stoker whom he knew to be standing near the window this unfortunate business has brought me an introduction said a familiar voice for one dreadful moment the universe stood still round carrados then with the crash and grind of overwhelming mental tumult the whole strategy revealed itself like the sections of a gigantic puzzle falling into place before his eyes there had been no robbery at the british museum that plausible concoction was as fictitious as the intentionally transparent tale of treasure trove carrados recognized now how ineffective the one device would have been without the other in drawing him how convincing the two together and while smarting at the humiliation of his plight he could not restrain a dash of admiration at the ingenuity the accurately conjectured line of inference of the plot it was again the familiar artifice of the cunning pitfall masked by the clumsily contrived trap just beyond it and straightway into it he had blundered and this continued the same voice is carrados max carrados upon whose perspicuity a government only the present government let me in justice say depends to outwit the undesirable alien my country oh my country is it really monsieur carrados inquired dompierre in polite sarcasm are you sure nina that you have not brought a man from scotland yard instead basta he is here what more do you want do not mock the poor sightless gentleman answered madame dompierre in doubtful sympathy that is exactly what i was wondering ventured carrados mildly i am here what more do you want perhaps you mr stoker excuse me stoker is a mere colloquial appellation based on a trifling incident of my career in connection with a disabled liner the title illustrates the childish weakness of the criminal classes for nicknames together with their pitiable baldness of invention my real name is montmorency mr carrados eustace montmorency thank you mr montmorency said carrados gravely we are on opposite sides of the table here tonight, but i should be proud to have been with you in the stokehold of the benvenuto that was pleasure muttered the englishman this is business oh quite so agreed carrados so far i am not exactly complaining but i think it is high time to be told and i address myself to you why i have been decoyed here and what your purpose is mr montmorency turned to his accomplice don pierre he remarked with great clearness why the devil is mr carrados kept standing ah oh heaven exclaimed madame don pierre with tragic resignation and flung herself down on a couch scusi grinned the lean man and with burlesque grace he placed a chair for their guest's acceptance your curiosity is natural continued mr montmorency with a cold eye towards don pierre's antics although i really think that by this time you ought to have guessed the truth in fact i don't doubt that you have guessed mr carrados and that you are only endeavouring to gain time for that reason because it will perhaps convince you that we have nothing to fear i don't mind obliging you better hasten murmured dompierre uneasily thank you bill said the englishman with genial effrontery i won't fail to report your intelligence to the Rosojo yes mr carrados as you have already conjectured it is the affair of the countess x to which you owe this inconvenience you will appreciate the compliment that underlies your temporary seclusion i am sure when circumstances favoured our plans and london became the inevitable place of meeting you and you alone stood in the way we guessed that you would be consulted and we frankly feared your intervention you were consulted we know that inspector beadle visited you two days ago and he has no other case in hand 
your quiescence for just three days had to be obtained at any cost so here you are i see assented carrados and having got me here how do you propose to keep me of course that detail has received consideration in fact we secured this furnished house solely with that in view there are three courses before us the first quite pleasant hangs on your acquiescence the second more drastic comes into operation if you decline the third but really mr carrados i hope you won't oblige me even to discuss the third you will understand that it is rather objectionable for me to contemplate the necessity of two able-bodied men having to use even the smallest amount of physical compulsion towards one who is blind and helpless i hope you will be reasonable and accept the inevitable the inevitable is the one thing that i invariably accept replied carrados what does it involve you will write a note to your secretary explaining that what you have learned at seven heronsbourne place makes it necessary for you to go immediately abroad for a few days by the way mr carrados although this is heronsbourne place it is not number seven dear me dear me sighed the prisoner you seem to have had me at every turn mr montmorency an obvious precaution the wider course of giving you a different street altogether we rejected as being too risky in getting you here to continue to give conviction to the message you will direct your man parkinson to follow by the first boat train to-morrow with all the requirements for a short stay and put up at mascots as usual awaiting your arrival there very convincing agreed carrados where shall i be in reality in a charming though rather isolated bungalow on the south coast your wants will be attended to there is a boat you can row or fish you will be run down by motor-car and brought back to your own gate it's really very pleasant for a few days i've often stayed there myself your recommendation carries weight suppose for the sake of curiosity uh, that i decline you will still go there but your treatment will be commensurate with your behaviour the car to take you is at this moment waiting in a convenient spot on the other side of the park we shall go down the garden at the back cross the park and put you into the car anyway and if i resist the man whose pleasantry it had been to call himself eustace montmorency shrugged his shoulders don't be a fool he said tolerantly you know who you are dealing with and the kind of risks we run if you call out or endanger us at a critical point we shall not hesitate to silence you effectively the blind man knew that it was no idle threat in spite of the cloak of humour and fantasy thrown over the proceedings he was in the power of coolly desperate men the window was curtained and shuttered against sight and sound the door behind him locked possibly at that moment a revolver threatened him certainly weapons lay within reach of both his keepers tell me what to write he asked with capitulation in his voice dom pierre twirled his mustachios in relieved approval madame laughed from her place on the couch and picked up a book watching montmorency over the cover of its pages as for that gentleman he masked his satisfaction by the practical business of placing on the table before carrados the accessories of the letter put into your own words the message that i outlined just now perhaps to make it altogether natural i had better write on a page of the notebook that i always use do you wish to make it natural demanded montmorency with latent suspicion if the miscarriage of your plan is to result in my head being knocked yes i do was the reply good chuckled dom pierre and sought to avoid mr montmorency's cold glance by turning on the electric table lamp for the blind man's benefit madame dom pierre laughed shrilly thank you monsieur said carrados you have done quite right what is light to you is warmth to me heat energy inspiration now to business he took out the pocket-book he had spoken of and leisurely proceeded to flatten it down upon the table before him as his tranquil pleasant eyes ranged the room meanwhile it was hard to believe that the shutters of an impenetrable darkness lay between them and the world they rested for a moment on the two accomplices who stood beyond the table picked out madame dompierre lolling on the sofa on his right and measured the proportions of the long narrow room they seemed to note the positions of the window at the one end and the door almost at the other and even to take into account the single pendant electric light which up till then had been the sole illuminant you prefer pencil asked montmorency 
i generally use it for casual purposes but not he added touching the point critically like this alert for any sign of retaliation they watched him take an insignificant penknife from his pocket and begin to trim the pencil was there in his mind any mad impulse to force conclusions with that puny weapon dompierre worked his face into a fiercer expression and touched reassuringly the handle of his knife montmorency looked on for a moment then whistling softly to himself turned his back on the table and strolled towards the window avoiding madame nina's pursuant eye then with overwhelming suddenness it came and in its form altogether unexpected carrados had been putting the last strokes to the pencil whittling it down upon the table there had been no hasty movement no violent act to give them warning only the little blade had pushed itself nearer and nearer to the electric light cord lying there and suddenly and instantly the room was plunged into absolute darkness to the door dom shouted montmorency in a flash i am at the window don't let him pass we are all right i am here responded dompierre from the door he will not attempt to pass came the quiet voice of carrados from across the room you are now all exactly where i want you you are both covered if either moves an inch i fire and remember that i shoot by sound not sight but but what does it mean stammered montmorency above the despairing wail of madame dompierre it means that we are now on equal terms three blind men in a dark room the numerical advantage that you possess is counterbalanced by the fact that you are out of your element i am in mine dom whispered montmorency across the dark space strike a match i have none i would not dom pierre if i were you advised carrados with a short laugh it may be dangerous at once his voice seemed to leap into a passion drop that match-box he cried you are standing on the brink of your grave you fool drop it i say let me hear it fall a breath of thought almost too short to call a pause then a little thud of surrender sounded from the carpet by the door the two conspirators seemed to hold their breath that is right the placid voice once more resumed its sway why cannot things be agreeable i hate to have to shout but you seem far from grasping the situation yet remember that i do not take the slightest risk also please remember mr montmorency that the action even of a hair trigger automatic scrapes slightly as it comes up i remind you of that for your own good because if you are so ill-advised as to think of trying to pot me in the dark that noise gives me a fifth of a second start of you do you by any chance know zingis in mercer street the shooting gallery asked mr montmorency a little sulkily the same if you happen to come through this alive and are interested you might ask zingy to show you a target of mine that he keeps seven shots at twenty yards the target indicated by four watches none of them so loud as the one you are wearing he keeps it as a curiosity i wanted no watch murmured dompierre expressing his thought aloud no mr dompierre but you wear a heart and that not on your sleeve said carrados just now it is quite as loud as mr montmorency's watch it is more central too i shall not have to allow any margin that is right breathe naturally for the unhappy dompierre had given a gasp of apprehension it does not make any difference to me and after a time holding one's breath becomes really painful monsieur declared dompierre earnestly there was no intention of submitting you to injury i swear this englishman did not speak within his hat at the most extreme you would have been bound and gagged take care killing is a dangerous game for you not for me was the bland rejoinder if you kill me you will be hanged for it if i kill you i shall be honourably acquitted you can imagine the scene the sympathetic court the recital of your villainies the story of my indignities then with stumbling feet and groping hands the helpless blind man is led forward to give evidence sensation no no it isn't really fair but i can kill you both with absolute certainty and providence will be saddled with all the responsibility please don't fidget your feet monsieur dompierre i know that you aren't moving but one is liable to make mistakes before i die said montmorency and for some reason laughed unconvincingly in the dark before i die mr carrados i should really like to know what has happened to the light that surely isn't providence would it be ungenerous to suggest that you are trying to gain time you ought to know what has happened but as it may satisfy you that i have nothing to fear from delay i don't mind telling you in my hand was a sharp knife contemptible you were satisfied as a weapon beneath my nose the flex of the electric lamp 
it was only necessary for me to draw the one across the other and the system was short-circuited every lamp on that fuse is cut off and in the distributing box in the hall you will find a burned-out wire you perhaps but monsieur dompierre's experience in plating ought to have put him up to simple electricity how did you know there was a distributing box in the hall asked dompierre with dull resentment my dear dompierre why beat the air with futile questions replied max carrados what does it matter have it in the cellar if you like true interposed montmorency the only thing that need concern us now but it is in the hall nine feet high muttered dompierre in bitterness yet he this blind man the only thing that need concern us repeated the englishman severely ignoring the interruption is what you intend doing in the end mr carrados the end is a little difficult to see was the admission so far i am all for maintaining the status quo will the first grey light of morning find us still in this impasse no for between us we have condemned the room to eternal darkness probably about daybreak dom pierre will drop off to sleep and roll against the door i unfortunately mistaking his intention will send a bullet through pardon madame i should have remembered but pray don't move i protest monsieur don't protest just sit still very likely it will be mr montmorency who will fall off to sleep the first after all then we will anticipate that difficulty said the one in question speaking with renewed decision we will play the last hand with your cards upon the table if you like nina mr carrados will not injure you whatever happens be sure of that when the moment comes you will rise one word put in carrados with determination my position is precarious and i take no risks as you say i cannot injure madame dompierre and you two men are therefore my hostages for her good behaviour if she rises from the couch you dompierre fall if she advances another step mr montmorency follows you do nothing rash carissima urged her husband with passionate solicitude you might get hit in place of me we will yet find a better way you dare not mr carrados flung out montmorency for the first time beginning to show signs of wear in this duel of the temper he dare not don pierre in cold blood and unprovoked no jury would acquit you another who fails to do you justice madame nina said the blind man with ironic gallantry the action might be a little high-handed one admits but when you appropriately clothed and in your right complexion stepped into the witness-box and i said gentlemen of the jury what is my crime that i made madame don pierre a widow can you doubt their gratitude and my acquittal truly my countrymen are not all bats or monks madame dom pierre was breathing with perfect freedom now while from the couch came the sounds of stifled emotion but whether the lady was involved in a paroxysm of sobs or laughter it might be difficult to swear it was perhaps an hour after the flourish of the introduction with which madame dom pierre had closed the door of the trap upon the blind man's entrance the minutes had passed but the situation remained unchanged though the ingenuity of certainly two of the occupants of the room had been tormented into shreds to discover a means of turning it to their advantage so far the terrible omniscience of the blind man in the dark and the respect for his markmanship with which his coolness had inspired them dominated the group but one strong card yet remained to be played and at last the moment came upon which the conspirators had pinned their despairing hopes there was the sound of movement in the hall outside not the first about the house but towards the new complication carrados had been strangely unobservant true montmorency had talked rather loudly to carry over the dangerous moments but now there came an unmistakable step and to the accomplices it could only mean one thing montmorency was ready in the instant down dom he cried throw yourself down break in guido break in the door we are held up there was an immediate response the door under the pressure of a human battering ram burst open with a crash on the threshold the intruders four or five in number stopped starkly for a moment held in astonishment by the extraordinary scene that the light from the hall and of their own bull's eyes revealed flat on their faces to present the least possible surface to carrados's aim dompierre and montmorency lay extended beside the window and behind the door on the couch with her head buried beneath the cushions madame dompierre sought to shut out the sight and sound of violence carrados carrados had not moved but with arms resting on the table and fingers placidly locked together he smiled benignly on the new arrivals his attitude compared with the extravagance of those around him gave the impression of a complacent modern deity presiding over some grotesque ceremonial of pagan worship 
so inspector you could not wait for me after all was his greeting end of section eight end of max carrados by ernest brahma read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com <laughs>